Section 104 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 4, by Henry Mayhew, 1812 to 1887. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Beggars by Andrew Halliday, Part 5. Ashamed Beggars. By the above title, I mean those tall, lanthorn-jawed men in seedy, well-brushed clothes, who, with a ticket on their breasts, on which a short but piteous tale is written in the most respectable of large hand, and with a few boxes of lucifer matches in their hands, make no appeal by word of mouth, but invoke the charity of passers-by by meek glances and imploring looks, fellows who, having no talent for patter, are gifted with great powers of facial pathos, and make expressions of feature stand in lieu of vocal supplication. For some years I have watched a specimen of this class who has a regular beat at the west end of London. He is a tall man with thin legs and arms and a slightly protuberant stomach. His costume, I use the word advisedly, for he is really a great actor of pantomime, consists of an old black dress coat, carefully buttoned, but left sufficiently open at the top to show a spotlessly white shirt, and at the bottom to exhibit an old grey waistcoat and a snowy apron, which he wears after the fashion of a Freemason, forgetting that real tradesmen are never seen in their aprons except behind the counter. A pair of tight, dark, shabby trousers, black gaiters without an absent button, and heavy shoes of the severest thickness cover his nether man. Round his neck is a red worsted comforter, which, neatly tied at the throat, descends straight and formally beneath his coat and exhibits two fringed ends, which fall, in agreeable contrast of colour, over the before-mentioned apron. I never remember seeing a beggar of this class without an apron and a worsted comforter. They would appear to be his stock-in-trade, a necessary portion of his outfit, the white apron to relieve the sombre hue of his habiliments, and show up their well-brushed shabbiness the scarlet comforter to contrast with the cadaverous complexion which he owes to art or nature. In winter the comforter also serves as an advertisement that his greatcoat is gone. The man I am describing wears a pad round his neck, on which is written, Kind friends and Christian brethren, I was once a respectable tradesman, doing a good business, till misfortune reduced me to this pass. Be kind enough to buy some of the articles I offer, and you will confer a real charity. In his hands, on which he wears scrupulously darned mittens, he carries a box or two of matches, or a few quires of notepaper or envelopes, and half a dozen small sticks of sealing wax. He is also furnished with a shabby genteel-looking boy of about nine years old, who wears a Shakespearean collar and the regulation worsted comforter the ends of which nearly trail upon the ground. The poor child, whose features do not in the least resemble the man's, and who, too young to be his son, is too old to be his grandson, keeps his little hands in his large pockets and tries to look as unhappy and half-starved as he can. But the face of the beggar is a marvellous exhibition. His acting is admirable. Christian resignation and its constant fortitude are written on his brow. His eyes roll imploringly, but no sound escapes him. The expression of his features almost pronounces, Christian friend, purchase my humble wares, for I scorn to beg. I am starving, but torture shall not wring the humiliating secret from my lips. He exercises a singular fascination over old ladies, who slide coppers into his hand quickly as if afraid that they shall hurt his feelings. He pockets the money, heaves a sigh, and darts an abashed and grateful look at them that makes them feel how keenly he appreciates their delicacy. When the snow is on the ground, he now and then introduces a little shiver, and with a well-worn pocket handkerchief stifles a cough that he intimates by a despairing dropping of his eyelids is slowly killing him. The Swell Beggar A singular variety of this sort of mendicant used to be seen some years ago in the streets of Cambridge. He had been a gentleman of property, 
and had studied at one of the colleges. Race courses, billiard tables, and general gambling had reduced him to beggary, but he was too proud to ask alms, as the ashamed beggar fortifies himself with a pad. This swell beggar armed himself with a broom. He swept a crossing. His clothes, he always wore evening dress, were miserably ragged and shabby. His hat was a broken gibus, but he managed to have good and fashionable boots, and his shirt collar and wristbands were changed every day. A white cambric handkerchief peeped from his coat-tail pocket, and a gold eyeglass dangled from his neck. His hands were ladylike, his nails well kept, and it was impossible to look at him without a mingled feeling of pity and amusement. His plan of operations was to station himself at his crossing at the time the ladies of Cambridge were out shopping. His antics were curiously funny. Dangling his broom between his forefinger and thumb, as if it were a light umbrella or riding whip, he would arrive at his stand and look up at the sky to see what sort of weather might be expected. Then, tucking the broom beneath his arm, he would take off his gloves, fold them together, and put them into his coat pockets, sweep his crossing carefully, and, when he had finished, look at it with admiration. When ladies crossed, he would remove his broken hat and smile with great benignity, displaying at the same time a fine set of teeth. On wet days, his attentions to the fair sex knew no bounds. He would run before them and wipe away every little puddle in their path. On receiving a gratuity, which was generally in silver, he would remove his hat and bow gracefully and gratefully. When gentlemen walked over his crossing, he would stop them and, holding his hat in the true mendicant fashion, request the loan of a shilling. With many he was a regular pensioner. When a mechanic or poor-looking person offered him a copper, he would take it and smile his thanks with a patronising air, but he never took off his hat to less than sixpence. He was a jovial and boastful beggar, and had a habit of jerking at his stand-up collar and pulling at his imperial cocks comically. When he considered his day's work over, he would put on his gloves and, dangling his broom in his careless, elegant way, trip home to his lodging. He never used a broom but one day, and gave the old ones to his landlady. The undergraduates were kind to him and encouraged his follies, but the college dons looked coldly on him, and when they passed him he would assume an expression of impertinent indifference, as if he cut them. I never heard what became of him. When I last saw him, he looked between forty and fifty years of age. Clean Family Beggars Clean family beggars are those who beg or sing in the streets in numbers varying from four to seven. I need only particularise one gang or party, as their appearance and method of begging will do as a sample of all others. Beggars of this class group themselves artistically. A broken-down looking man in the last stage of seediness walks hand in hand with a pale-faced, interesting little girl. His wife trudges on his other side, a baby in one arm. A child just able to walk steadies itself by the hand that is disengaged. Two or three other children cling about the skirts of her gown, one occasionally detaching himself or herself as a kind of rear or advanced guard from the main body to cut off stragglers and pounce upon falling halfpence or look piteously into the face of a passer-by. The clothes of the whole troop are in that state when seediness is dropping into rags. But their hands and faces are perfectly clean, their skins literally shine, perhaps from the effect of a plentiful use of soap, which they do not wash off before drying themselves with a towel. The complexions of the smaller children, in particular, glitter like sandpaper, and their eyes are half-closed and their noses corrugated, as with constant and compulsory ablution. The baby is a wonderful specimen of washing and getting up of ornamental linen. Altogether, the clean family beggars form a most attractive picture for quiet and respectable streets, and pose themselves for the admiration of the thrifty matrons, who are their best supporters.
sometimes the children of the clean family beggars sing sometimes the father patters this morning a group passed my window who both sang and pattered the mother was absent and the two eldest girls knitted and crocheted as they walked along the burden of the song which the children shrieked out in thin treble was quote, and the wild flowers are springing on the plain End quote. the rest of the words were undistinguishable when the little ones had finished the man who evidently prided himself upon his powers of eloquence began in a loud authoritative oratorical tone quote, my dear friends it is with great pain and affliction and trouble that i present myself and my poor family before you in this wretched situation at the present moment but what can i do work i cannot obtain and my little family ask me for bread yes my dear friends my little family ask me for bread oh my dear friends conceive what your feelings would be if like me at the present moment your poor dear children asked for bread and you had it not to give them what then could you do god send my dear friends that no individual no father of a family nor mother nor other individual with children will ever or ever may be drove to do what or i should say that which i am now a doing of at the present moment if any one in this street or in the next or in any of the streets in this affluent neighbourhood had found themselves in the situation in which i was placed this morning it would be hard to say what they could or would have done and i assure you my dear friends yes i assure you from my heart that it is very possible that many might have been drove to have done or do worse than what i am a-doing of for the sake of my poor family at the present moment if they had been drove by suffering as i and my poor wife have been the morning of this very day my wife my kind friends is now unfortunately ill through unmerited starvation and is ill abed from which at the present moment she cannot rise want we have known together my dear friends and so has our poor family and baby only eight months old god send my dear friends that none of you and none of your dear babes and families that no individual which now is listening to my deep distress at the present moment may ever know the sufferings to which we have been reduced is my fervent prayer all i want to obtain is a meal's victuals for my poor family here the man caught my eye and immediately shifted his ground you will ask me my dear friends he continued in an argumentative manner you will ask me how and why it is and what is the reason which i cannot obtain work alas my dear friends it is unfortunately so at the present moment i am a silk weaver in bethnal green by trade and the new international treaty with france which mr cobden note here he kept his eye on me as if the political reason were intended for my especial behoof and note which mr cobden my dear friends was deputed to go to the french emperor louis napoleon to agree upon betwixt this country and france which the french manufacturers sends goods into this country without paying no duty and undersells the native manufacturers though my dear friends our workmanship is as good and english silk as genuine as french i do assure you leastways there is no difference except in pattern and through the neglect of them as ought to look after it better that is to see we had the best designs for design is the only thing i mean design and pattern in which they can outdo us and also my dear friends ladies as go to shops will ask for foreign goods it is more to their taste than english at the present moment and so it is that many poor families at bethnal green and spitalfields 
and Coventry likewise, is reduced to the situation which I myself, that is, to ask your charity, am a doing of at the present moment. I gave a little girl a penny, and the man, still fixing me with his eye, continued, You will ask me, my dear friends, perhaps, how it is that I do not apply to the parish. Why not to get relief for myself, my dear wife, and little family? My kind friends, you do not know the state in which things is with the poor weavers of Bethnal Green, and at the present moment Spitalfields likewise. It comes of the want of knowledge of the real state of this rich and happy country, its material prosperity and resources, which you at this end of the town can form no idea of. There is now sixteen or seventeen thousand people out of work. Yes, my dear friends, in about two parishes there is sixteen or seventeen thousand individuals, I mean, of course, counting their poor families and all, which at the present moment cannot obtain bread. Oh, my dear friends, how grateful ought you be to God that you and your dear families are not out of work and can obtain a meal's victuals and are not like the suffering weavers of Bethnal Green and Spitalfield and Coventry likewise, through the loss of trade. For, my dear friends, if you were like me, forced to what I am doing now at the present moment, and so on, and so on, and so on. End of section 104《Of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 4, by Henry Mayhew, 1812-1887. to This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Beggars, by Andrew Halliday. Part 6. Naval and Military Beggars Are most frequently met with in towns situated at some distance from a seaport or a garrison. As they are distinct specimens of the same tribe, they must be separately classified. The more familiar nuisance is the turnpike sailor. This sort of vagabond has two lays, the merchant lay and the royal navy lay. He adopts either one or the other according to the exigencies of his wardrobe, his locality, or the person he is addressing. He is generally the offspring of some inhabitant of the most notorious haunts of a seaport town, and has seldom been at sea or, when he has, has run away after the first voyage. His slang of seamanship has been picked up at the lowest public houses in the filthiest slums that offer diversion to the genuine sailor. When on the merchant lay, his attire consists of a pair of tattered trousers, an old Guernsey shirt, and a torn straw hat. One of his principal points of costume is his bare feet, his black silk handkerchief is knotted jauntily round his throat after the most approved models at the heads of penny ballads and the outsides of songs. He wears small gold earrings and has short curly hair in the highest and most offensive state of glossy greasiness. His hands and arms are carefully tattooed, a foul anchor or a long-haired mermaid sitting on her tail and making her toilette being the favourite cartoons. In his gait he endeavours to counterfeit the role of a true seaman, but his hard feet, knock knees, and imperceptibly acquired turnpike trot betray him. His face bears the stamp of diabolically low cunning, and it is impossible to look at him without an association with a police court. His complexion is coarse and tallowy, and has none of the manly bronze that exposure to the weather and watching the horizon give to the real tar. I was once walking with a gentleman who had spent the earlier portion of his life at sea, when a turnpike sailor shuffled on before us. We had just been conversing on nautical affairs, and I said to him, Now, there is a brother sailor in distress. Of course, you will give him something. He a sailor, said my friend, with great disgust. Did you see him spit? The fellow had that moment expectorated. I answered that I had. He spit to windward, said my friend. What of that, said I. A regular landsman's trick, observed my friend. A real sailor never spits to windward. Why, he couldn't. 
we soon passed the fellow, who pulled at a curl upon his forehead, and began, in a gruff voice, intended to convey the idea of hardships, storms, shipwrecks, battles, and privations. "'God bless your honours! Give a copper to a poor sailor, as hasn't spliced the main jaw since the day for yesterday at eight bells, God love your honours, do! I haven't tasted since the day for yesterday, so drop a copper, seaman, do!' My friend turned round and looked the beggar full in the face. "'What ship?' he asked quickly. The fellow answered glibly. "'What captain?' pursued my friend. The fellow again replied boldly, though his eyes wandered uneasily. "'What cargo?' asked my inexorable companion. The beggar was not at fault, but answered correctly. The name of the port, the reason of his discharge, and other questions were asked and answered but the man was evidently beginning to be embarrassed. My friend pulled out his purse, as if to give him something. "'What are you doing here?' continued the indefatigable inquirer. "'Did you leave the coast for the purpose of trying to find a ship here?' We were in Leicester. The man stammered and pulled at his useful forelock to get time to collect his thoughts and invent a good lie. He had a friend in them parts as he thought could help him. How long since you were up the Baltic? Year and our arf, your honour. Do you know Keel? Yes, your honour. Do you know the British flag on the quay there? Yes, your honour. Been there often? Yes, your honour. Does Nick Johnson still keep it? Yes, your honour. Then, said my friend, after giving vent to a strong opinion as to the beggar's veracity, I'd advise you to be off quickly, for there's a policeman, and if I get within hail of him, I shall tell him you're an impostor. There's no such house on the quay. Get out, you scoundrel. The fellow shuffled off, looking curses, but not daring to express them. On the Royal Navy, lay the turnpike sailor assumes different habiliments, and altogether a smarter trim. He wears coarse blue trousers, symmetrically cut about the hips, and baggy over the foot a jumper or loose shirt of the same material, a tarpaulin hat with the name of a vessel in letters of faded gold is struck on the back of his neck, and he has a piece of whip cord or a lanyard round his waist, to which is suspended a jackknife, which, if of but little service in fighting the battles of his country, has stood him in good stead in silencing the cackling of any stray poultry that crossed his road or in frightening into liberality the female tenant of a solitary cottage. This patter, or blob, is of Plymouth, Portsmouth, Cosson Bay, Amoz, ships paid off, prize money, the boatswain and the first lieutenant. He is always an able-bodied, never an ordinary seaman, and cannot get a ship, because orders is at the Hadmiralty, as no more isn't to be put into commission. Like the fictitious merchant sailor, he calls every landsman your honour, in accordance with the conventional rule observed by the jack tars in nautical dramas. He exhibits a stale plug of tobacco and replaces it in his jaw with ostentatious gusto. His chief victims are imaginative boys fresh from Robinson Crusoe and Tales of the Ocean, and old ladies who have relatives at sea. For many months after a naval battle, he is in full force and in inland towns tells highly spiced narratives of the adventures of his own ship and its gallant crew in action. He is profuse in references to the cap'n, and interlards his account with, And the cap'n turns round, and he says to me, he says, He feels the pulse of his listeners' credulity through their eyes, and throws the hatchet with the enthusiasm of an artist. When we boarded him, I heard one of these vagabonds say, Oh, when we boarded him! But it is beyond the power of my feeble pen to relate the deeds of the turnpike True Blue and his ship and its gallant, gallant crew when they boarded him. I let him run out his yarn and then said, I saw the account of the action in the papers, but they said nothing of boarding. As I read it, the enemy were in too shallow water to render that manoeuvre possible. But that, till they struck their flag and the boats went out to take possession, the vessels were more than half a mile apart. This would have posed an ordinary humbug, 
but the able-bodied liar immediately and with great apparent disgust said the papers the newspapers deep like in the newspapers you don't believe what they says surely look how they sarved out old charlie napier why sir i was there and i ought to know at times the turnpike sailor roared out a song in praise of british valour by sea but of late this lay has been unfrequent at others he borrows an interesting looking little girl and tying his arm up in a sling adds his wounds and a motherless infant to his other claims upon the public sympathy after a heavy gale and the loss of several vessels he appears with a fresh tail and a new suit of carefully chosen rags when all these resources fail him he is compelled to turn merchant or duffer and invests a small capital in a few hundred of the worst and a dozen or two of the very best cigars if he be possessed of no capital he steals them he allows his whiskers to grow round his face and lubricates them in the same liberal manner as his shining hair he buys a pea-coat smart waistcoat and voluminous trousers discards his black neckerchief for a scarlet one the ends of which run through a massive ring he wears a large pair of braces over his waistcoat and assumes a half foreign air as of a mariner just returned from distant climes he accosts you in the streets mysteriously and asks you if you want a few good cigars he tells you they are smuggled that he run them himself and that the custom us officers are after him i need hardly inform my reader that the cigar he offers as a sample is excellent and that should he be weak enough to purchase a few boxes he will not find them according to sample not unfrequently the cigar duffer lures his victim to some low tavern to receive his goods where in lieu of tobacco shawls and laces he finds a number of cut-throat looking confederates who plunder and ill-treat him it must not be forgotten that at times a begging sailor may be met who has really been a seaman and who is a proper object of benevolence when it is so he is invariably a man past middle age and offers for sale or exhibition a model of a man of war or a few toy yachts he has but little to say for himself and is too glad for the gift of a pair of landsman's trousers to trouble himself about their anti-nautical cut in fact the real seaman does not care for costume and is as frequently seen in an old shooting coat as a torn jacket but despite his habiliments the true salt oozes out in the broad hands that dangle heavily from the wrists as if wanting to grip a rope or a handspike in the tender feet accustomed to the smooth planks of the deck and in the settled far-off look of the weather-beaten head with its fixed expression of the aristocracy of subordination in conclusion a real sailor is seldom or never seen inland where he can have no chance of employment and is removed from the sight of the sea docks shipmates and all things dear and familiar to him he carries his paper about him in a small tin box addresses those who speak to him as sir and marm and never as your honour or my lady is rather taciturn than talkative and rarely brags of what he has seen or done or seen done in these and all other respects he is the exact opposite of the turnpike sailor street campaigners soldier beggars may be divided into three classes those who really have been soldiers and are reduced to mendicancy those who have been ejected from the army for misconduct and those with whom the military dress and bearing are pure assumptions the difference between these varieties is so distinct as to be easily detected the first or soldier proper has all the evidence of drill and barrack life about him the eye that always fronts the person he addresses the spare habit high cheekbones regulation whisker stiff chin and deeply marked line beneath from ear to ear he carries his papers about him and when he has been wounded or seen service is modest and retiring as to his share of glory he can give little information as to the incidents of an engagement 
except as regards the deeds of his own company, and in conversation speaks more of the personal qualities of his officers and comrades than of their feats of valour. Try him which way you will, he never will confess that he has killed a man. He compensates himself for his silence on the subject of fighting by excessive grumbling as to the provisions, quarters and so on, to which he has been forced to submit in the course of his career. He generally has a wife marching by his side, a tall strapping woman who looks as if a long course of washing at the barracks had made her half a soldier. Ragged though he be, there is a certain smartness about the soldier proper, observable in the polish of his boots, the cock of his cap, and the disposition of the leather strap under his lower lip. He invariably carries a stick, and when a soldier passes him, casts on him an odd sort of look, half envying, half pitying, as if he said, Though you are better fed than I, you are not so free. The soldier proper has various occupations. He does not pass all his time in begging. He will hold a horse, clean knives and boots, sit as a model to an artist, and occasionally take a turn at the wash-tub. Begging he abhors, and is only driven to it as a last resource. If my readers would inquire why a man so ready to work should not be able to obtain employment, he will receive the answer that universally applies to all questions of hardship among the humbler classes. The vice of the discharged soldier is intemperance. The second sort of soldier beggar is one of the most dangerous and violent of mendicants, untamable even by regimental discipline, insubordinate by nature. He has been thrust out from the army to prey upon society. He begs but seldom, and is dangerous to meet with after dark, upon a lonely road, or in a sequestered lane. Indeed, though he has every right to be classed among those who will not work, he is not thoroughly a beggar, but will be met with again, and receive fuller justice at our hands, in the, to him, more congenial catalogue of thieves. The third sort of street campaigner is a perfect impostor, who, being endowed, either by accident or art, with a broken limb or damaged feature, puts on an old military coat, as he would assume the dress of a frozen-out gardener, distressed dockyard labourer, burnt-out tradesman, or scalded mechanic. He is imitative, and in his time plays many parts. He gets up his costume with the same attention to detail as the turnpike sailor. In crowded, busy streets, he stands pad, that is, with a written statement of his hard case slung round his neck, like a label round a decanter. His bearing is most military. He keeps his neck straight, his chin in, and his thumbs to the outside seams of his trousers. He is stiff as an embalmed preparation, for which, but for the motion of his eyes, you might mistake him. In quiet streets and in the country, he discards his pad and begs on the blob, that is, he patters to the passers-by and invites their sympathy by word of mouth. He is an ingenious and fertile liar and sees these occasions such as the late war in the Crimea and the mutiny in India as good distant grounds on which to build his fictions. I was walking in the high road when I was accosted by a fellow dressed in an old military tunic, a forage cap, like a charity boy's, and tattered trousers, who limped along barefoot by the aid of a stick. His right sleeve was empty and tied up to a buttonhole at his breast, a la Nelson. Please, your honour, he began in a doleful, exhausted voice, Bestow your charity on a poor soldier which lost his right arm at the glorious battle of Inkerman. I looked at him, and having considerable experience in this kind of imposition, could at once detect that he was acting. To what regiment did you belong? I asked. The thirty blank, sir. I looked at his button and read thirty blank. I haven't tasted bit of food, sir, since yesterday at half past four, and then a lady gave me a crust of bread, he continued. The thirty blank, 
I repeated. I knew the thirty blank. Let me see. Who was the colonel? The man gave me a name, with which I suppose he was provided. How long were you in the thirty blank? I inquired. Five years, sir. I had a schoolfellow in that regiment, Captain Thorpe, a tall man with red whiskers. Did you know him? There was a captain, sir, with large red whiskers, and I think his name was Thorpe. But he weren't captain of my company, so I didn't know for certain, replied the man, after an affected hesitation. The 13th blank was one of the first of our regiments that landed, I think, I remarked. Yes, your honour, it were. You impudent impostor, I said. The 30th blank did not go out till the spring of 55. How dare you tell me you belong to it? The fellow blenched for a moment, but rallied, and said, I didn't like to contradict your honour, for fear you should be angry and wouldn't give me nothing. That's very polite of you, I said, but still I have a great mind to give you into custody. Stay, tell me who and what you are, and I will give you a shilling and let you go. He looked up and down the road, measured me with his eye, abandoned the idea of resistance and replied, Well, your honour, if you won't be too hard on a poor man which finds it hard to get across anyhow or way, I don't mind telling you, I never was a soldier. I give his narrative as he related it to me. I don't know who my parents ever was. The first thing as I remember was the riverside, note the Thames, end note, and running in low tide to find things. I used to beg, hold hosses, and sleep under dry arches. I don't remember how I got any clothes. I never had a pair of shoes or stockings till I was almost a man. I fancy I am now nearly forty years of age. An old woman has kept a rag and iron shop by the waterside, give me a lodging once for two years. We used to call her Nanny, but she turned me out when she caught me taking some old nails and a brass cock out of her shop. I was hungry when I done it, for the old gal gave me no grub, nothing but the bare floor for a bed. I have been a beggar all my life, and begged in all sorts of ways, and all sorts of lays. I don't mean to say that, if I see anything laying about handy, that I don't mooch it. Note, that is, steal it. End note. Once a gentleman took me into his house as his servant. He was a very kind man. I had a good place, swell clothes, and beef and beer as much as I liked. But I couldn't stand the life, and I run away. The loss of my arm, sir, was the best thing as ever happened to me. It's been a living to me. I turn out with it on all sorts of lays, and it's as good as a pension. I lost it poaching. My mate's gun went off by accident, and the shot went into my arm. I neglected it and at last was obliged to go to a hospital and have it off. The surgeon has amputated it, said that a little longer, and it would have mortified. The Crimea has been a good dodge to a many, but it's getting stale. All dodges are getting stale. Square coves, note, that is, honest folks, end note, are so wide awake. Don't you think you would have found it more profitable had you taken to labour? or some honester calling than your present one? I asked. Well, sir, perhaps I might, he replied. But going on this square is so dreadfully confining. End of section 105 Section 106 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 4, by Henry Mayhew 1812 to 1887. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Beggars by Andrew Halliday. Part 7. Foreign Beggars. Part 1. These beggars appeal to the sympathies as strangers in a foreign land, away from friends and kindred, unable to make their wants known or to seek work from ignorance of the language. In exposing the shams and swindles that are set to catch the unwary, I have no wish to check the current of real benevolence. 
cases of distress exist, which it is a pleasure and a duty to relieve. I only expose the dodges of the beggar by profession, the beggar by trade, the beggar who lives by begging and nothing else, except, as in most cases, where he makes the two ends of idleness and self-indulgence meet by thieving. Foreign beggars are generally so mixed up with political events that in treating of them it is more than usually difficult to detect imposition from misfortune. Many high-hearted patriots have been driven to this country by tyrants and their tools, but it will not do to mistake every vagabond refugee for a noble exile, or to accept as a fact that a man who cannot live in his own country is necessarily persecuted and unfortunate, and has a claim to be helped to live in this. The neighbourhood of Leicester Square is, to the foreign political exile, the foreign political spy, the foreign fraudulent tradesman, the foreign escaped thief, and the foreign convict who has served his time. What, in the Middle Ages, sanctuary was to the murderer? In this modern Alsatia, happily for us guarded by native policemen and detectives of every nation in the world, plots are hatched, fulminating powder prepared, detonating balls manufactured, and infernal machines invented, which, wielded by the hands of men whose opinions are so far beyond the age in which they live, that their native land has cast them out for ever, are destined to overthrow despotic governments, restore the liberty of the subject, and, in a wholesale sort of way, regenerate the rights of man. Political spies are the moneyed class among these philanthropic desperadoes. The political regenerators, unless furnished with means from some special fund, are the most miserable and abject. Mr. Thackeray has observed that whenever an Irishman is in difficulties, he always finds another Irishman worse off than himself, who talks over creditors, borrows money, runs errands, and makes himself generally useful to his incarcerated fellow countrymen. This observation will apply equally to foreigners. There is a timid sort of refugee who, lacking the courage to arrive at political eminence or cash by means of steel or poison, is a hanger-on of his bolder and less scrupulous compatriot. This man, when deserted by his patron, is forced to beg. The statement that he makes as to his reasons for leaving the dear native land that the majority of foreigners are so ready to sing songs in praise of and to quit must be, of course, received with caution. The French Beggar My reader has most likely, in a quiet street, met a shabby little man who stares about him in a confused manner, as if he had lost his way. As soon as he sees a decently dressed person, he shovels up to him, and, taking off a casquette with considerably more brim than body, makes a slight bow, and says in a plaintive voice, Parlez Français, monsieur? If you stop and, in an unguarded moment, answer, Oui, the beggar takes from his breast pocket a greasy leather book, from which he extracts a piece of carefully folded paper, which he hands you with a pathetic shrug. The paper, when opened, contains a small slip on which is written, in a light foreign hand, You are requested to direct the bearer to the place to which he desires to go, as he cannot speak English. The beggar then, with a profusion of bows, points to the larger paper. Mais, monsieur, ayez la bonté de lire, c'est anglais. The larger paper contains a statement in French and English that the bearer, Jean-Baptiste Dupont, is a native of Trois, Champagne, and a fan-maker by trade. That paralysis in the hand has deprived him of the power of working that he came to England to find a daughter who had married an Englishman and was dwelling in Westminster, but that when he arrived he found they had parted for Australia, that he is fifty-two years of age and is a deserving object of compassion, having no means of returning to Troyes, being an entire stranger to England, and having no acquaintances or friends to assist him. This statement is without any signature, but no sooner have you read it than the beggar, 
who would seem to have a blind credence in the efficacy of documents, draws from his pocket-book a certificate of birth, a register of marriage, a passport, and a permission to embark, which, being all in a state of crumpled greasiness, and printed and written in French, so startles and confounds the reader that he drops something into the man's hand and passes on. I have been often stopped by this sort of beggar. In the last case I met with, I held a long talk with the man, of course in his own language, for he will seldom or never be betrayed into admitting that he has any knowledge of English. Parle Francais, monsieur? Yes, I do, I answered. What do you want? De monsieur, to have the bounty to read this paper which I have the honour to present to monsieur. Oh, never mind the papers, I said shortly. Can't you speak English? Alas, monsieur, no. Speak French, then. My quick speaking rather confused the fellow, who said that he was without bread and without asylum, that he was a tourneur and ebeniste, note, turner, worker in ebony and ivory, and cabinet maker in general, end note, by trade, that he was a stranger and wished to raise sufficient money to enable him to return to France. Why did you ever come over to England? I asked. I came to work in London, he said, after pretending not to understand my question the first time. Where? I inquired. At first I understood him to answer Sheffield, but I at last made out that he meant Smithfield. What was your master's name? I do not comprehend, monsieur. If monsieur will deign to read... You comprehend me perfectly well. Don't pretend that you don't. That is only shuffling. Note, ta casserie, end note. The name of my master was Johnson. Why did you leave him? I inquired. He is dead, monsieur. Why did you not return to France at his death? Was my next question. Monsieur, I tried to obtain work in England, said the beggar. How long did you work for Mr. Johnson? There was a long time, monsieur, that... How long? I repeated. How many years? Since two years. And did you live in London two years, and all that time learn to speak no English? Ah, uh, monsieur, you embarrass me. If monsieur will not deign to aid me, it must be that I seek elsewhere. But tell me how it was you learnt no English, I persisted. Ah, uh, monsieur, my comrades in the shop were all French. And you want to get back to France? Ah, uh, monsieur, it is the hope of my life. Come to me tomorrow morning at eleven o'clock. There is my address. I gave him the envelope of a letter. I am well acquainted with the French consul at London Bridge, and at my intercession I am sure that he will get you a free passage to Calais. If not, and I find he considers your story true, I will send you at my own expense. Good night. Of course, the man did not call in the morning, and I saw no more of him. Destitute Poles It is now many years since the people of this country evinced a strong sympathy for Polish refugees. Their gallant struggle, compulsory exile, and utter national and domestic ruin raised them warm friends in England, and committees for the relief of destitute Poles, balls for the benefit of destitute Poles, and subscriptions for the relief of the destitute Poles were got up in every market town. Shelter and sustenance were afforded to many gentlemen of undoubted integrity who found themselves penniless in a strange land, and the aristocracy fetid and caressed the best born and most gallant. To be a Pole and in distress was almost a sufficient introduction, and there were few English families who did not entertain as friend or visitor one of these unfortunate and suffering patriots. So excellent an opportunity for that class of foreign swindlers which haunt roulette tables and are the pest of second-rate hotels abroad was of course made use of. Crowds of adventurers got up in furs and cloaks and playhouse dresses with padded breasts and long mustachios flocked to England and assumed the title of Count and giving out that their patrimony had been sequestered by the Emperor of Russia easily obtained a hearing and a footing 
in many English families, whose heads would not have received one of their own countrymen except with the usual credentials. John Bull's partiality for foreigners is one of his well-known weaknesses, and valets, cooks, and couriers in their master's clothes, and sometimes with the titles of that master whom they had seen shot down in battle, found themselves objects of national sympathy and attention. Their success among the fair sex was extraordinary, and many penniless adventurers, with no accomplishments beyond card-sharping, and a foreign hotel waiter's smattering of continental languages, allied themselves to families of wealth and respectability. All, of course, were not so fortunate, and after some persons had been victimised, a few inquiries made, and the real refugee gentlemen and soldiers had indignantly repudiated any knowledge of the swindlers or their pretensions. The pseudo-Polish exiles were compelled to return to their former occupations. The least able and least fortunate were forced to beg, and adopted exactly the same tactics as the French beggar, except that, instead of certificates of birth and passports, he exhibited false military documents and told lying tales of regimental services, Russian prisons, and miraculous escapes. The destitute Pole is seldom met with now, and would hardly have demanded a notice if I had not thought it right to show how soon the unsuccessful cheat or swindler drops down into the beggar, and to what a height the Polish fever raged some thirty years ago. It would be injustice to a noble nation if I did not inform my reader that but few of the false claimants to British sympathy were Poles at all. They were Russians, Frenchmen, Hungarians, Austrians, Prussians, and germans of all sorts the career of one fellow will serve to show with what little ingenuity the credulous can be imposed on his real name is lost among his numerous aliases neither do i know whether he commenced life as a soldier or as a valet but i think it probable that he had combined those occupations and been regimental servant to an officer he came to london in the year eighteen thirty three under the name of Count Stanislas Soltievsky of Ostrolenka, possessed of a handsome person and invulnerable audacity, he was soon received into decent society, and in 1837 married a lady of some fortune, squandered her money, and deserted her. He then changed his name to Livayensin, and travelled from town to town, giving political lectures at town halls, assembly rooms, and theatres. In 1842, he called himself Dr. Teletsky, said he was a native of Smolensk, and set up a practice in Manchester, where he contracted a large amount of debts. From Manchester, he eloped with one of his patients, a young lady to whom he was married in 1845 in Dublin, in which place he again endeavoured to practise as a physician. He soon involved himself in difficulties and quitted Dublin, taking with him funds which had been entrusted to him as treasurer of a charitable institution. He left his second wife and formed a connection with another woman, travelled about, giving scientific lectures and sometimes doing feats of legerdemain. He again married a widow lady who had some four or five hundred pounds, which he spent, after which he deserted her. He then became the scourge and terror of hotel keepers and went from tavern to tavern living on every luxury and when asked for money decamping and leaving behind him nothing but portmanteaus filled with straw and bricks. He returned to England and obtained a situation in a respectable academy as a teacher of French and the guitar. Here he called himself Count Hohenbreitenstein Weizenburg. Under this name, he seduced a young lady whom he persuaded he could not marry on account of her being a Protestant and of his being a Count of the Holy Roman Empire in the pontifical degree. By threatening exposure, he extracted a large sum of money from her friends, with which he returned to London, where he lived for some time by begging letters and obtaining money on various false pretenses. His first wife discovered him, and he was charged with bigamy 
but owing to some technical informality, was not convicted. He then enlisted in the 87th Regiment, from which he shortly after deserted. He became the associate of thieves and the prostitutes who live in the neighbourhood of Waterloo Road. After being several times imprisoned for petty thefts, he at length earned a miserable living by conjuring in low public houses, where he announced himself as the celebrated Polish professor of legerdemain, Count Makwitz. He died in August 1852, and oddly enough, in a garret in Poland Street, Oxford Street. Of modern Polish swindlers and beggars, the most renowned is Adolphus Chapolinski. This, quote, shabby genteel man of military appearance, end quote, I quote from the daily papers, quote, has been several times incarcerated, has again offended, and been again imprisoned. His fraudulent practices were first discovered in 1860, end quote. The following is from the Times of June the 5th of that year. Quote, Bow Street. A military-looking man who said his name was Lorenzo Nod and that he had served as captain in one of our foreign legions during the Crimean War, was brought before Mr. Henry on a charge of attempting to obtain money by false and fraudulent pretenses from the Countess of Waldegrave. Mr. George Granville Harcourt, the husband of Lady Waldegrave, deposed. I saw the prisoner today at my house in Carlton Gardens, where he called by my request in reference to a letter which Lady Waldegrave had received from him. It was a letter soliciting charitable contributions and enclosing three papers. The first purported to be a note from Lady Stafford, enclosing a post office order for three pounds. I know her ladyship's handwriting, and this is like it, but I cannot say whether it is genuine. The second is apparently a note from Colonel MacDonald, sending him a post office order for four pounds on the part of the Duke of Cambridge. The third is a note purporting to be written by the secretary of the Duke d'Aumale. This note states that the Duke approves this person's departure for Italy and desires his secretary to send him five pounds. We were persuaded that it could not be genuine. In the first place, as we have the honour of being intimate with the Duke d'Aumal, we perfectly well knew that he would not say to this individual, or to anyone else, that he approved his departure for Italy. In the second place, there are mistakes in the French, which render it impossible that the Duke's secretary should have written it. In the third place, the name is not that of the secretary, though resembling it. Under all the circumstances, I took an opportunity of asking both the secretary and the Duke d'Aumal whether they had any knowledge of this communication, and they stated that they knew nothing of it. The Duke said that it was very disagreeable to him that he should be supposed to be interfering to forward the departure of persons to Italy, which would produce an impression that he was meddling in the affairs of that country. I wrote to the prisoner to call on me, in order to receive back his papers. At first, another man called, but on his addressing me in French, I said, You are an Italian, not a German. I want to see the captain himself. Today, the prisoner called. I showed the papers and asked him if they were the letters he had received and if he had received the money referred to in those letters. To both questions, he replied in the affirmative. The officer Horsford, with whom I had communicated in the meanwhile, was in the next room. I called him in, and he went up to Captain Note, telling him he was his prisoner. He asked why. Horsford replied, for attempting to obtain money by means of a forged letter. He then begged me not to ruin him, and said that the letter was not written by him. The prisoner's letter to Lady Waldegrave was then read as follows. Milady Countess, I am foreigner, but have the rank of captain by my service under English colours in the Crimean War, being appointed by Her Majesty's brevet. I have struggled very hard after having been discharged from the service, but happily I have been temporarily assisted by some persons of distinction and the Duke of Cambridge. Today, my lady countess, I have in object to ameliorate or better my condition 
going to accept service in Italian lawful army, where, by the danger, I may obtain advancement. Being poor, I am obliged to solicit of my noble patrons towards my journey. The Duc d'Aumal, the Marchioness of Stafford, and so on, kindly granted me their contributions. Knowing your ladyship's connection with those noble persons, I take the liberty of soliciting your ladyship's kind contribution to raise any funds for my outfit and journey. In appui of my statements, I enclose my captain's commission and letters, and, in recommending myself to your ladyship's consideration, I present my homage, and remain your humble servant, Captain L. B. Note. The letter of the pretended secretary was as follows. Monsieur le Capitaine, Son Altesse, Monseigneur le Duc d'Aumal, approuve votre départ pour l'Italie, et peut vous aider dans les dépenses de votre voyage, ma chargée de vous transmettre cinq livres, si inclus, que vous m'obligerez de m'en accuser la réception. Agréez, Monsieur le Capitaine, l'assurance de ma considération distinguée. Votre humble serviteur, Charles Coulevrier, secrétaire. The prisoner, who appeared much agitated, acknowledged the dishonesty of his conduct, but appealed to the pity of Mr. Harcourt, saying that he had suffered great hardships and had been driven to this act by want. It was sad that an officer bearing the Queen's commission should be so humiliated. The letter was not written by himself, but by a Frenchman, who led him into it. Mr. Henry said he had brought the humiliation on himself. He must be well aware that the crime of forgery was punished as severely in his own country as here. The prisoner should have the opportunity of producing the writer of the letter or of designating him to the police. On the recommendation to mercy of Mr. Harcourt, he was only sentenced to one month's imprisonment. On July the 9th, he was brought up to Marlborough Street by Horsford, the officer of the Mendicity Society, charged with obtaining by false and fraudulent pretenses the sum of three pounds from Lady Stafford. Since his imprisonment, it had been discovered that his real name was Adolphus Chapolinsky, and that he was a Pole. The real Captain Note was in a distant part of the kingdom, and Chapolinsky had obtained surreptitious possession of his commission and assumed his name. The indefatigable Mr. Horsford had placed himself in communication with the secretary of the Polish Association, who had known the prisoner, Chapolinsky, for twenty-five years. It would seem that, in early life, he had been engaged under various foreign powers, and in 1835 he came to this country and earned a scanty maintenance as a teacher of languages, that he was addicted to drinking, begging and thieving and upon one occasion, when usher in a school, he robbed the pupils of their clothes, and even fleeced them of their trifling pocket money. While in the house of detention, he had written to Captain Wood, the secretary of the Mendicity Society, offering to turn a prover. The letter in question ran thus, quote, Sir, permit me to make you a request, which is not to press your prosecution against me, and I most solemnly promise you that for this favour all my endeavours will be to render you every assistance for all the information you should require. I was very wrong to not speak to you when I was at your office, but really I was not guilty of this charge, because the letter containing the post office order was delivered to Captain Note. I was only the messenger from Lady Stafford. Look, Captain Wood, I know much and no one can be so able to render you the assistance and information of all the foreigners than me. Neither any of your officers could find the way, but if you charge me to undertake to find, I will, on only one condition, that you will stop the prosecution. The six weeks of detention were quite sufficient punishment to me for the first time, I let it be understood that for your condescension to stop the prosecution, all my services shall be at your orders, whenever you shall require, without any remuneration. My offers will be very advantageous to you under every respect. Send any of your clerks to speak with me to make my covenant with you, and you will be better convinced of my good intentions to be serviceable to you. I am, and so on, 
A. Chapolinsky, end quote. He was sentenced to three months imprisonment and hard labour. Chapolinsky is one of the most extraordinary of the beggars of the present day. He raises money both by personal application and by letter. He has been known to make from £20 to £60 per day. He is a great gambler and has been seen to lose and to pay upwards of £100 at a gambling house in the neighbourhood of Leicester Square in the course of a single night and morning. End of section 106section 107 of london labour and the london poor volume 4 by henry mayhew 1812 to 1887 this librivox recording is in the public domain read by gillian hendry beggars by andrew halliday part 8 foreign beggars part 2 hindu beggars are those spare snake-eyed asiatics who walk the streets coolly dressed in Manchester cottons, or chintz of a pattern commonly used for bed furniture, to which the resemblance is carried out by the dark, polished colour of the thin limbs which it envelops. They very often affect to be converts to the Christian religion and give away tracts, with the intention of entrapping the sympathy of elderly ladies. They assert that they have been high-caste Brahmins, but, as untruth, even when not acting professionally, is habitual to them, there is not the slightest dependence to be placed on what they say. Sometimes, in the winter, they do shallow, that is, stand on the curbstone of the pavement, in their thin ragged clothes, and shiver as with cold and hunger, or crouch against a wall and whine like a whipped animal. At others they turn out with a small barrel-shaped drum, on which they make a monotonous noise with their fingers, to which music they sing and dance. Or they will stand pad with a fakement, that is, wear a placard about their breasts that describes them as natives of Madagascar, in distress, converts to Christianity, anxious to get to a seaport where they can work their passage back. This is a favourite artifice with Lascars. Or they will sell lucifers, or sweep a crossing, or do anything where their picturesque appearance of which they are proud and conscious, can be effectively displayed. They are as cunning as they look, and can detect a sympathetic face among a crowd. They never beg of soldiers or sailors, to whom they always give a wide berth as they pass them in the streets. From the extraordinary mendacity of this race of beggars, a mendacity that never falters, hesitates or stumbles, but flows on in an unbroken stream of falsehood, it is difficult to obtain any reliable information respecting them. I have, however, many reasons for believing that the following statement, which was made to me by a very dirty and distressed Indian, is moderately true. The man spoke English like a cockney of the lowest order. I shall not attempt to describe the peculiar accent or construction which he occasionally gave to it. Quote, My name is Joalika. I do not know where I was born. I never knew my father. I remember my mother very well. From the first of my remembrance, I was at Dum Dum, where I was servant to a European officer, a great man, a prince, who had more than a hundred servants beside me. When he went away to fight, I followed among others. I was with the baggage. I never fought myself, but I have heard the men note sepoys. End note. say that the prince or general or colonel liked nothing so well as fighting except tiger hunting. He was a wonderful man, and his soldiers liked him very much. I travelled over a great part of India with Europeans. I went up country as far as Secunderabad and learned to speak English very well, so well that when I was quite a young man I was often employed as interpreter for I caught up different Indian languages quickly. At last I got to interpret so well that I was recommended to Blank, a great native prince who was coming over to England. I was not his interpreter, but interpreter to his servants. We came to London. We stopped in an hotel in Vere Street, Oxford Street. We stayed here some time. 
Then my chief went over to Paris, but he did not take all his servants with him. I stopped at the hotel to interpret for those who remained. It was during this time that I formed a connection with a white woman. She was a servant in the hotel. I broke my caste, and from that moment I knew that it would not do for me to go back to India. The girl fell in the family way, and was sent out of the house. My fellow servants knew of it, and, as many of them hated me, I knew that they would tell my master on his return. I also knew that, by the English laws in England, I was a free man, and that my master could not take me back against my will. If I had gone back, I should have been put to death for breaking my caste. When my master returned from France, he sent for me. He told me that he had heard of my breaking my caste, and of the girl, but that he should take no notice of it, that I was to return to Calcutta with him, where he would get me employment with some European officer, that I need not fear, as he would order his servants to keep silent on the subject. I salamed and thanked him, and said I was his slave for ever, but at the same time I knew that he would break his word, and that when he had me in his power, he would put me to death. He was a very severe man about caste. I attended to all my duties as before, and all believed that I was going back to India, but the very morning that my master started for the coast, I ran away. I changed my clothes at the house of a girl I knew, not the same one as I had known at the hotel, but another. This one lived at Seven Dials. I stopped indoors for many days, till this girl, who could read newspapers, told me that my master had sailed away. I felt very glad, for though I knew my master could not force me to go back with him, yet I was afraid for all that, for he knew the king and the queen, and had been invited by the Lord Mayor to the city. I liked England better than India, and English women have been very kind to me. I think English women are the handsomest in the world. The girl in whose house I hid showed me how to beg. She persuaded me to turn Christian, because she thought that it would do me good. So I turned Christian. I do not know what it means, but I am a Christian, and have been for many years. I married that girl for some time. I have been married several times. I do not mean to say that I have ever been to church, as rich folks do, but I have been married without that. Sometimes I do well, and sometimes badly. I often get a pound or two by interpreting. I am not at all afraid of meeting any Indian who knew me, for if they said anything I did not like, I should call out, Police! I know the law better than I did. Everything is free in England. You can do what you like, if you can pay, or are not found out. I do not like policemen. After the mutiny in 1857, I did very badly. No one would look at a poor Indian then, much less give to him. I knew that the English would put it down soon, because I know what those rascals over there are like. I am living now in Charles Street, Drury Lane. I have been married to my present wife six years. We have three children and one dead. My eldest is now in the hospital with a bad arm. I swept a crossing for two years. That was just before the mutiny. All that knew me used to chaff me about it and call me Johnny Sepoy. My present wife is Irish and fought two women about it. They were taken to Bow Street by a policeman, but the judge would not hear them. My wife is a very good wife to me, but she gets drunk too often. If it were not for that, I should like her better. I ran away from her once, but she came after me with all the children. Sometimes I make twelve shillings a week. I could make much more by interpreting, but I do not like to go among the nasty natives of my country. I believe I am more than fifty years of age. End quote. Negro Beggars The Negro beggar so nearly resembles the Hindu that what I have said of one I could almost say of the other. There are, however, these points of difference. The Negro mendicant, who is usually an American Negro, never studies the picturesque in his attire. He relies on the abject misery and downtrodden despair of his appearance, and generally represents himself as a fugitive slave. 
With this exception, his methods of levying contributions are precisely the same as his lighter-skinned brothers. Some years ago, it was a common thing to see a negro with tracts in his hand and a placard upon his breast, upon which was a woodcut of a black man kneeling, his wrists heavily chained, his arms held high in supplication, and round the picture, forming a sort of proscenium or frame, the words, quote, Am I not a man and a brother? End quote. At the time that the suppression of the slave trade created so much excitement, this was so excellent a dodge that many white beggars, fortunate enough to possess a flattish or turned up nose, dyed themselves black and stood pad as real Africans. The imposture, however, was soon detected and punished. There are but few Negro beggars to be seen now. It is only common fairness to say that Negroes seldom, if ever, shirk work. Their only trouble is to obtain it. Those who have seen the many Negroes employed in Liverpool will know that they are hard-working, patient, and too often underpaid. A Negro will sweep a crossing, run errands, black boots, clean knives and forks, or dig for a crust and a few pence. The few impostors among them are to be found among those who go about giving lectures on the horrors of slavery and singing variations on the escapes in that famous book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Negro servants are seldom read off in police reports and are generally found to give satisfaction to their employers. In the East End of London, Negro beggars are to be met with but they are seldom beggars by profession. Whenever they are out of work, they have no scruples, but go into the streets, take off their hats, and beg directly. I was accosted by one in Whitechapel, from whom I obtained the following statement. Quote, my father was a slave, and so was my mother. I have heard my father say so. I have heard them tell how they got away, but I forget all about it. It was before I was born. I am the eldest son. I had only one brother. Three years after his birth, my mother died. My father was a shoe black in New York. He very often had not enough to eat. My brother got a place as a servant, but I went out in the streets to do what I could. About the same time that my father, who was an old man, died, my brother lost his place. We agreed to come to England together. My brother had been living with some Britishers and he had heard them say that, over here, niggers were as good as whites, and that the whites did not look down on them and ill-treat them, as they do in New York. We went about and got odd jobs on the quay, and at last we hid ourselves in the hold of a vessel bound for Liverpool. I do not know how long we were hid, but I remember we were terribly frightened, lest we should be found out before the ship got under way. At last, hunger forced us out, and we rapped at the hatches. At first we were not heard, but when we shouted out, they opened the hatches and took us on deck. They flogged us very severely, and treated us shamefully all the voyage. When we got to Liverpool, we begged and got odd jobs. At last we got engaged in a travelling circus, where we were servants, and used to ride about with the band in beautiful dresses. But the grooms treated us so cruelly that we were forced to run away from that. I forget the name of the place that we were performing at, but it was not a day's walk from London. We begged about for some time. At last my brother, his name is Aaron, got to clean the knives and forks at a slap bang. Note, an eating house, end note, in the city. He was very fortunate and used to save some bits for me. He never takes any notice of me now. He is doing very well. He lives with a great gentleman in Harewood Square and has a coat with silver buttons and a gold-laced hat. He is very proud, and I do not think he would speak to me if he saw me. I don't know how I live or how much I get a week. I do porter's work, mostly, but I do anything I can get. I beg more than half the year. I have no regular lodging. I sleep where I can. When I am in luck, I have a bed. It costs me threepence. At some places, they don't care to take a man of colour in. I sometimes get work in Newgate Market, carrying meat, but not often. Ladies give me halfpence oftener than men. 
the butchers call me Othello and ask me why I killed my wife. I have tried to get aboard a ship, but they won't have me. I don't know how old I am, but I know that when we got to London, it was the time the great exhibition was about. I can lift almost any weight when I have had a bit of something to eat. I don't care for beer. I like rum best. I have often got drunk, but never when I paid for it myself. End quote. The following cases of genuine distress fell under my notice. My readers will observe the difference of tone, the absence of claptrap, and desire to enlarge upon a harrowing fact of those unfortunates who have been reduced to beggary, compared with the practised shuffle and conventional whine of the mendicant by profession. I was standing with a friend at the counter of a tavern in Oxford Street when a man came in and asked me to help him with a penny. I saw at a glance that he was a workman at some hard-working trade. His face was bronzed, and his large, hard hands were unmistakably the hands of a labourer. He kept his eyes fixed on me as he spoke, and begged with a short pipe in his mouth. I asked him if he would have some beer. "'Thank you, sir. I don't want beer so much as I want a penny loaf. I haven't tasted since morn, and I'm not the man I was fifteen year ago, and I feel it. "'Will you have some bread and cheese and beer?' I asked. "'Thank you, sir. Bread and cheese and beer, and thank you, sir, for I'm beginning to feel I want something.' I asked the man several questions, and he made the following statement. Quote, I'm a miner, sir, and I've been working lately five mile from Castleton in Derbyshire. Why did I leave it? Do you want me to tell the truth now, the real truth? Well, then, I'll tell you the real truth. I got drunk. You asked me for the real truth, and now you've got it. I've been a miner all my life, and been engaged in all the great public works. I call a miner... A man as can sink a shaft in anything, barring he's not stopped by water. I've got a wife and two children. I left them at Castleton. They're all right. I left them some money. I've worked in 18 inches of coal. I mean, in a chamber only 18 inches wide. You lay on your side and pick like this. Note, here he threw himself on the floor and imitated the action of a coal miner with his pick. End note. I've worked under young Mr. Brunel very often. He were not at all a gentleman, unlike you, sir, only he were darker. My last wages was six shilling a day. I expect soon to be in work again, for I know lots of miners in London, and I know where they want hands. I could get a bed and a shilling this minute if I knew where my mates lived. But today, when I got to the place where they work, they'd gone home, and I couldn't find out in what part of London they lived. We miners always assist each other when we're on the road. I've worked in lead and copper, sir, as well as coal, and have been a very good man in my time. I am just forty year old, and I think I've used myself too much when I were young. I knows the Cornish mines well. I'm sure to get work in the course of the week, for I'm well known to many an em up at Notting Hill. I once worked in a mine where there were a pressure of fifty pound to the square foot of air. You have to take your time about everything you do there. You can't work hard in a place like that. Thank you, sir. Much obliged to you. End quote. One evening, in the parish of Marlebon, an old man who was selling lucifer matches put his finger to his forehead and offered me a box. Ain't me a box, sir, he said. I told him to follow me. An old woman also accompanied us. He made the following statement. Quote, my name is John Wood. That's my wife. I am 65 years of age. She's 75, 10 years older than I am. I kept a shop round this street, sir, four and twenty years. I've got a settlement in this parish, but we neither of us like to go into the union. They'd separate us, and we like to be together for the little time we shall be here. The reason we went to the bad was I took a shop at Woolwich, and the very week I opened it, I don't know how many hundred men were not discharged from the arsenal and dockyard. I lost £350 there. After that, we tried many things, but everything failed. This is not a living. I stood four hours last night and took tuppence halfpenny. 
We lodge in wards buildings. We pay one and ninepence a week. We've got sticks of our own, that is, a bed and a table. We are both of us half starved. It is hard, very hard. I'm as weak as a rat, and so is my wife. We've tried to do something better, but we can't. If I could get some of the folks that once knew me to assist me, I might buy a few things and make a living out of them. We've been round to em to ask em, but they don't seem inclined to help us. People don't, sir, when you're poor. I used to feel that myself one time, but I know better now. Good night, sir, and thank you. End quote. In the same neighbourhood, I saw an elderly man who looked as if he would beg on me if he dared. I turned round to look at him and saw that his eyes were red as if with crying and that he carried a rag in his hand with which he kept dabbing them. I gave him a few pence. Thank you, sir, he said. God bless you. Excuse me, sir, but my eyes is bad. I suffer from the erysipelas. That is what brought me to this. Kindness rather overcomes me. I've not been much used to it of late. He made the following statement. Quote, I have been a gentleman's servant, sir, but I lost my place through the erysipelas. I was mad with it and confined in Bedlam for four years. The last place I was in service at was Sir H. Blank H. Blank's. Note, he mentioned the name of an eminent banker. End note. Sir H. Blank was very kind to me. I clean his door plate now, for which I get a shilling a week. That's all the dependence I have now. The servants behave bad to me. Sir H. Blank said that I was to go into the kitchen now and then, but they never give me anything. I don't get half enough to eat, and it makes me very weak. I'm weak enough naturally, and going without makes me worse. I lodge over in Westminster. I pay threepence a night, or eighteen pence a week. There are three others in the same room as me. I hold horses sometimes, and clean knives and forks when I can get it to do. But people like younger men than me to do odd jobs. I can't do things quick enough, and I'm so nervous that I ain't handy. I can go into the workhouse, and I think I shall in the winter. But the confinement of it is terrible to me. I'd like to keep out of it if I can. My shilling a week don't pay my rent, and I find it very hard to get on at all. Nobody can tell what I go through. I suppose I must go into the workhouse at last. They're not over kind to you when you're in. Every day, the first thing I try to get is the threepence for my lodging. I pay nightly, then I don't have anything to pay on Sundays. I don't know any trade. Gentlemen's servants never do. I used to have the best of everything when I was in service. God bless you, sir, and thank you. I'm very much obliged to you. End of section 107section 108 of london labour and the london poor volume 4 by henry mayhew 1812 to 1887 this librivox recording is in the public domain read by gillian hendry beggars by andrew halliday part 9 disaster beggars part 1 this class of street beggars includes shipwrecked mariners blown up miners burnt out tradesmen and lucifer droppers the majority of them are impostors as is the case with all beggars who pursue begging pertinaciously and systematically there are no doubt genuine cases to be met with but they are very few and they rarely obtrude themselves of the shipwrecked mariners i have already given examples under the head of naval and military beggars another class of them to which i have not referred is familiar to the London public in connection with the rudely executed paintings representing either a shipwreck or, more commonly, the destruction of a boat by a whale in the North Sea. This painting they spread upon the pavement, fixing it at the corners, if the day be windy, with stones. There are generally two men in attendance, and in most cases one of the two has lost an arm or a leg. Occasionally both of them have the advantage of being deprived of either one or two limbs. Their misfortune, so far, is not to be questioned. A man who has lost both arms, or even one, 
is scarcely in a position to earn his living by labour, and is therefore a fit object for charity. It is found, however, that in most instances the stories of their misfortunes printed underneath their pictures are simply inventions, and very often the pretended sailor has never been to sea at all. In one case which I specially investigated, the man had been a bricklayer and had broken both his arms by falling from a scaffold. He received some little compensation at the time, but when that was spent he went into the streets to beg, carrying a paper on his breast describing the cause of his misfortune. His first efforts were not successful. His appearance, dressed as he was in workman's clothes, was not sufficiently picturesque to attract attention, and his story was of too ordinary a kind to excite much interest. He had a very hard life of it for some length of time, for in addition to the drawback arising from the uninteresting nature of his case, he had had no experience in the art of begging, and his takings were barely sufficient to procure bread. From this point I will let him tell his own story. The Shipwrecked Mariner I had only taken a penny all day, and I had had no breakfast, and I spent the penny in a loaf. I was three nights behind for my lodging, and I knew the door would be shut in my face if I did not take home sixpence. I thought I would go to the workhouse, and perhaps I might get a supper and a lodging for that night. I was in Tottenham Court Road by the chapel, and it was past ten o'clock. The people were thinning away, and there seemed no chance of anything. So, says I to myself, I'll start down the new road to the workhouse. I knew there was a workhouse down that way, for I worked at a house next to it once, and I used to think the old paupers looked comfortable like. It came across me all at once that I one time said to one of my mates, as we were sitting on the scaffold, smoking our pipes, and looking over the workhouse wall, Jem, them old chaps there seem to do it pretty tidy. They have their soup and bread, and a bed to lie on, and their bit of backy, and they comes out to an afternoon, and basks in the sun, and has their chat, and don't seem to do no work to hurt em. And Jem, he says, it's a great institution, Ennery, says he, for you see Jem was a bit of a scholard, and could talk just like a book. I don't know about a institution, Jem, says I, but what I does know is that a man might do wuss, nor go in there and have his grub and his backy regular, without not to stress him, like them old chaps. Somehow or other, that ere conversation came across me, and off I started to the workhouse. When I came to the gate, I saw a lot of poor women and children sitting on the pavement round it. They couldn't have been hungrier than me, but they were awful ragged, and their case looked wuss. I didn't like to go in among them, and I watched a while a little way off. One woman kept on ringing the bell for a long time, and nobody came. And then she got desperate, and kept a-pulling and ringing like she was mad. And at last a fat man came out and swore at her, and drove them all away. I didn't think there was much chance for me if they drove away women and kids, and such as them. But I thought I would try as I was a cripple and had lost both my arms. So I stepped across the road, and was just a-going to try and pull the bell with my two poor stumps, when someone tapped me on the shoulder. I turned round and saw it was a sailor-like man, without ne'er an arm like myself, only his were cut off short at the shoulder. "'What are you a-going to do?' says he. "'I was a-going to try and ring the workhouse bell,' says I. "'What for?' says he. To ask to be took in, says I. And then the sailor man looks at me in a steady kind of way and says, Want to get into the workhouse, and you got ne'er an arm? You're a infant, says he. If you had only lost one on em now, I could forgive you, but... But surely, says I, it's a greater misfortune to lose two nor one. Half a loaf's better nor no bread, they say. You're a infant says he again. One off ain't no good. Both of them's the thing. Have you a mind to earn a honest living? says he, quite sharp. I have, says I. Anything for an honest crust. Then, says he, come along o' me. 
so i went with the sailor man to his lodging in whitechapel and a very tidy place it was and we had beef steaks and half a gallon of beer and a pipe and then he told me what he wanted me to do i was to dress like him in a sailor's jacket and trousers and a straw hat and stand on one side of a picture of a shipwreck while he stood on the t'other and i consented and he learned me some sailor's patter and at the end of the week he got me the togs and then i went out with him we did only middling the first day but after a bit the coppers tumbled in like winkin it was so affectin to see two mariners without ne'er an arm between them and we had crowds round us at the end of the week we shared two pound and seven shillings which was more nor a pound than my mate ever did by hisself he always said it was piling the hagony to have two without ne'er an arm my mate used to say to me enery if your stumps had only been a trifle shorter we might have made a fortune by this time but you waggle them you see and that frightens the old ladies i did well when trafalgar jack was alive that was my mate sir but he died of the cholera and i joined another pal who had a wooden leg but he was rough to the kids and got us both into trouble how do i mean rough to the kids why you see the kids used to swarm round us to look at the picture just like flies round a sugar cask and that crabbed the business my mate got savage with them sometimes and clouted their heads and one day the mother of one of the brats came up a screaming awful and gave timber bill as we called him into custody and he was committed for a rogue and vagabond timber bill went into the nigger line afterwards and did well you may have seen him sir he plays the tambourine and dances and the folks laugh at his wooden leg and the coppers come in in style yes i'm still in the old line but it's a bad business now End quote. blown up miners these are simply a variety of the large class of beggars who get their living in the streets chiefly by frequenting public houses and whining a tale of distress the impostors among them and they are by far the greater number do not keep up the character of blown-up miners all the year round but time the assumption to suit some disaster which may give colour to their tale after a serious coal-mine accident blown-up miners swarm in such numbers all over the town that one might suppose the whole of the coal-hands of the north had been blown south by one explosion the blown-up miner has the general appearance of a navvy he wears moleskin trousers turned up nearly to the knees a pair of heavy laced boots a sleeved waistcoat and commonly a shapeless felt hat of the wide awake fashion he wears his striped shirt open at the neck showing a weather browned and brawny chest the state of his hands and the colour of his skin show that he has been accustomed to hard work but his healthy look and fresh colour give the lie direct to his statement that he has spent nearly the whole of his life in working in the dark many hundred feet beneath the surface of the earth many of them do not pretend that they have been injured by the explosion of the mine but only that they have been thrown out of work these are mostly excavators and bricklayers labourers who are out of employ in consequence of a stoppage of the works on which they have been engaged or more often as i have proved by inquiry in consequence of their own misconduct in getting drunk and absenting themselves from their labour these impostors are easily detected if you cross-question them as to the truth of their stories and refer to names and places which they ought to be acquainted with if their representations were genuine they become insolent and move away from you there are others however who are more artful and whose tales are borne out by every external appearance, and also by a complete knowledge of the places whence they pretend to have come. These men, though sturdy and horny-fisted, have a haggard, pallid look, which seems to accord well with the occupation of the miner. They can converse about mining operations. They describe minutely the incidents of the accident by which they suffered and they have the names of coal-owners and gangsmen ever ready on their tongues. 
In addition to this, they bear some part of their bodies, the leg or the arm, and show you what looks like a huge scald or burn. These are rank impostors, denizens of Wentworth Street and Brick Lane, and who were never nearer to Yorkshire than Mile End Gate in their lives. Having met with one or two specimens of real distressed miners, I can speak with great certainty of the characteristics which mark out the impostor. For many years past, there has always been an abundance of work for miners and navigators. Indeed, the labour of the latter has often been at a premium. Cases of distress arise among them only from two causes, ill health and bodily disaster. If they are in health and found begging, it is invariably during a long journey from one part of the country to another. The look and manner of these miners forbids the idea of their being systematic mendicants or impostors. They want something to help them on the road, and they will be as grateful for a hunk of bread and cheese as for money. If you cross-question these men, they never show an uncomfortable sense of being under examination, but answer you frankly, as if you are merely holding a friendly conversation with them. Miners are very charitable to each other, and they think it no shame to seek aid of their betters when they really need it. Of the device called the Scaldrum Dodge, by which beggars of this class produce artificial sores, I shall have to treat by and by. Burnt Out Tradesmen With many begging impostors, the assumption of the burnt out tradesman is simply a change of character to suit circumstances. With others, it is a fixed and settled role. The burnt out tradesman does not beg in the streets by day. He comes out at night, and his favourite haunts are the private bars of public houses frequented by good company. In the daytime he begs by a petition, which he leaves at the houses of charitable persons, with an intimation that he will call again in an hour. In the evening he is made up for his part. He lurks about a public house until he sees a goodly company assembled in the private bar and then, when the gents, as he calls them, appear to be getting happy and comfortable, he suddenly appears among them and moves them by the striking contrast which his personal appearance and condition offers to theirs. Like many others of his class, he has studied human nature to some purpose, and he knows, at a glance, the natures with which he has to deal. Noisy and thoughtless young men, like clerks and shopmen, he avoids. They are generally too much occupied with themselves to think of him or his misfortunes, and having had no experience of a responsible position, the case of a reduced tradesman does not come home to them. A quiet and sedate company of middle-aged tradesmen best suits his purpose. They know the difficulties and dangers of trade, and maybe there are some of them who are conscious that ruin is impending over themselves. To feeling men of this class, it is a terrible shock to see a man who has once been well-to-do like themselves reduced to get a living by begging. The burnt-out tradesman's appearance gives peculiar force to his appeal. He is dressed in a suit of black, greasy and threadbare, which looks like the last threads of a dress suit which he wore on high days and holidays, when he was thriving and prosperous. His black satin stock too, is evidently a relict of better days. His hat is almost napless, but it is well brushed, indicating care and neatness on the part of its owner. His shoes are mere shapeless envelopes of leather, but the uppers are carefully polished and the strings neatly tied. When the burnt-out tradesman enters a bar, he allows his appearance to have its due effect before he opens his mouth or makes any other demonstration whatever. In this he seems to imitate the practice of the favourite comedian, who calculates upon being able to bespeak the favour of his audience by merely showing his face. The beggar, after remaining motionless for a moment, to allow the company fully to contemplate his miserable appearance, suddenly and unexpectedly advances one of his hands, which until now has been concealed behind his coat, and exposes to view a box of matches. Nothing can surpass the artistic skill of this mute appeal. 
the respectable look and the poor worn clothes, first of all, the patient broken-hearted glance accompanied by a gentle sigh, and then the box of matches. What need of a word spoken? Can you not read the whole history? Once a prosperous tradesman, the head of a family, surrounded by many friends, now through misfortune, cast out of house and home, deserted by his friends, and reduced to wander the streets and sell matches to get his children bread. Reduced to sell paltry matches, he who was in a large way once, and kept clerks to register his wholesale transactions. It is seldom that this artist requires to speak. No words will move men who can resist so powerful an appeal. When he does speak, he does not require to say more than, I am an unfortunate tradesman who lost everything I possessed in the world by a disastrous fire. Here the Hapens interrupt his story, and he has no need to utter another word, except to mutter his humble thanks. There are a great many beggars of this class, and they nearly all pursue the same method. They are most successful among tradesmen of the middle class and among the poor working people. One of them told me that the wives of working men were, according to his experience, the most tender-hearted in London. The upper classes, the swells, ain't no good, he said. They subscribe to the Mendicity Society, and they thinks every beggar an imposture. The half-and-half half swells, shopmen and the likes, ain't got no hearts, and they ain't got no money, and what's the good? Tradesmen that ain't over well off, have a fellow feeling. But the workmen's wives, out a marketing of a Saturday night, are no trouble. They always carries coppers, change out of sixpence or a something, in their hands. And when I goes in where they are a having their daffies, that drops a gin, sir, they looks at me and says, poor man, and drops the coppers, whatever it is, into my hand, and perhaps asks me to have a half pint of beer besides. They're good souls, the workmen's wives. There's a well-known beggar of this class who dresses in a most unexceptionable manner. His black clothes are new and glossy. His hat and boots are good. And to heighten the effect, he wears a spotless white choker. He is known at the West End by the name of the Bishop of London. His aspect is decidedly clerical. He has a fat face, a double chin, his hat turns up extensively at the brim, and, as I have said, he wears a white neckcloth. When he enters a bar, the company imagine that he is about to order a bottle of champagne at least, but when he looks round and produces the inevitable box of matches, the first impression gives way either to compassion or extreme wonder. So far as my experience serves me, this dodge is not so successful as the one I have just described. A person with the most ordinary reasoning powers must know that a man who possesses clothes like those need not be in want of bread. But if the power of reasoning were universally allotted to mankind, there would be a poor chance for the professional beggar. There never was a time or place in which there were not to be found men anxious to avoid labour, and yet to live in ease and enjoyment. And there never was a time in which other men were not, from their sympathy, their fears, or their superstition, ready to assist the necessitous, or those who appeared to be so, and liable to be imposed upon or intimidated, according as the beggar is crafty or bold. As a rule, the burnt-out tradesmen whom I have described are impostors, who make more money by begging than many of those who relieve them earn by hard and honest labour. The petitions which they leave at houses are very cleverly drawn out, they are generally the composition of the professional screevers, whose practices I shall have to describe by and by. They have a circumstantial account of the fire by which the applicant lost his all, and sometimes furnish an inventory of the goods that were destroyed. They are attested by the names of clergymen, church wardens, and other responsible persons, whose signatures are imitated with consummate art in every variety of ink. Some specimens of these petitions and begging letters will be found under the head of Dependents of Beggars. Lucifer Droppers 
the lucifer droppers are impostors to a man to a boy to a girl men seldom if ever practice this dodge it is children's work and the artful way in which boys and girls of tender years pursue it shows how systematically the seeds of mendicancy and crime are implanted in the hearts of the young arab tribes of london the artfulness of this device is of the most diabolical kind for it trades not alone upon deception but upon exciting sympathy with the guilty at the expense of the innocent a boy or a girl takes up a position on the pavement of a busy street such as cheapside or the strand he or she it is generally a girl carries a box or two of lucifer matches which she offers for sale in passing to and fro she artfully contrives to get in the way of some gentleman who is hurrying along he knocks against her and upsets the matches which fall in the mud the girl immediately begins to cry and howl the bystanders who are ignorant of the trick exclaim in indignation against the gentleman who has caused a poor girl such serious loss and the result is that either the gentleman to escape being hooted or the ignorant passers-by in false compassion give the girl money white peppermint lozenges are more often used than lucifers it looks a hopeless case indeed when a trayful of white lozenges fall in the mud bodily afflicted beggars beggars who excite charity by exhibiting sores and bodily deformities are not so commonly to be met with in london as they were some years ago the officers of the mendicity society have cleared the streets of nearly all the impostors and the few who remain are blind men and cripples many of the blind men are under the protection of a society which furnishes them with books printed in raised type which they decipher by the touch others provide their own books and are allowed to sit on doorsteps or in the recesses of the bridges without molestation from the police it has been found on inquiry that these afflicted persons are really what they appear to be poor helpless blind creatures who are totally incapacitated from earning a living and whom it would be heartless cruelty to drive into the workhouse where no provision is made for their peculiar wants the bodily afflicted beggars of london exhibit seven varieties one those having real or pretended sores vulgarly known as the scaldrum dodge two having swollen legs three being crippled deformed maimed or paralyzed four being blind five being subject to fits six being in a decline seven shallow coves or those who exhibit themselves in the streets half clad especially in cold weather first then as to those having real or pretended sores as i have said there are few beggars of this class left when the officers of the mendicity society first directed their attention to the suppression of this form of mendicancy it was found that the great majority of those who exhibit sores were unmitigated impostors in nearly all the cases investigated the sores did not proceed from natural causes but were either wilfully produced or simulated a few had lacerated their flesh in reality but the majority had resorted to the less painful operation known as the scaldrum dodge this consists in covering a portion of the leg or arm with soap to the thickness of a plaster and then saturating the whole with vinegar the vinegar causes the soap to blister and assume a festering appearance and thus the passer-by is led to believe that the beggar is suffering from a real sore so well does this simple device simulate a sore that the deception is not to be detected even by close inspection the scaldrum dodge is a trick of very recent introduction among the london beggars it is a concomitant of the advance of science and the progress of the art of adulteration it came in with penny postage daguerreotypes and other modern innovations of a like description in less scientific periods within the present century it was wholly unknown and sores were produced by burns and lacerations which the mendicants inflicted upon themselves with a ruthless hand an old man who has been a beggar all his life informed me that he had known a man prick the flesh of his leg all over in order to produce blood 
and give the appearance of an ulcerous disease. This man is a cripple and walks about upon crutches selling stay laces. He is now upwards of 70 years of age. At my solicitation, he made the following statement without any apparent reserve. 70 years a beggar. I have been a beggar ever since I was that high, ever since I could walk. No, I was not born a cripple. I was 30 years of age before I broke my leg. That was an accident. A horse and cart drove over me in Westminster. Well, yes, I was drunk. I was able-bodied enough before that. I was turned out to beg by my mother. My father, I've heard, was a soldier. He went to Egypt, or some foreign part, and never came back. I never was learnt any trade but begging, and I couldn't turn my hand to nothing else. I might have been learnt the shoemaking, but what was the use? Begging was a better trade then. It isn't now, though. There was fine times when the French war was on. I lived in Westminster then. A man, as they called Copenhagen Jack, took a fancy to me and made me his valet. I waited upon, fetched his drink, and so forth. Copenhagen Jack was a captain. No, not in the army, nor in the navy neither. He was the captain of the Pie Street beggars. There was nigh two hundred of them, lived in two large houses, and Jack directed them. Jack's word was law, I assure you. The boys, Jack called them his boys, but there was old men among them, and old women too, used to come up before the captain every morning, before starting out for the day, to get their orders. The captain divided out the districts for them, and each man took his beat according to his directions. It was share and share alike, with an extra for the captain. There was all manner of lays, yes, cripples and darkies, we called them as did the blind dodge, darkies, and shakers, them as had fits, and shipwrecked mariners, and the skeldrum dodge, no, that's new, but I know what you mean. They did the real thing then, scraped the skin off their feet with a bit of glass until the blood came. Those were fine times for beggars. I've known many of them bring in as much as 30 shillings a day, some 20, some 15. If a man brought home no more than five or six shillings, the captain would enter him, make a note of him, and change his beat. Yes, we lived well. I've known fifty sit down to a splendid supper, geese and turkeys and all that, and keep it up until daylight, with songs and toasts. No, I didn't beg then, but I did before, and I did after. I begged after, when the captain came to misfortune. He went a-walking one day in his best clothes, and got pressed, and never came back, and there was a mutiny among them in Pie Street, and I nearly got murdered. You see, they were jealous of me, because the captain petted me. I used to dress in top boots and a red coat when I waited on the captain. It was his fancy. Romancing? I don't know what you mean. Telling lies? Oh, it's true, by blank. There's nothing like it nowadays. The new police, and this B blank, Mendicity Society has spoilt it all. Well, they skinned me, took off my fine coat and boots, and sent me out on the orphan lay in tatters. I sat and cried all day on the doorsteps, for I was really miserable now my friend was gone, and I got lots of halfpence and silver too. And when I took home the swag, they danced round me and swore that they would elect me captain if I went on like that. But there was a new captain made, and when they had their fun out, he came and took the money away, and kicked me under the table. I ran away the next day, and went to a house in St Giles's, where I was better treated. There was no captain there, the landlord managed the house, and nobody was master but him. There was nigh a hundred beggars in that house, and some two or three hundred more in the houses next it. The houses are not standing now. They were taken down when New Oxford Street was built. They stood on the north side. Yes, we lived well in St Giles's, as well as we did in Westminster. I have earned eight, ten, fifteen, I thirty shillings a day, and more nor that sometimes. I can't earn one shilling now. The folks don't give as they did. They think everybody an imposture now. And then the police won't let you alone. No, I told you before, I never was anything else but a beggar. How could I? It was the trade I was brought up to. A man must follow his trade. No doubt I shall die a beggar.
and the parish will bury me. End of section 108「Section 109 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 4, by Henry Mayhew, 1812-1887. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Beggars by Andrew Halliday, Part 10. Disaster Beggars, Part 2. Having Swollen Legs Beggars who lie on the pavement and expose swollen legs are very rarely to be met with now. The imposture has been entirely suppressed by the police and the officers of the Mendicity Society. This is one of the shallowest of all the many dodges of the London beggars. On reflection, any one, however slightly acquainted with the various forms of disease, must know that a mere swelling cannot be a normal or chronic condition of the human body. A swelling might last a few days or a week, but a swelling of several years standing is only to be referred to the continued application of a poisonous ointment, or to the binding of the limb with ligatures so as to confine the blood and puff the skin. Cripples Various kind of cripples are still to be found begging in the streets of London. As a rule, the police do not interfere with them unless they know them to be impostors. A certain number of well-known cripples have acquired a sort of prescriptive right to beg where they please. The public will be familiar with the personal appearance of many of them. There is the tall man on crutches, with his foot in a sling, who sells stay laces. The poor wretch without hands, who crouches on the pavement and writes with the stumps of his arms. The crab-like man without legs, who sits strapped to a board and walks upon his hands. The legless man who propels himself in a little carriage, constructed on the velocipede principle. The idiotic-looking youth, who stands pad with a fakement, shaking in every limb, as if he were under the influence of galvanism. These mendicants are not considered to be impostors, and are allowed to pursue begging as a regular calling. I cannot think, however, that the police exercise a wise discretion in permitting some of the more hideous of these beggars to infest the streets. Instances are on record of nervous females having been seriously frightened, or even injured, by seeing men without legs or arms crawling at their feet. A case is within my own knowledge where the sight of a man without legs or arms had such an effect upon a lady in the family way that her child was born in all respects the very counterpart of the object that alarmed her. It had neither legs nor arms. This occurrence took place at Brighton about eleven years ago. I have frequently seen ladies start and shudder when the crab-like man I have referred to has suddenly appeared, hopping along at their feet. I am surprised that there is no home or institution for cripples of this class. They are certainly deserving of sympathy and aid, for they are utterly incapacitated from any kind of labour. Impostors are constantly starting up among this class of beggars, but they do not remain long undetected. A man was lately found begging, who pretended that he had lost his right arm. The deception, at the first glance, was perfect. His right sleeve hung loose at his side, and there appeared to be nothing left of his arm but a short stump. On being examined at the police office, his arm was found strapped to his side, and the stump turned out to be a stuffing of bran. Another man simulated a broken leg by doubling up that limb and strapping his foot and ankle to his thigh. Paralysis is frequently simulated with success until the actor is brought before the police surgeon when the cheat is immediately detected. A blind beggar A blind beggar, led by a dog, whom I accosted in the street, made the following voluntary statement. I should mention that he seemed very willing to answer my questions, and while he was talking, kept continually feeling my clothes with his finger and thumb. The object of this, I fancy, must have been to discover whether I was what persons of his class call a gentleman or a poor man. Whether he had any thoughts of my being an officer, I cannot say. Quote, I am sixty years of age. You wouldn't think it, perhaps, but I am. No, I was not born blind. I lost my sight in the smallpox five and twenty years ago. 
I have been begging on the streets eighteen years. Yes, my dog knows the way home. How did I teach him that? Why, when I had him first, the cabmen and busmen took him out to Camden Town and Westminster and other places, and then let him go. He soon learnt to find his way home. No, he is not the dog I had originally. That one died. He was five and twenty years old when he died. Yes, that was a very old age for a dog. I had this one about five years ago. Don't get as much as I used to do? No, no, my friend. I make about a shilling a day. Never, scarcely never, more. Sometimes less. A good deal less. But some folks are very kind to me. I live at Poole's Place, Mount Pleasant. There are a good many engineers about there, and their wives are very kind to me. They have always a halfpenny for me when I go that way. I have my beats. I don't often come down this way. Note, Gower Street, end note. Only once a month. I always keep on this side of Tottenham Court Road. I never go over the road. My dog knows that. I am going down there. Note, pointing, end note. That's Chenny Street. Oh, I know where I am. Next turning to the right is Alfred Street. The next to the left is Francis Street. And when I get to the end of that, the dog will stop. But I know as well as him. Yes, he's a good dog, but never the dog I used to have. He used always to stop when there was anybody near and pull when there was nobody. He was what I call a steady dog. This one is young and foolish like. He stops sometimes dead and I goes on talking thinking there is a lady or gentleman near, but it's only other dogs that he's stopping to have a word with. No, 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 sir. Note, this he said when I dropped some more coppers into his hat, having previously given him a penny. End note. I don't want that. I think I know your voice, sir. I'm sure I've heard it before. No? Ah, then I'm mistaken. Here again, he felt my coat and waistcoat with an inquiring touch. Apparently satisfied, he continued, I'll tell you, sir, what I wouldn't tell to everyone. I've as nice a little place at Mount Pleasant as you would desire to see. You wouldn't think I was obliged to beg if you saw it. Why, sir, I beg many times when I've as much as sixteen shillings in my pocket. Leastwise, not in my pocket, but at home. Why, you see, sir, there's the winter months coming on, and I lays by what I can against the wet days when I can't go out. There's no harm in that, sir. Well, now, sir, I'll tell you. There's a man up there in Sussex Street that I know, and he said to me just now, as I was passing the public house, Come in, John, and have a drop of something. No, thank ye, says I. I don't want drink. If you want to give me anything, give me the money. No, says he, I won't do that. But if you come in and have something to drink, I'll give you sixpence. Well, sir, I wouldn't go. It wouldn't do, you know, for the likes of me, a blind man, getting his living by begging, to be seen in a public house. The people wouldn't know, sir, whether it was my money that was paying for it or not. I never go into a public house. I has my drop at home. Oh, yes, I am tired, tired of it. But I'll tell you, sir, I think I'll get out of it soon. Do you know how that is, sir? Well, I think I shall get on to Day and Martin's charity in October. I'm promised votes and I'm in hopes this time. God bless you, sir. End quote. There was, for many years in the city, a blind man with a dog, who was discovered to be a rank impostor. The boys found it out, long before the police did. They used to try and take the money out of the little basket that the dog carried in his mouth, but they never succeeded. The moment a boy approached the basket, the blind man ran at him with his stick, which proved, of course, that the fellow could see. Some of my readers may recollect seeing in the papers an account of a respectable young girl who ran away from her home and took up with this blind man. She cohabited with him, in fact, and it was found that they lived in extravagance and luxury on the blind beggar's daily takings. Beggars subject to fits are impostors, I may say, wholly without exception. Some of them are the associates and agents of thieves, and fall down in the street in assumed fits in order to collect a crowd and afford a favourable opportunity to the pickpockets with whom they are in league. The simulation of fits is no mean branch of the beggar's art of deception. The various symptoms, the agitation of the muscles, the turning up of the whites of the eyes, the pallor of the face, 
and the rigidity of the mouth and jaw are imitated to a nicety and these symptoms are sometimes accompanied by copious frothing at the mouth i asked mr horsford of the mendicity society how this was done and received the laconic answer soap and this brought to my memory that i had once seen an actor charge his mouth with a small piece of soap to give due vraisemblance to the last scene of sir giles overreach i was shown an old woman who was in the habit of falling down in assumed fits simply to get brandy she looked very aged and poor and i was told she generally had her fits when some well-dressed gentleman was passing with a lady on his arm she generally chose the scene of her performance close to the door of a public house into which some compassionate person might conveniently carry her. She was never heard to speak in her fits, except to groan and mutter, Brandy, when that remedy did not appear to suggest itself to those who came to her aid. An officer said to me, I have known that old woman have so many fits in the course of the day that she has been found lying in the gutter dead drunk from the effect of repeated restoratives. She has been apprehended and punished over and over again, but she returns to the old dodge the minute she gets out. She is on the parish, but she gets money as well as brandy by her shamming. I have heard that there are persons who purposely fall into the serpentine in order to be taken to the receiving house of the Humane Society and recovered with brandy. One man repeated the trick so often that at last the Society's men refused to go to his aid. It is needless to say that he soon found his way out of the water unaided when he saw that his dodge was detected. Being in a decline No form of poverty and misfortune is better calculated to move the hearts of the compassionate than this. You see crouching in a corner a pale-faced, wan young man, apparently in the last stage of consumption. His eyes are sunk in his head, his jaw drops, and you can almost see his bones through his pallid skin. He appears too exhausted to speak. He coughs at intervals and places his hand on his chest, as if in extreme pain. After a fit of coughing, he pants pitifully and bows his head feebly, as if he were about to die on the spot. It will be noticed, however, as a peculiarity distinguishing nearly all these beggars, that the sufferers wear a white cloth bound round their heads, overtopped by a black cap. It is this white cloth, coupled with a few slight artistic touches of colour to the face, that produces the interesting look of decline. Any person who is thin and of sallow complexion may produce the same effect by putting on a white nightcap and applying a little pink colour round the eyes. It is the simple rule observed by comedians when they make up for a sick man or a ghost. These beggars are all impostors, and they are now so well known to the police that they never venture to take up a fixed position during the day, but pursue their nefarious calling at night at public houses and other resorts where they can readily make themselves scarce should an officer happen to spy them out. Shallow Coves This is the slang name given to beggars who exhibit themselves in the streets half-clad, especially in cold weather. There are a great many of these beggars in London, and they are enabled to ply their trade upon the sympathies of the public with very little check, owing to the fact that they mostly frequent quiet streets and make a point of moving on whenever they see a policeman approaching. A notorious shallow cove, who frequents the neighbourhood of the Strand and St Martin's Lane, must be well known to many of my readers. His practice is to stand at the windows of bakers and confectioners and gaze with an eager, famished look at the bread and other eatables. His almost naked state, his hollow glaring eye, like that of a famished dog, his long, thin cheek, his matted hair, his repeated shrugs of uneasiness, as if he were suffering from cold or vermin, present such a spectacle of wretchedness as the imagination could never conceive. He has no shirt, as you can see by his open breast. His coat is a thing of mere shreds. His trousers, torn away in picturesque jags at the knees, are his only other covering, except a dirty, sodden-looking, round-crowned brown felt hat, which he slouches over his forehead 
in a manner which greatly heightens his aspect of misery. I was completely taken in when I first saw this man greedily glaring in at a baker's window in St. Martin's Lane. I gave him tuppence to procure a loaf, and waited to see him buy it, anxious to have the satisfaction of seeing him appease such extreme hunger as I had never, I thought, witnessed before. He did not enter the shop with the alacrity I expected. He seemed to hesitate, and presently I could see that he was casting stealthy glances at me. I remained where I was, watching him, and at last, when he saw I was determined to wait, he entered the shop. I saw him speak to the women at the counter and point at something, but he made no purchase, and came out without the bread, which I thought he would have devoured like a wolf when he obtained the money to procure it. Seeing me still watching him, he moved away rapidly. I entered the shop and asked if he had bought anything. Not he. He don't want any bread, said the mistress of the shop. I wish the police would lock him up or drive him away from here, for he's a regular nuisance. He pretends to be hungry, and then when people give him anything, he comes in here and asks if I can sell him any bits. He knows I won't, and he don't want them. He is a regular old soldier, he is, sir. I received confirmation of this account from Mr. Horsford, who said that the fellow had been sent to prison at least thirty times. The moment he gets out, he resorts to his old practices. On one occasion, when he was taken, he had thirteen shillings in his pocket, in coppers, sixpences, and threepenny and fourpenny bits. Soft-hearted old ladies who frequent the pastry cooks are his chief victims. Shallow coves have recently taken to Sunday begging. They go round the quiet streets in pairs and sing psalm tunes during church hours. They walk barefooted, without hats, and expose their breasts to show that they have no underclothing. The shallow cove is a very pitiable sight in winter, standing half naked, with his bare feet on the cold stones. But give him a suit of clothes and shoes and stockings, and the next day he will be as naked and as wretched looking as he is today. Nakedness and shivers are his stock in trade. Famished Beggars The famished beggars, that is, those who make up to look as if they were starving, pursue an infinite variety of dodges. The most common of all is to stand in some prominent place with a placard on the breast, bearing an inscription to the effect that the beggar is starving, or that he has a large family entirely dependent upon him. The appeal is sometimes made more forcible by its brevity, and the card bears the single word destitute. In every case where the beggar endeavours to convey starvation by his looks and dress, it may be relied upon that he is an impostor, a lazy fellow who prefers begging to work, because it requires less exertion and brings him more money. There are some, however, blind men and old persons, who stand pad, that is to say, beg by the exhibition of a written or printed paper, who are not impostors. They are really poor persons who are incapacitated from work, and who beg from day to day to earn a living. But these beggars do not get up an appearance of being starved, and indeed some of them look very fat and comfortable. The beggars who chalk on the pavement, I am starving, in a round scholastic hand, are not of this class. It does not require much reflection to discern the true character of such mendicants. As I have frequently had occasion to observe, the man who begs day after day and counts his gains at the rate of from 12 to 20 shillings a week cannot be starving. You pass one of these beggars in the morning and you hear the coppers chinking on the pavement as they are thrown to him by the thoughtless or the credulous. You pass him again in the evening and there is still the inscription, I am starving. This beggar adds hypocrisy to his other vices. By his writing on the pavement, he would give you to understand that he is too much ashamed to beg by word of mouth. As he crouches beside his inscription, he hides his head. The writing, too, is a false pretense. I am starving is written in so good a hand that you are led to believe that the wretch before you has had a good education, that he has seen better days and is now the victim of misfortune, perhaps wholly undeserved. It should be known, however, that many of these beggars cannot write at all. 
They could not write another sentence except, I am starving, if it were to save their lives. There are persons who teach the art of writing certain sentences to beggars, but their pupils learn to trace the letters mechanically. This is the case with the persons who draw in coloured chalk on the pavement. They can draw a mackerel, a broken plate, a head of Christ, and a certain stereotyped sea view with a setting sun. But they cannot draw anything else. And these they trace upon a principle utterly unknown to art. There is one beggar of this class who frequents the King's Cross end of the new road, who writes his specimens backwards, and who cannot do it any other way. He covers a large flagstone with copies in various hands, and they are all executed in the true copper plate style. They are all, however, written backwards. The distinction made by the magistrates and the police between those who draw coloured views and those who merely write, I am starving, in white chalk, exhibits a nicety of discrimination, which is not a little amusing. When the officers of the Mendicity Society first began to enforce their powers with rigour, in consequence of the alarming increase of mendicancy, they arrested these flagstone artists with others. The magistrates, however, showed an unwillingness to commit them, and at length it was laid down as a rule that these men should not be molested unless they obstructed a thoroughfare or created a disturbance. This decision was grounded upon the consideration that these street artists did some actual work for the money they received from the public. They drew a picture and exhibited it, and might therefore be fairly regarded as pursuing an art. So the chalkers of mackerel were placed in the category of privileged street exhibitors. The I am starving dodge, however, has been almost entirely suppressed by the persevering activity of Mr Horsford and his brother officers of the Mendicity Society. One of the latest devices of famished beggars, which has come under my notice, I shall denominate the choking dodge. A wretched-looking man, in a state of semi-nudity, having the appearance of being half-starved and exhausted, either from want of food or from having walked a long way, sat down one day on the doorstep of the house opposite mine. I was struck by his wretched and forlorn appearance, and particularly by his downcast looks. It seemed as if misery had not only worn him to the bone, but had crushed all his humanity out of him. He was more like a feeble beast, dying of exhaustion and grovelling in the dust, than a man. Presently he took out a crust of dry bread and attempted to eat it. It was easy to see that it was a hard crust, as hard as stone, and dirty as if it had lain for some days in the street. The wretch gnawed at it as a starved dog gnaws at a bone. The crust was not only hard, but the beggar's jaws seemed to want the power of mastication. It seemed as if he had hungered so long that food was now too late. At length he managed to bite off a piece, but now another phase of his feebleness was manifested. He could not swallow it. He tried to get it down, and it stuck in his throat. You have seen a dog with a bone in his throat, jerking his head up and down in his effort to swallow. That was the action of this poor wretch on the doorstep. I could not but be moved by this spectacle, and I opened the door and called to the man. He took no heed of me. I called again. Still no heed. Misery had blunted all his faculties. He seemed to desire nothing but to sit there and choke. I went over to him, and tapping him on the shoulder, gave him tuppence, and told him to go to the public house and get some beer to wash down his hard meal. He rose slowly, gave me a look of thanks, and went away in the direction of the tavern. He walked more briskly than I could have conceived possible in his case, and something prompted me to watch him. I stood at my door looking after him, and when he got near the public house, he turned round. I knew at once that he was looking to see if I were watching him. The next minute he turned aside as if to enter the public house. The entrance stood back from the frontage of the street, and I could not tell from where I stood whether he had gone into the house or not. I crossed to the other side, where I could see him without being noticed. 
He had not entered the house, but was standing by the door. When he had stood there for a few minutes, he peeped out cautiously and looked down the street towards the place where he had left me. Being apparently satisfied that all was right, he emerged from the recess and walked on. I was now determined to watch him further. I had not long to wait for conclusive evidence of the imposture which I now more than suspected. The man walked slowly along until he saw some persons at a first-floor window, when he immediately sat down on a doorstep opposite and repeated the elaborate performance with the hard crust which I have already described. This I saw him do four times before he left the street, in each case getting money. It is needless to say that this fellow was a rank impostor. One of his class was apprehended some time ago. It might have been this very man, and no less than seven shillings were found upon him. These men frequent quiet by-streets, and never, or rarely, beg in the busy thoroughfares. I will give another case, which I shall call the Awful Eater. The most notable instance of this variety of the famished beggars, which has come under my notice, is that of a little old man who frequents the neighbourhood of Russell Square. I have known him now for two years, and I have seen him repeat his performance at least a score of times. The man has the appearance of a cutler. He wears a very old and worn, but not ragged, velveteen coat with large side pockets, a pair of sailor's blue trousers a good deal patched, a very, very bad pair of shoes, and a chimney-pot hat, which seems to have braved the wind and rain for many years, been consigned to a dustbin, and then recovered for wear. He is below the average height, and appears to be about seventy years of age. This little old man makes his appearance in my street about eleven o'clock in the forenoon. He walks down the pavement listlessly, rubbing his hands and looking about him on every side in a vacant, bewildered manner, as if all the world were strange to him, and he had no home, no friend, and no purpose on the face of the earth. Every now and then he stops and turns his face towards the street, moving himself uneasily in his clothes, as if he were troubled with vermin. All this time he is munching and mumbling some food in a manner suggestive of a total want of teeth. As he pauses, he looks about as if in search of something. Presently you see him pick up a small piece of bread which has been thrown out to the sparrows. He wipes it upon his velveteen coat and begins to eat it. It is a long process. He will stand opposite your window for full ten minutes, mumbling that small piece of bread, but he never looks up to inspire compassion or charity. He trusts to his pitiful mumblings to produce the desired effect, and he is not disappointed. Coppers are flung to him from every window, and he picks them up slowly and listlessly, as if he did not expect such aid, and scarcely knew how to apply it. I have given him money several times, but that does not prevent him from returning again and again to stand opposite my window and mumble crusts picked out of the mud in the streets. One day I gave him a lump of good bread, but in an hour after I found him in an adjacent street, exciting charity in the usual way. This convinced me that he was an artful, systematic beggar, and this impression was fully confirmed on my following him into a low beer shop in St. Giles's, and finding him comfortably seated with his feet up in a chair, smoking a long pipe and discussing a pot of ale. He knew me in a moment dropped his feet from the chair, and tried to hide his pipe. Since that occasion, he has never come my way. End of section 109section 110 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 4, by Henry Mayhew, 1812-1887. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Beggars by Andrew Halliday. Part 11. Petty Trading Beggars. This is perhaps the most numerous class of beggars in London. Their trading in such articles as lucifers, bootlaces, cabbage nets, tapes, cottons, shirt buttons, and the like, is in most cases a mere blind to evade the law applying to mendicants and vagrants. 
there are very few of the street vendors of such petty articles as lucifers and shirt buttons who can make a living from the profits of their trade indeed they do not calculate upon doing so the box of matches or the little deal box of cottons is used simply as a passport to the resorts of the charitable the police are obliged to respect the trader though they know very well that under the disguise of the itinerant merchant there lurks a beggar beggars of this class use their trade to excite compassion and obtain a gift rather than to effect a sale a poor half-clad wretch stands by the curb exposing for sale a single box of matches the price being only a halfpenny a charitable person passes by and drops a halfpenny or a penny into the poor man's hand and disdains to take the matches in this way a single box will be sufficient for a whole evening's trading unless some person should insist upon an actual transaction when the beggar is obliged to procure another box at the nearest oilman's there are very few articles upon which an actual profit is made by legitimate sale porcelain shirt buttons a favourite commodity of the petty trading beggars would not yield the price of a single meal unless the seller could dispose of at least twenty dozen in a day cottons stay laces and the like can now be obtained so cheaply at the shops that no one thinks of buying these articles in the streets unless it be in a charitable mood almost the only commodities in which a legitimate trade is carried on by the petty traders of the streets are flowers songs knives combs braces purses portemonnaies the sellers of knives combs and so on are to a certain extent legitimate traders and do not calculate upon charity they are cheats perhaps but not beggars the vendors of flowers and songs though they really make an effort to sell their goods and often realize a tolerable profit are nevertheless beggars and trust to increase their earnings by obtaining money without giving an equivalent a great many children are sent out by their parents to sell flowers during the summer and autumn they find their best market in the bars of public houses and especially those frequented by prostitutes if none else give prostitutes a good character the very poor do i don't know what we should do but for them said an old beggar woman to me one day they are good-hearted souls always kind to the poor i hope god will forgive them i have had many examples of this sympathy for misfortune and poverty on the part of the fallen women of the streets a fellow feeling no doubt makes them wondrous kind they know what it is to be cast off and spurned and despised they know too what it is to starve and like the beggars they are subject to the stern move on of the policeman the relations which subsist between the prostitutes and the beggars reveal some curious traits beggars will enter a public house because they see some women at the bar who will assist their suit they offer their little wares to some gentleman at the bar and the women will say give the poor devil something or buy bouquets for us or if the commodity should be laces or buttons they say don't take the poor old woman's things give her the money and the gentlemen just to show off and appear liberal do as they are told possibly but for the pleading of their gay companions they would have answered the appeal with a curse and gruff command to be gone i once saw an old woman kiss a bedizened prostitute's hand in real gratitude for a service of this kind i don't know that i ever witnessed anything more touching in my life the woman who a few minutes before had been flaunting about the bar in the reckless manner peculiar to her class was quite moved by the old beggar's act and i saw a tear mount in her eye and slowly trickle down her painted cheek making a white channel through the rouge as it fell but in a moment she dashed it away and the next was flaunting and singing as before prostitutes are afraid to remain long under the influence of good thoughts they recall their days of innocence and overpower them with an intolerable sadness a sadness which springs of remorse 
the gay women assume airs of patronage towards the beggars, and as such are looked up to. But a beggar woman, however poor and however miserable, if she is conscious of being virtuous, is always sensible of her superiority in that respect. She is thankful for the kindness of the gay lady and extols her goodness of heart, but she pities while she admires and mutters as a last word, May God forgive her. Thus does one touch of nature make all the world akin, and thus does virtue survive all the buffets of evil fortune to raise even a beggar to the level of the most worthy and be a treasure dearer and brighter than all the pleasures of the world. The sellers of flowers and songs are chiefly boys and young girls. They buy their flowers in Covent Garden, where the refuse of the market is cleared out, and make them up into small bouquets, which they sell for a penny. When the flower season is over, they sell songs, those familiar productions of Royal, Catnach and Company, which, it is said, the great Lord Macaulay was wont to collect and treasure up as collateral evidences of history. Some of the boys who pursue this traffic are masters of all the trades that appertain to begging. I have traced one boy by the identifying mark of a most villainous squint through a career of ten years. When I first saw him, he was a mere child of about four years of age. His mother sent him with a ragged little girl, his sister, into public house bars to beg. Their diminutive size attracted attention and excited charity. By and by, possibly in consequence of the interference of the police, they carried pennyworths of flowers with them, at other times matches, and at others halfpenny sheets of songs. After this the boy and girl appeared dressed in sailor's costume, both as boys, and sung duets. I remember that one of the duets, which had a spoken part, was not very decent. The poor children evidently did not understand what they said, but the thoughtless people at the bar laughed and gave them money. By and by, the boy became too big for this kind of work, and I next met him selling fusees. After the lapse of about a year, he started in the shoeblack line. His station was at the end of Endell Street, near the Baths. But as he did not belong to one of the regularly organised brigades, he was hunted about by the police and could not make a living. On the death of the crossing sweeper at the corner, he succeeded to that functionary's broom, and in his new capacity was regarded by the police as a useful member of society. The last time I saw him, he was in possession of a costermonger's barrow, selling mackerel. He had grown a big strong fellow, but I had no difficulty in identifying the little squinting child who begged and sold flowers and songs in public house bars with the strong, loud-lunged vendor of mackerel. I suppose this young beggar may be said to have pursued an honourable career and raised himself in the world. Many who have such an introduction to life finish their course in a penal settlement. There are not a few who assume the appearance of petty traders for the purpose of committing thefts, such as picking a gentleman's pocket when he is intoxicated, and slinking into parlours to steal bagatelle balls. Police spies occasionally disguise themselves as petty traders. There is a well-known man who goes about with a bag of nuts, betting that he will tell within two how many you take up in your hand. This man is said to be a police spy. I have not been able to ascertain whether this is true or not, but I am satisfied that the man does not get his living by his nut trick. In the daytime he appears without his nuts, dressed in a suit of black, and looking certainly not unlike a policeman in mufti. Among the petty trading beggars, there are a good many idiots and half-witted creatures who obtain a living, and a very good one too, by dancing in a grotesque and idiotic manner on the pavement to amuse children. Some of them are not such idiots as they appear, but assume a half-witted appearance to give oddness to their performance and excite compassion for their misfortune. The street boys are the avengers of this imposition upon society. The idiot performer has a sad life of it when the boys gather about him. They pull his clothes, knock off his hat, and pelt him with lime and mud. But this persecution sometimes redounds to his advantage, 
for when the grown-up folks see him treated thus, they pity him the more. These beggars always take care to carry something to offer for sale. Hapenny songs are most commonly the merchandise. The little half-witted Italian man who used to go about grinding an organ that had no inside to it, as the boys said, was a beggar of this class, and I really think he traded on his constant persecution by the gamin. Music, of course, he made none, for there was only one string left in his battered organ, but he always acted so as to convey the idea that the boys had destroyed his instrument. He would turn away at the handle in a desperate way, as if he were determined to spare no effort to please his patrons, but nothing ever came of it but a feeble tink-a-tink -tink at long intervals. If his organ could at any time have been spoiled, certainly the boys might have done it, for their great delight was to put stones in it and batter in its deal back with sticks. I am informed that this man had a good deal more of the rogue than of the fool in his composition. A gentleman offered to have his organ repaired for him, but he declined, and at length, when the one remaining string gave way, he would only have that one mended. It was his dodge to grind the air, and appear to be unconscious that he was not discoursing most eloquent music. Tract selling in the streets is a line peculiar to the Hindus. I find that the tracts are given to them by religious people, and that they are bought by religious people who are not unfrequently the very same persons who provided the tracts. Very few petty trading beggars take to tract selling from their own inspiration, for in good sooth it does not pay, except when conducted on the principle I have just indicated. Some find it convenient to exhibit tracts simply to evade the law applying to beggars and vagrants, but they do not use them if they can procure a more popular article. In these remarks it is very far from my intention to speak of religious people with any disrespect. I merely use the expression religious people to denote those who employ themselves actively and constantly in disseminating religious publications among the people. Their motives and their efforts are most praiseworthy, and my only regret is that their labours are not rewarded by a larger measure of success. An Author's Wife in the course of my inquiry into the habits, condition and mode of life of the petty trading beggars of London, I met with a young woman who alleged that the publications she sold were the production of her husband. I encountered her at a bar of a tavern where I was occupied in looking out for specimens of the class of beggars which I am now describing. She entered the bar modestly and with seeming diffidence. She had some printed sheets in her hand. I asked her what they were. She handed me a sheet. It was entitled, The Pretty Girls of London. It was only a portion of the work, and on the last page was printed, To Be Continued. Do you bring this out in numbers? I asked. Yes, sir, she replied. It is written by my husband, and he is continuing it from time to time. Are you then his publisher? I inquired. Yes, sir. My husband is ill abed, and I am obliged to go out and sell his work for him. I looked through the sheet, and I saw that it was not a very decent work. "'Have you ever read this?' I inquired. "'Oh, yes, sir, and I think it's very clever. Don't you think so, sir?' It certainly was written with some little ability, and I said so, but I objected to its morality, upon which she replied, "'But it's what takes, sir.' She sold several copies while I was present, at tuppence each but one or two gave her fourpence and sixpence. As she was leaving, I made further inquiries about her husband. She said he was an author by profession and had seen better days. He was very ill and unable to work. I asked her to give me his address, as I might be of some assistance to him. This request seemed to perplex her, and at length she said she was afraid her husband would not like to see me. He was very proud. I have since ascertained that this author's pretty little wife is a dangerous impostor. She lives, or did live at the time I met her, at the back of Clare Market, with a man, not her husband, who was well known to the police as a notorious begging letter writer. He was not the author of anything but those artful appeals with forged signatures 
of which I have given specimens under the heading of Screevers. I was also assured by an officer that the pretended author's wife had on one occasion been concerned in decoying a young man to a low lodging near Lincoln's Inn Fields, where the unsuspecting youth was robbed and maltreated. End of section 110「Section 111 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 4, by Henry Mayhew, 1812-1887. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Beggars by Andrew Halliday. Part 12. Dependents of Beggars. The dependents of beggars may be divided into screevers proper, that is, writers of slums and fakements for those who live by screeving, and referees, or those who give characters to professional beggars when references are required. Beggars are generally born and bred to the business. Their fathers and mothers were beggars before them, and they have a hereditary right to the calling. The exceptions to this rule are those who have fallen into mendicancy and follow it from necessity, and those who have flown to it in a moment of distress and, finding it more lucrative than they supposed, adopted it from choice. Hence it follows that the majority are entirely destitute of education, and by education I mean the primary arts of reading and writing. Where there is demand, there is supply, and the wants of mendicants, who found their account in pads and slums and fakements, created screevers. The antecedents of the screever are always more or less and generally more, disreputable. He has been a fraudulent clerk imprisoned for embezzlement, or a highly respected treasurer to a philanthropic society who has made off with the funds entrusted to him, or a petty forger whose family have purchased silence and hushed up a scandal, or, more frequently, that most dangerous of convicts, the half-educated convict, who has served his time or escaped his bonds. Too proud to beg himself, or, more probably, too well known to the police to dare face daylight, ignorant of any honest calling, or too idle to practice it, without courage to turn thief or informer, lazy, dissolute, and self-indulgent, the screever turns his little education to the worst of purposes, and prepares the forgery he leaves the more fearless cadger to utter. The following are specimens of the screever's work, copied from the original documents in the possession of Mr. Horsford of the Mendicity Society. Quote, Parish of Battersea, County of Surrey. This memorial showeth that Mr. Alexander Fife, a native of Port Glasgow, N.B., and for several years carrying on the business of a nursery and seedsman in this parish, became security for his son-in-law, Andrew Talfer, of Bay Street, Port Glasgow, who, in October last, privately disposed of his effects and absconded to the colonies, leaving his wife and six children totally unprovided for, and the said Mr. Alexander Fife responsible for the sum of £1,350. The sudden reverse of fortune, together with other domestic afflictions, so preyed on the mind of Mr. Fife that he is now an inmate of the lunatic asylum. The said Mr. Fife, together with his family, have hitherto maintained the character of honesty and industry, in consideration of which I have been earnestly solicited by a few benevolent persons to draw up this statement on behalf of the bereaved family. I have therefore taken on myself the responsibility of so doing, trusting those whom Providence has given the means will lend their timely aid in rescuing a respectable family from the ruin that inevitably awaits them. Given under my hand at the vestry in the aforesaid parish of Battersea and county of Surrey, this 24th day of February in the year of our Lord, 1851. End quote. John Thomas Freeman, vestry clerk, £3. J. S. Jenkinson, vicar of Battersea, £5. Watson and Co., £5. John Forster and Co., Five pounds. Reverend J. Twining, two pounds two shillings. Alderman J. Humphrey, five pounds. 
Sir George Pollock, Southlands, five pounds. Henry Mitten, two pounds. William Downs, Oak Wharf, two pounds. Mrs. Broadley Wilson, one pound. Sir Henry B. Houghton, five pounds. Mrs. Admiral Colin Campbell, one pound, one shilling. Colonel J. Macdonnell, five pounds paid. Anonymous, two pounds. Mrs. Colonel Forbes, three pounds. Colonel W. Mace paid five pounds. P. H. Gillespie, Minister of the Scotch Church, Battersea Rise, five pounds. 3rd of March, 51. Messrs. Moffat, Gillespie & Co., five pounds paid. My readers will perceive that the above document is written in a semi-legal style, with a profuse amount of large capitals, and minute particularity in describing localities, though here and there an almost ostentatious indifference exists upon the same points. Thus we are told that the parish of Battersea is in the county of Surrey, and that Port Glasgow is in North Britain, while, on the other hand, we are only informed that the absconding Andrew Talfer of Bay Street, Port Glasgow, N.B., made off to the colonies, which, considering the vast extent of our colonial possessions, is vague, to say the least of it. It must also be allowed that the beginning the word benevolent in the second paragraph with a capital B is equally to the credit of the writer's head and heart. It is odd that, after having spelt responsible so correctly, the writer should have indulged a playful fancy with responsibility, note with two L's, end note. But perhaps trifling orthographical lapses may be in keeping with the assumed character of Vestry Clark. Critically speaking, the weak point of this composition is its punctuation, its strong point, the concluding paragraph, the given under my hand at the vestry, which carries with it the double weight of a royal proclamation and the business-like formality of an admiralty contract. But the composition and calligraphy are trifles. The real genius lies in the signatures. I wish my readers could see the names attached to this memorial as they lay before me. The first, J. S. Jenkinson, is written in the most clerical of hands. Watson and Co. is round and commercial. John Forster and Co. the same. The Reverend J. Twining, scholarly and easy. Alderman J. Humphrey, stiff and upright. These names are evidently copied from the Red Book and Directory. Some are purely fictitious. Many are cleverly executed forgeries. The ingenuity of the concoctor and compiler of the sympathiser with the woes of Mr. Alexander Fife of Port Glasgow, N.B., was exercised in vain. The imposture was detected. He was taken to a police court, condemned and sentenced. Here is the case of another unfortunate Scotchman from the pen of the same gifted author. The handwriting, the wording, the capitals and the N.B.'s are identical with those of the warm-hearted Vestry Clark of Battersea. Quote, These are to certify that Mr. Alexander Malcolm, ship owner and general merchant, was on his passage from Fraserburgh, Aberdeenshire, N.B., on the night of the 3rd inst, when his vessel, the Susan and Mary of Fraserburgh, laden with corn, was run down by a steamer name unknown the crew consisting of six persons narrowly escaping with their lives. Mr. Malcolm sustained a loss of property by the appalling event to the amount of £370, and being a person of exemplary character, with a numerous family entirely depending upon him for support, his case has excited the greatest sympathy. It has therefore been proposed by a few of his friends to enter into a subscription on his behalf with a view of raising by voluntary contributions a sufficient sum to release him from his present embarrassed situation. I have known him for several years, a constant trader to this wharf, and consider him worthy of every sympathy. End quote. Leith and Glasgow Wharf, London, May 6th, 1847. Joseph Adams, £5. George Carroll, £5. A. Nicol and Sons, paid £5. P. Laurie, five pounds. Vivian and Sons, three pounds. J. H. Petty, two pounds paid. Messrs. Drummond, 
five pounds paid. Cranford, Colvin and Co., three pounds. Baring Brothers, five pounds. Curries and Co., three pounds. Jonathan Price, five pounds, five shillings. Reed Irving and Co., five pounds. The signatures attached to this are imitations of the handwriting of various firms, each distinct, individual, and apparently genuine. The next grieve takes the form of a resolution at a public meeting. Quote, Notting Hill, District, Parish of Kensington, August 6th, 1857. The gentry and clergy of this neighbourhood will no doubt remember that the late Mr. Edward Wyatt, for many years a respectable tradesman in this parish, died in embarrassed circumstances in 1855, leaving a widow and seven children totally unprovided for, the eldest of whom, a fine girl, 19 years of age, having been a cripple from her birth, has received a liberal education and is considered a competent person to superintend a seminary for the tuition of young females, which would materially assist her mother in supporting a numerous family. A meeting was convened on Monday evening, the 3rd inst, the Reverend J.P. Gall, incumbent of St. John's, in the chair, when it was unanimously proposed to enter into a subscription with a view of raising by voluntary contributions the sum of £40 in order to establish the afflicted girl in this praiseworthy undertaking. I have been instructed by the parochial authorities to draw up this statement and therefore take upon myself the responsibility of so doing, knowing the case to be one meriting sympathy. Signed by order of the chairman, Reuben Green, Vestry Clark. End quote. Subscriptions received at the meeting eleven pounds thirteen shillings and sixpence. Reverend J. P. Gill, one pound. Mrs. W. Mooney, ten shillings paid. Chushington, one pound. Mrs. Coventry paid ten shillings. J. and W. S. Huntley, Addison Terrace, Notting Hill, paid one pound one shilling. Mrs. Cribb paid five shillings. The Misses Shoreland, seven shillings and sixpence. Mrs. Harris, five shillings. Miss Hall, Lansdowne Crescent, ten shillings. W. Atkinson paid five shillings. Thomas Jackham, five shillings. Miss J. Robertson paid five shillings. The Misses Howard, five shillings. The above letter is written in a better style than those preceding it. Great talent is exhibited in the imitations of Lady's Hand. The signatures Mrs. Coventry, Mrs. Cribb, the Mrs. Howard, and Mrs. Harris, surely this griever must have been familiar with the works of Dickens, are excellently done, but are surpassed by the clever execution of the letters forming the names the Mrs. Shoreland and Miss Hall Lansdowne Crescent which are masterpieces of feminine calligraphy. The following note was sent to its address, accompanied by a memorial in one of the House of Commons envelopes, but the faulty grammar, so unlike the style in which a Member of Parliament ought to write, betrayed it. Quote, Committee Room No. 3, House of Commons. Mr. J. Whatman presents his respectful compliments to the Reverend W. Smith Marriott, at the earnest request of the poor families, whose case will be fully explained on perusal of the accompanying document in the bearer's possession, begs to submit it for that gentleman's charitable consideration. The persons whom this concerns are natives of Cranbrook, Gondhurst, Brenchley, and so on, and bears unexceptionable characters. They have the honour of knowing Mr. Marriott at Wormsmordon, and trust he will add his signature to the list of subscribers for which favour they will feel grateful. J. Watman takes more than ordinary interest in this case, having a knowledge of its authenticity. He therefore trusts that the motives which actuate him in complying with the request will be deemed a sufficient apology. Friday evening, May 28th, 1858. End quote. Quote. This memorial showeth that Mr. Henry Shepherd, a general carrier from Ewell, Cheam, Sutton, and so on, to London, via Mitcham, Morden, Tooting and Clapham, was returning home on the evening of Thursday the 26th inst, when near the Elephant and Castle, his horse took fright at a band of street musicians and ran off at a furious pace, the van coming in contact with a timber carriage, 
was dashed to pieces the animal received such injuries as caused its death and mr shepherd endeavouring to save the property entrusted to his care for delivery had his right leg fractured and is now an inmate of guy's hospital on further investigation we find his loss exceeds seventy pounds and knowing him to be an industrious honest man with a large family depending upon his exertions for support we earnestly beg leave to recommend his case to the notice of the gentry and clergy of his neighbourhood trusting their united donations in conjunction with our mutual assistance will release a deserving family from their present unfortunate position in life given under our hands this thirtieth day of august in the year of our lord eighteen fifty eight End quote. William Harmer, two pounds. George Stone Newell, two pounds. Sir George L. Glynn, two pounds two shillings. F. Gosling, two pounds two shillings. Reverend W. H. Vernon, one pound. Morton Stubbs, Sutton, one pound one shilling. Edmund Antrobus, paid to bearer, two pounds two shillings. Second of the ninth, fifty eight. W. R. G. Farmer, two pounds two shillings paid. Rev. R. Bouchier, £2 paid. My readers must admire the ingenuity of this letter. The via Mitchum looks so formal and convincing. The grouping of the circumstances, the local colouring, as the critics would call it, which contributed to the ruin of the ill-fated general carrier Henry Shepherd, is excellent. Quote, Near the elephant and castle, his horse took fright at a band of street musicians. End quote what more natural quote, ran off at a furious pace the van coming in contact with a timber carriage was dashed to pieces the animal end quote, not the horse that would have been tautological and animal with a capital a quote, the animal received such injuries as caused its death and mr shepherd endeavouring to save the property entrusted to his care end quote, admirable man devoted carrier leaving his van to smash his horse to perish as they might that the goods confided to him might receive no hurt quote, endeavouring to save the property entrusted to his care for delivery had his right leg fractured and is now an inmate of guy's hospital End quote. this is as well conceived and carried out as sheridan's pistol bullet that misses its mark strikes a bronze hercules in the mantelpiece glances off through the window and wounds the postman who was coming to the door with a double letter from northamptonshire the word paid and its abbreviation p d is scattered here and there artistically among the subscriptions a small note in a different hand in a corner of the last page shows the fate of industry and talent misapplied it runs quote, taken from thomas shepherd september thirteen mansion house Lord Mayor, Sir A. Carden, committed for three months, J. W. Horsford. End quote. The last instance I shall cite is peculiar, from the elaborate nature of the deception, and from containing a forgery of the signature of Lord Brougham. The screever in this case has taken a regularly printed warrant, execution, or distress for rent, filled it up with the name of Mrs. Julia Thompson, and so on, and placed an imaginary inventory to a fictitious seizure. The word patent is spelt patent, note with two t's, end note, which might be allowable in a broker's man, but when your, note, e-w-e-r, end note, is written your, note, u-r-e, end note, I think he is too hard upon the orthography peculiar to the officers of the sheriff of Middlesex, particularly as it is evident from the rest of the filling in of the form that the error is intentional not only law but science is invoked in aid of this capital case of sham real distress pleuropneumonia looks veterinary and voracious enough to carry conviction to the hearts of the most sceptical take notice that by the authority and on the behalf of your landlord thomas young I have this sixteenth day of April in the year of our Lord one thousand eight hundred and fifty six distrained the several goods and chattels specified in the schedule or inventory here and under written in nineteen Proud Street in the parish of Paddington in the county of Middlesex for twenty nine pounds 
being twelve months and arrears rent due to the said Mr. Thomas Young at 9th February last, and if you shall not pay the said twelve months and arrears rent so due and in arrear as aforesaid, together with the costs and charges of this distress, or replevy the said goods and chattels within five days from the date hereof, I shall cause the said goods and chattels to be appraised and sold, pursuant to the statute in that case made and provided. Given under my hand the day and year above written, J. W. Russell, sworn broker, and so on, to Mrs. Julia Thompson. Removing any goods off the premises to avoid a distress or any person aiding, assisting, or concealing the same, will subject themselves to double the value of such effects so removed or concealed, or suffer imprisonment in the house of correction, there to be kept to hard labour without bail or main prize for six months, pursuant to the Act 11th George II. Sold by J. H. Beckford, Law Stationer, 122 Chancery Lane. End quote. The schedule, or inventory, above, referred to Mahogany drawers, mahogany dining tables, six mahogany seated chairs, two arm ditto ditto, one eight day clock, six oil paintings gilt frames, one large pier glass, carpet and hearth rug, fender and fire irons, quantity of chimney ornaments, six kitchen chairs, one long deal table, one large copper boiler, two copper kettles, patent mangle, one large water butt, two washing tubs, one and a half dozen of knives and forks, quantity of earthenware, and so on and so on, two feather beds and bedding, one flock, ditto ditto, two mahogany bedsteads, one French ditto, wash hand stand, your, note, spelt U-R-E, end note, and so on, two hair mattresses, three bedroom chairs, one set of bedroom carpeting, staircase carpeting, brass rods, and so on, one milch cow, one cart mare, one dung cart, one wheelbarrow, three hundred weight of hay, quantity of manure, and sundry dairy utensils, and so on, and so on, and so on. On the back of this legal document is written, quote, This memorial showeth that Mrs. Julia Thompson, widow, cowkeeper, and dairy woman, has, since the demise of her husband, which took place in 1849, supported a family consisting of six children by the assistance of a small dairy. The pleuropneumonia, a disease among cattle, has prevailed in the neighbourhood for several weeks, during which time she has lost five milch cows, estimated at £75, which will end in her entire ruin, unless aided by the hands of the benevolent, whose donations, in conjunction with our mutual assistance, will, we trust, enable Mrs. Thompson to realise some part of her lost property to follow her business as before. H. Peters, three pounds, three shillings. April 17th, 1856. Chaplain and Horn, two pounds. Mrs. Gore, one pound. Reverend J. W. Buckley, two pounds. Reverend John Miles, one pound. Mrs. J. Shaw, two pounds paid. C. Lushington, three pounds three shillings. W. H. Ormsby, two pounds. C. Molyneux, one pound. Miss Ferrers, two pounds paid. W. Emmett, two pounds two shillings. Anonymous, two pounds. Mrs. Gregg, two pounds two shillings. Miss Brown, one pound. J. B. White and Brothers, three pounds paid. Thomas Slater, two pounds. W. T. Bird, two pounds paid. Miss Hamilton, three pounds paid. Reverend J. A. Toole, two pounds paid. Mr. Hopgood, two pounds paid. A friend to the widow, paid to Mr. Pegg, three pounds three shillings. Richard Green, two pounds paid. Reverend A. M. Campbell, three pounds. W. P. France, one pound. W. M. N. Riley, two pounds two shillings. Mrs. Forbes, two pounds paid. R. Gurney, one pound. J. Spurling, two pounds paid. George R. Ward, one pound. Miss Brown, two pounds. Mrs. Needham, two pounds paid. Mr. Davidson, two pounds. Mrs. H. Scott Waring, three pounds three shillings. Mrs. Hall, one pound one shilling. Samuel Venables, two pounds. 
Rev. A. Taylor, one pound. Rev. H. V. Le Bas, one pound. Thomas Bunting, two pounds paid. Mrs. and Miss Vullamy, three pounds. Rev. C. Smalley, five pounds. Miss Smalley, three pounds. Lord Brougham, two pounds. End quote. The two most notorious screevers of the present day are Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Johnson of Westminster, or, as he is proud of being called, Johnson the Schemer. Referees are generally keepers of low lodging houses, brothels, and so on, or small tradesmen who supply thieves and beggars with chandlery, and so on. When applied to for the character of any of their friends and confederates, they give them an excellent recommendation but are careful not to overdo it. With that highest sort of artfulness that conceals artfulness, they know when to stop, and seldom or never betray themselves by saying too much. Mrs. Simmons, said one of them in answer to an application for character. Ah, yes, sir, I known her a good many years, and a very honest, hard-working, industrious, sober sort of person I always knowed her to be at least as far as I see. I never see nothing wrong in the women, for my part. The earliest, uppest, and downest, latest women I ever see, and well she need be with that family of hers, nine on em, and the eldest girl a idiot. When first I knew her, sir, her husband was alive, and then Susan, that's the idiot, sir, were a babe in arms. Her husband was a bad man to her, sir. The way that man drunk and spent his money among all the lowest girls and corner coves was awful to see. I mean, by corner coves, them sort of men who is always a-standing at the corners of the streets and chaffing respectable folks a-passing by. We call them corner coves about here. But as to poor Mrs. Simmons, sir, that husband of hers tret her awful. Though he's dead and gone now, poor man, and perhaps I have no right to speak ill on the dead. He had some money with her too, two hundred pound, I heard, her father was a builder in a small way, and lived out towards Fulham. A very deserving woman, I always found her, sir, and I have helped her a little bit myself. Not much, of course, for my circumstances would not allow of it. I have a wife and family myself, and I have often been wishful I could help her more. But what can a man do as has to pay his rent and taxes and bring up his family respectable? When her last baby but two had the ringworm, we helped her now and then with a loaf of bread, poor thing. It ran right through the family, that ringworm did. Six on em had it at the same time, she told us. And then they took the measles. The most unluckiest family in catching things as goes about, I never saw. But as to Mrs. Simmons herself, sir, poor thing, a more hard-workinger and honester woman I never... And so on, and so on, and so on. End of section 111. Section 112 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 4, by Henry Mayhew, 1812 to 1887. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Beggars by Andrew Halliday, Part 13. Distressed Operative Beggars. All beggars are ingenious enough to make capital of public events. They read the newspapers, judge the bent of popular sympathy, and decide on the lay to be adopted. The Times informs its readers that two or three hundred English navigators have been suddenly turned adrift in France. The native labourers object to the employment of aliens, and our stalwart countrymen have been subjected to insult as well as privation. The beggar's course is taken. He goes to Petticoat Lane, purchases a white smock-frock, a purple or red plush waistcoat profusely ornamented with wooden buttons, a coloured cotton neckerchief, and a red nightcap. If procurable in the lane, he also buys a pair of coarse-ribbed grey worsted stockings, and boots whose enormous weight is increased by several pounds of iron nails in their thick soles. Even then he is not perfect. He seeks a rag and bottle, and old iron shop. Your genuine artist beggar never asks for what is new. He prefers the worn, the used, the ragged, and the rusty, and bargains for a spade. 
The proprietor of the shop knows perfectly well that his customer requires an article for show, not service, and they part with a mutual grin, and the next day every street swarms with groups of distressed navigators. Popular feeling is on their side, and halfpence shower round them. Meanwhile, the poor fellows for whom all this generous indignation is evoked are waiting in crowds at a French port till the British consul pass them over to their native soil as paupers. The same tactics are pursued with manufacturers. Beggars read the list of patents and watch the effect of every fresh discovery in mechanics on the operatives of Lancashire and Yorkshire. A new machine is patented. So many hands are thrown out of work. So many beggars who have never seen Lancashire, except when on the tramp, are heard in London. A strike takes place at several mills. Pretended hands next day parade the streets. Even the variability of our climate is pressed into the cadging service. A frost locks up the rivers and hardens the earth. Rusty spades and gardening tools are in demand, and the indefatigable beggar takes the pavement in another fancy dress. Every social shipwreck is watched and turned to account by these systematic land wreckers, who have reduced false signals to a regular code, and beg by rule and line and chart and compass. Starved out manufacturers parade in gangs of four and five, or with squalid wives and a few children. They wear paper caps and white aprons with bibs to them, or a sort of cross-barred pinafore, called in the manufacturing districts a checker brat. Sometimes they make a pitch, that is, stand face to face, turning their backs upon a heartless world, and sing. The well-known ditty of We are all the way from Manchester, and we've got no work to do, set to the tune of Oh, let us be joyful, was first introduced by this class of beggars. Or they will carry tapes, stay-laces, and papers of buttons, and throw imploring looks from side to side, and beg by implication or they will cock their chins up in the air so as to display the unpleasantly prominent apples in their bony throats, and drone a sam. When they go out on the blob, they make a long oration, not in the Lancashire or Yorkshire dialects, but in a cockney voice of a strong Whitechapel flavour. The substance of the speech varies but slightly from the patter of the handloom weaver, indeed the Nottingham driz, or laceman, the hand on strike, the distressed weaver, and the operative beggar generally bear so strong a resemblance to each other that they not only look like, but sometimes positively are, one and the same person. Unemployed agriculturalists and frozen out gardeners are seen during a frost in gangs of from six to twenty. Two gangs generally work together, that is, while one gang begs at one end of a street, a second gang begs at the other. Their mode of procedure, their programme, is very simple. Upon the spades which they carry is chalked frozen out or starving, and they enhance the effect of this slum or fakement by shouting out sturdily, frozen out, we're all frozen out. The gardeners differ from the agriculturalists or navvies in their costume. They affect aprons and old straw hats, their manner is less demonstrative, and their tones less rusty and unmelodious. The navvies roar, the gardeners squeak. The navvies' petition is made loud and lustily, as by men used to work in clay and rock. The gardener's voice is meek and mild, as of a gentle nature trained to tend on fruits and flowers. The young, bulky, sinewy beggar plays navvy. The shrivelled, gravelly, pottering, elderly cadger performs gardener. There can be no doubt that in times of hardship many honest labourers are forced into the streets to beg. A poor hard-working man whose children cry to him for food can feel no scruple in soliciting charity. Against such, the writer of these pages would urge nothing. All credit to the motive that compels them unwillingly to ask alms. All honour to the feeling that prompts the listener to give. It is not the purpose of the author of this work to write down every mendicant an impostor or every almsgiver a fool. On the contrary, 
he knows how much real distress and how much real benevolence exist and he would but step between the open hand of true charity and the itching palm of the professional beggar who stands between the misery that asks and the philanthropy that would relieve the winter of eighteen sixty to sixty one was a fine harvest for the frozen out impostors some few of whom happily reaped the reward of their deserts in the police courts three strong hearty men were brought up at one office they said that they were starving and they came from horsley down when searched six shillings and eleven pence were found upon them they reiterated that they were starving and were out of work on which the sitting magistrate kindly provided them with both food and employment by sentencing them to seven days hard labour the profits of the frozen out gardener and agriculturalist are very large and generally quadruples the sum earned by honest labour in the february of eighteen sixty one four of these distressed navvies went into a public house to divide the swag they had procured by one day's shouting each had a handkerchief filled with bread and meat and cheese they called for pots of porter and drank heartily and when the reckoning was paid and the spoils equally divided the share of each man was seven shillings the credulity of the public upon one point has often surprised me a man comes out into the streets to say that he is starving a few halfpence are thrown to him if really hungry he would make for the nearest baker's shop but no he picks up the coppers pockets them and proclaims again that he is starving though he has the means of obtaining food in his fingers not that this obvious anachronism stops the current of benevolence or the chink of coin upon the stones the fainting famished fellow walks leisurely up the street and still bellows out in notes of thunder i am starving if one of my readers will try when faint and exhausted to produce the same tone in the open air he will realise the impossibility of shouting and starving simultaneously and loom weavers and others deprived of their living by machinery as has been before stated the regular beggar seizes on the latest pretext for a plausible tale of woe improvements in mechanics and consequent cheapness to the many are usually the causes of loss to the few the sufferings of this minority is immediately turned to account by veteran cadgers who rush to their wardrobes of well-chosen rags attire themselves in appropriate costume and ply their calling with the last grievance out when unprovided with patter they seek the literati of their class and buy a speech this they partly commit to memory and trust to their own ingenuity to improvise any little touches that may prove effective many screevers slum scribblers and fakement dodgers eke out a living by this sort of authorship real operatives seldom stir from their own locality the sympathy of their fellows their natural habits and the occasional relief afforded by the parish bind them to their homes and the distressed weaver is generally a spurious metropolitan production the following is a copy of one of their prepared orations Quote, my kind christian friends we are poor working men from blank which cannot obtain bread by our labour owing to the new alterations and inventions which the master manufacturers have introduced which spares them the cost of employing hands and does the work by machinery instead yes kind friends machinery and steam engines now does the work which formerly was done by our hands and work and labour our masters have turned us off and we are without bread and knowing no other trade but that which we was born and bred to we are compelled to ask your kind assistance for which be sure of it we shall be ever grateful as we have said masters now employs machinery and steam engines instead of men forgetting that steam engines have no families of wives or children and consequently are not called on to provide for them we are without bread to put into our mouths also our wives and children are the same foreign competition has drove our masters to this step and we working men are the sufferers thereby kind friends 
drop your compassion on us. The smallest trifle will be thankfully received, and God will bless you for the relief you give to us. May you never know what it is to be as we are now, drove from our work and forced to come out into the streets to beg your charity from door to door. Have pity on us, for our situation is most wretched. Our wives and families are starving, our children cry to us for bread, and we have none to give them. Oh, my friends, look down on us with compassion. We are poor working men, weavers from blank, which cannot obtain bread by our labour, owing to the new inventions in machinery, which, and so on, and so on, and so on. End quote. In concluding this section of our work, I would commend to the notice of my readers the following observations on almsgiving. The poor will never cease from the land. There always will be exceptional excesses and outbreaks of distress that no plan could have provided against, and there always will be those who stand with open palm to receive, in the face of heaven, our tribute of gratitude for our own happier lot. Yet there is a duty of the head as well as of the heart, and we are bound as much to use our reason as to minister of our abundance. The same heaven that has rewarded our labours and filled our garners or our coffers, or at least given us favour in the sight of merchants and bankers, has given us also brains, and consequently a charge to employ them. So we are bound to sift appeals and consider how best to direct our benevolence. Whoever thinks that charity consists in mere giving, and that he has only to put his hand in his pocket, or draw a cheque in favour of somebody who is very much in want of money, and looks very grateful for favours to be received, will find himself taught better, if not in the school of adversity, at least by many a hard lesson of kindness thrown away, or perhaps very brutishly repaid. As animals have their habits, so there is a large class of mankind whose single cleverness is that of representing themselves as justly and naturally dependent on the assistance of others, who look paupers from their birth, who seek givers and forsake those who have given, as naturally as a tree sends its roots into new soil and deserts the exhausted. It is the office of reason, reason improved by experience, to teach us not to waste our own interest and our resources on beings that will be content to live on our bounty and will never return a moral profit to our charitable industry. The great opportunities or the mighty powers that heaven may have given us, it never meant to be lavished on mere human animals who eat, drink and sleep and whose only instinct is to find out a new caterer when the old one is exhausted. End of section 112section 113 of london labour and the london poor volume 4 by henry mayhew 1812 to 1887 this librivox recording is in the public domain read by gillian hendry appendix part 1 maps and tables illustrating the criminal statistics of each of the counties of england and wales in 1851 map showing the number of persons to every 100 acres or the density of the population in each of the counties of England and Wales in 1851. Reader's note. There follows an illustration of England and Wales by counties, the details of which are also given in the table following. End reader's note. The counties printed black are those in which the population is above the average density. The counties left white are those in which the population is below the average density. The average has been calculated from the last returns of the Registrar-General. Table showing the density of the population in the different counties in England and Wales in 1851. Reader's note. The table contains the headings, counties, dimensions in square miles and in statute acres, houses divided into number of inhabited houses, number of uninhabited houses, number of houses building, total number of houses 1851, total number of houses 1841, and increase of houses per cent 1841 to 51. 
population, 1851, divided into males, females, total population, 1851, total population, 1841, and increase of population per cent, 1841 to 51. Density, divided into number of persons to each 100 acres, number of acres to each person, number of acres to each house, and number of persons to each inhabited house. End reader's note. Dimensions in square miles, Bedford, 465 Barks, 741 Lux, 725 Cambridge, 838 Chester, 1014 Cornwall, 1336 Cumberland, 1515 Derby, 1036 Devon, 2557 Dorset, 980 Durham, 1062 Essex, 1530 Gloucester, 1235 Hereford, 850 Hartford, 626 Hunts, 379 Kent, 1519 Lancaster, 1746 Leicester, 799 Lincoln, 2600 Middlesex, 280 Monmouth, 507 Norfolk, 2019 Northampton, 1011 Northumberland, 1821 Nottingham, 822 Oxford, 730 Rutland, 152 Salop, 1351 Somerset, 1606 Southampton, 1591 Stafford, 1150 Suffolk, 1436 Surrey, 741 Sussex, 1419 Warwick, 887 Westmoreland, 759 Wilts, 1356 Worcester, 718 York, 5733 North Wales, 3194 South Wales, 4,231. Total for England and Wales, 57,067 square miles. Dimensions in Statute Acres. Bedford, 297,632. Barks, 473,920. Lux, 463,880. Cambridge, 536,313. Chester, 649,050 Cornwall, 854,770 Cumberland, 969,490 Derby, 663,180 Devon, 1,636,450 Dorset, 627,220 Durham, 679,530 Essex, 979,000 Gloucester, 790,470 Hereford, 543,800 Hartford, 400,350 Hunts, 242,250 Kent, 972,240 Lancaster, 1,117,260 Leicester, 511,340 Lincoln, 1,663,850 Middlesex, 179,590 Monmouth, 324,310 Norfolk, 1,292,300 Northampton, 646,810 Northumberland, 1,165,430 Nottingham, 525,800 Oxford, 467,230 Rutland, 97,500 Salop, 864,360 Somerset, 1,028,090 Southampton, 1,018,550 Stafford, 736,290 Suffolk, 
nine hundred and eighteen thousand seven hundred and sixty surrey four hundred and seventy four thousand four hundred and eighty sussex nine hundred and seven thousand nine hundred and twenty warwick five hundred and sixty seven thousand nine hundred and thirty westmoreland four hundred and eighty five thousand nine hundred and ninety wilts eight thousand and sixty worcester nine thousand seven hundred and ten york three million six hundred and sixty nine thousand five hundred and ten north wales two million forty four thousand one hundred and sixty south wales two million seven hundred and seven thousand eight hundred and forty total for england and wales thirty six million five hundred and twenty two thousand six hundred and fifteen statute acres houses number of inhabited houses bedford twenty five thousand six hundred and ninety four barks thirty nine thousand four hundred and sixty two bucks twenty nine thousand two hundred and seventeen cambridge thirty eight thousand seven hundred and seventy three chester seventy nine thousand eight hundred and forty nine cornwall sixty eight thousand two hundred and fourteen cumberland thirty six thousand seven hundred and seventy one derby fifty two thousand four hundred and eighty two devon ninety nine thousand one hundred and four dorset thirty four thousand seven hundred and seventy one durham sixty eight thousand nine hundred and eighty nine essex sixty eight thousand three hundred and eighty three gloucester seventy eight thousand three hundred and eighty five hereford twenty thousand four hundred and fifty three hartford thirty three thousand nine hundred and fifty four hunts twelve thousand four hundred and seventy two kent one hundred and eight thousand three hundred and eighty six lancaster three hundred and fifty six thousand four hundred and thirty six leicester forty nine thousand nine hundred and sixty eight lincoln seventy nine thousand six hundred and sixty seven middlesex two hundred and forty two thousand seven hundred and ninety eight monmouth thirty two thousand nine hundred and one norfolk ninety one thousand one hundred and forty three northampton forty three thousand nine hundred and forty five northumberland forty seven thousand five hundred and nine nottingham fifty nine thousand four hundred and twenty seven oxford thirty four thousand nine hundred and twenty two rutland four thousand nine hundred and sixty one salop forty eight thousand eight hundred and forty two somerset eighty seven thousand seven hundred and seventy six southampton seventy four thousand five hundred and eighty eight stafford one hundred and twenty thousand five hundred and one suffolk sixty nine thousand four hundred and seventy nine surrey one hundred and nine thousand four hundred and fifty three sussex fifty nine thousand three hundred and eight warwick ninety eight thousand three hundred and twenty three westmoreland eleven thousand two hundred and forty seven wilts forty nine thousand and sixty one worcester fifty two thousand and fifty five york three hundred and fifty eight thousand six hundred and ninety four north wales eighty three thousand and ninety one south wales one hundred and nineteen thousand five hundred and seven total for england and wales three million two hundred and eighty thousand nine hundred and sixty one number of uninhabited houses bedford six hundred and seventy six barks one thousand five hundred and sixty three bucks one thousand one hundred and three cambridge one thousand seven hundred and seventy seven chester four thousand two hundred and forty eight cornwall four thousand five hundred and twenty eight cumberland one thousand five hundred and thirty one derby two thousand four hundred and eleven devon six thousand and sixteen dorset one thousand five hundred and fifty four durham three thousand and thirty essex three thousand three hundred and fifty three gloucester four thousand nine hundred and sixty one hereford nine hundred and eighty three hartford one thousand one hundred and eighty nine hunts six hundred and forty one kent five thousand five hundred and sixteen lancaster seventeen thousand four hundred and fifty three leicester one thousand five hundred and ninety nine lincoln three thousand three hundred and ninety four Middlesex, 12,213. Monmouth, 1,473. Norfolk, 3,312. Northampton, 
one thousand four hundred and seventy eight northumberland two thousand and sixty nottingham one thousand four hundred and eighty one oxford one thousand three hundred and twenty three rutland one hundred and fifty three salop two thousand one hundred and eighty four somerset five thousand and ninety southampton three thousand four hundred and seventy one stafford four thousand five hundred and twenty six suffolk three thousand and ninety eight surrey five thousand seven hundred and seventeen sussex two thousand two hundred and twenty warwick four thousand six hundred and nine westmoreland five hundred and thirty wilts two thousand two hundred and twenty three worcester two thousand seven hundred and fifty three york sixteen thousand four hundred and sixty nine north wales three thousand seven hundred and twenty south wales five thousand two hundred and sixty nine total for england and wales one hundred and fifty two thousand eight hundred and ninety eight number of houses building bedford one hundred and twenty six barks two hundred and eleven bucks eighty nine cambridge two hundred and four chester seven hundred and fifty six cornwall three hundred and fifty three cumberland two hundred and thirty eight derby four hundred and twenty three devon seven hundred and sixty five dorset two hundred and eighteen durham five hundred and ninety five Essex, three hundred and sixty four, Gloucester, three hundred and ninety three, Hereford, sixty nine, Hartford, two hundred and fourteen, Hunts, sixty two, Kent, one thousand two hundred and ninety, Lancaster, three thousand four hundred and seventy, Leicester, one hundred and ninety eight, Lincoln, five hundred and seventy nine, Middlesex, three thousand two hundred and seventy six, Monmouth, one hundred and eighty three, Norfolk, four hundred and forty nine. Northampton, two hundred and thirty eight. Northumberland, three hundred and eighty four. Nottingham, two hundred and sixty seven. Oxford, one hundred and five. Rutland, eighteen. Salop, one hundred and twelve. Somerset, three hundred and ninety six. Southampton, six hundred and seventeen. Stafford, nine hundred and sixty two. Suffolk, four hundred and twenty four. Surrey, one thousand six hundred and sixty three. Sussex, 609. Warwick, 977. Westmoreland, 94. Wilts, 171. Worcester, 362. York, 3244. North Wales, 522. South Wales, 844. Total for England and Wales, 26,534. Total number of houses, 1851. Bedford, 26,496. Barks, 41,236. Bucks, 30,409. Cambridge, 40,754. Chester, 84,853. Cornwall, 73,095. Cumberland, 38,540. Derby, 55,316. Devon, 105,885. Dorset, 36,543. Durham, 72,614. Essex, 72,100. Gloucester, 83,739. Hereford, 21,505. Hartford, 35,357. Hunts, 13,175. Kent, 115,192. Lancaster, 377,359. Leicester, 51,765. Lincoln, 83,640. Middlesex, 258,287. Monmouth, 34,557. Norfolk, 94,904. Northampton, 45,661. Northumberland, 49,953. Nottingham, 61,175. Oxford, 36,350. Rutland, 5,132. Salop, 51,138. Somerset, 93,252. Southampton, 78,676. Stafford, 
125,989. Suffolk, 73,001. Surrey, 116,838. Sussex, 62,137. Warwick, 103,909. Westmoreland, 11,871. Wilts, 51,455. Worcester, 55,170. York, 378,417. North Wales, 87,333. South Wales, 125,620. Total for England and Wales, 3,460,393. Total number of houses, 1841. Bedford, 22,877. Barks, 39,660. Bucks, 28,860. Cambridge, 35,799. Chester, 75,103. Cornwall, 71,913. Cumberland, 37,160. Derby, 49,477. Devon, 102,424. Dorset, 35,400. Durham, 61,940. Essex, 65,570. Gloucester, 79,953. Hereford, 21,119. Hartford, 32,687. Hunts, 11,676. Kent, 101,717. Lancaster, 322,148. Leicester, 49,470. Lincoln, 74,138. Middlesex, 222,443. Monmouth, 30,099. Norfolk, 88,378. Northampton, 42,358. Northumberland, 55,337. Nottingham, 57,611. Oxford, 34,151. Rutland, 4,899. Salop, 50,131. Somerset, 90,947. Southampton, 69,807. Stafford, 107,941. Suffolk, 67,050. Surrey, 101,121. Sussex, 58,506. Warwick, 90,868. Westmoreland, 11,783. Wilts, 49,918. Worcester, 49,371. York, 341,147. North Wales, 85,847. South Wales, 115,822. Total for England and Wales, 3,144,626. Increase of houses per cent, 1841-51. to 51. Bedford, 15.8. Barks, 4.0. Bucks, 5.4. Cambridge, 13.8. Chester, 13.0. Cornwall, 1.6. Cumberland, 3.7. Derby, 1.2. Devon, 3.4. Dorset, 3.2. Durham, 17.2. Essex, 10.0. Gloucester, 4.7. Hereford 1.8, Hartford 8.2, Hunts 12.8, Kent 13.3, Lancaster 17.1, Leicester 4.6, Lincoln 12.8, Middlesex 16.1, Monmouth 4.8, Norfolk 7.4, Northampton 7.8, Northumberland 10.8. Footnote: In 1841, flats were returned in Northumberland as separate houses. This accounts for the decrease in 1851. End footnote. Nottingham, 6.2. Oxford, 6.4. Rutland, 4.8. Salop, 2.0. Somerset, 2.6. Southampton, 12.7. Stafford, 16.7. Suffolk, 8.9. Surrey, 15.6. Sussex, 6.2. Warwick, 14.4. Westmoreland, 0.8. Wilts, 3.1. Worcester, 11.8. York, 
York, 10.9. North Wales, 8.5. South Wales, 1.7. Total for England and Wales, 10.0. End of section 113. Section 114 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 4, by Henry Mayhew, 1812 to 1887. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Appendix, Part 2. Table showing the density of the population in the different counties in England and Wales in 1851. Continued. Population, 1851. Bedford, males, 62,420. Females, 67,369. Barks, males, 99,227. Females, 99,927. Bucks, males. 70,784. Females, 72,886. Cambridge, males, 95,505. Females, 96,351. Chester, males, 206,715. Females, 216,723. Cornwall, males, 171,979. Females, 184,683. Cumberland, males, 96,106. Females, 99,381. Derby, males, 129,379. Females, 131,328. Devon, males, 271,579. Females, 300,628. Dorset, males, 85,816. Females, 91,781. Durham, males, 206,666. Females, 204,866. Essex, males, 172,161. Females, 171,755. Gloucester, males, 198,122. Females, 221,353. Hereford, males, 49,694. Females, 49,418. Hartford, males, 86,331. Females, 87,632. Hunts, males, 29,984. Females, 30,336. Kent, males, 308,115. Females, 311,092. Lancaster, males, 1,005,627. Females, 1,058,286. Leicester, males, 115,295. Females, 119,643. Lincoln, males, 201,027. Females, 199,239. Middlesex, males, 885,614. Females, 1,010,096. Monmouth, males, 92,095. Females, 85,070. Norfolk, males, 210,360. Females, 223,443. Northampton, males, 106,533. Females, 107,251. Northumberland, males, 149,158. Females, 154,377. Nottingham, males, 144,428. Females, 150,010. Oxford, males, 85,449. Females, 84,837. Rutland, males, 12,270. Females, 12,002. Salop, males, 122,022. Females, 122,997. Somerset, males, 216,716 females 
239,521. Southampton, males, 199,834. Females, 202,199. Stafford, males, 320,394. Females, 310,112. Suffolk, males, 165,267. Females, 170,724. Surrey, males, 325,155. Females, 359,650. Sussex, males, 166,828. Females, 172,600. Warwick, males, 235,263. Females, 244,716. Westmoreland, males, 29,064. Females, 29,316. Wilts, males, 118,839. Females, 122,164. Worcester, males, 126,739. Females, 132,023. York, males, 886,845. Females, 901,922. North Wales, males, 200,538. Females, 203,622. South Wales, males, 300,645. Females, 306,851. Total for England and Wales, males, 8,762,588. Females, 9,160,180. Total population, 1851. Bedford, 129,789. Barks, 199,154. Bucks, 143,670. Cambridge, 191,856. Chester, 423,438. Cornwall, 356,662. Cumberland, 195,487. Derby, 260,707. Devon, 572,207. Dorset, 177,597. Durham, 411,532. Essex, 343,916. Gloucester, 419,475. Hereford, 99,112. Hartford, 173,963. Hunts, 60,320. Kent, 619,207. Lancaster, 2,063,913. Leicester, 234,938. Lincoln, 400,266. Middlesex, 1,895,710. Monmouth, 177,165. Norfolk, 433,803. Northampton, 213,784. Northumberland, 303,535. Nottingham, 294,438. Oxford, 170,286. Rutland, 24,274. Salop, 245,019. Somerset, 456,237. Southampton, 402,033. Stafford, 630,506. Suffolk, 335,991. Surrey, 684,805. Sussex, 339,428. Warwick, 479,979. Westmoreland, 58,380. Wilts, 241,003. Worcester, 258,762. York, 1,788,767. North Wales, 404,160. South Wales, 607,496. 
Total for England and Wales, 17,922,768. Total population, 1841. Bedford, 112,378. Barks, 189,227. Bucks, 138,248. Cambridge, 169,638. Chester, 368,115. Cornwall, 343,265. Cumberland, 177,807. Derby, 239,791. Devon, 534,883. Dorset, 167,689. Durham, 325,854. Essex, 320,605. Gloucester, 395,533. Hereford, 96,515. Hartford, 162,394. Hunts, 55,565. Kent, 540,275. Lancaster, 1,696,377. Leicester, 220,263. Lincoln, 356,226. Middlesex, 1,582,538. Monmouth, 150,544. Norfolk, 404,971. Northampton, 198,518. Northumberland, 265,636. Nottingham, 270,535. Oxford, 163,216. Rutland, 23,151. Salop, 241,685. Somerset, 448,793. Southampton, 348,298. Stafford, 528,867. Suffolk, 314,467. Surrey, 586,816. Sussex, 302,081. Warwick, 408,814. Westmoreland, 56,609. Wilts, 242,772. Worcester, 230,387. York, 1,582,977. Travelling, 5,016. North Wales, 388,106. South Wales, 528,849. Total for England and Wales, 15,884,294. Increase of population per cent, 1841-51. to 51. Bedford, 16. Barks, 5. Bucks, 4. Cambridge, 13. Chester, 15. Cornwall, 4. Cumberland, 10. Derby, 9. Devon, 6. Dorset, 6. Durham, 26. Essex, 7. Gloucester, 6. Hereford, 3. Hartford, 7. Hunts, 9. Kent, 14. Lancaster, 22. Leicester, 7. Lincoln, 12. Monmouth, 20. Middlesex, 17. Norfolk, 7. Northampton, 7. Northumberland, 13. Nottingham, 9. Oxford, 4. Rutland, 5. Salop, 1. Somerset, 2. Southampton, 13. Stafford, 20. Suffolk, 7. Surrey, 17. Sussex, 12. Warwick, 18. Westmoreland, 3. Wilts, 0 0.7. Worcester, 13. York, 13. North Wales, 4. South Wales, 14. Total for England and Wales, 13. Density. Number of persons to each 100 acres. Bedford, 43.5. Barks, 41.7. Bucks, 31.3. Cambridge, 35.8. Chester, 65.2. Cornwall, 41.7. Cumberland, 20.0. Derby, 40.0. Devon, 34.5. Dorset, 
28.6 Durham 62.5 Essex 34.5 Gloucester 53.0 Hereford 18.2 Hartford 43.5 Hunts 25.0 Kent 63.6 Lancaster 200.0 Leicester 45.4 Lincoln 23.8 Middlesex 1059.0 Monmouth 55.5 Norfolk 33.3 Northampton 33.3 Northumberland 25.6 Nottingham 55.5 Oxford 37.0 Rutland 25.0 Salop 28.6 Somerset 43.5 Southampton 38.4 Stafford 83.3 Suffolk 37.0 Surrey 144.0 Sussex, 37.0. Warwick, 83.3. Westmoreland, 12.0. Wilts, 27.7. Worcester, 55.5. York, 48.7. North Wales, 19. Point. Reader's note. The digit after the point is illegible on this page, but the same information given in the next table shows a value of 19.6. End reader's note. South Wales, 22.2. Total for England and Wales, 49.7. Number of acres to each person. Bedford, 2.3. Barks, 2.4. Bucks, 3.2. Cambridge, 2.8. Chester, 1.5. Cornwall, 2.4. Cumberland, 5.0. Derby, 2.5. Devon, 2.9. Dorset, 3.5. Durham, 1.6. Essex, 2.9. Gloucester, 1.9. Hereford, 5.5. Hartford, 2.3. Hunts, 4.0. Kent, 1.6. Lancaster, 0.5. Leicester, 2.2. Lincoln, 4.2. Middlesex, 0 0.09. Monmouth, 1.8. Norfolk, 3.0. Northampton, 3.0. Northumberland, 3.9. Nottingham, 1.8. Oxford, 2.7. Rutland, 4.0 Salop 3.5 Somerset 2.3 Southampton 2.6 Stafford 1.2 Suffolk 2.7 Surrey 0.7 Sussex 2.7 Warwick 1.2 Westmoreland 8.3 Wilts 3.6 Worcester 1.8 York 2.5 North Wales 5.1 South Wales 4.5 Total for England and Wales 2.0 Number of acres to each house. Bedford, 11.2. Barks, 11.5. Bucks, 15.2. Cambridge, 13.1. Chester, 7.6. Cornwall, 11.6. Cumberland, 25.1. Derby, 11.9. Devon, 15.4. Dorset, 17.1. Durham, 9.3. Essex, 13.5. Gloucester, 9.4. Hereford, 25.3 Hartford 11.3 Hunts 18.3 Kent 8.4 Lancaster 2.9 Leicester 9.9 .9. Lincoln 19.9 .9. Middlesex 0.7 Monmouth 9.3 Norfolk 13.6 Northampton 14.1 Northumberland 23.3 Nottingham 8.6 Oxford 12.8 Rutland 19.0 Salop, 16.9. Somerset, 11.0. Southampton, 12.9. Stafford, 5.8. Suffolk, 12.5. Surrey, 4.0. Sussex, 14.6. Warwick, 0.54. Westmoreland, 40.9. Wilts, 16.8. Worcester, 8.5. York, 9.7. North Wales, 23.2. South Wales, 21.5. Total for England and Wales. 10.5. Number of persons to each inhabited house. Bedford, 5.1. Barks, 5.0. Bucks, 4.9. Cambridge, 4.9. Chester, 5.3. Cornwall, 5.2. Cumberland, 5.3. Derby, 5.0. Devon, 5.7. Dorset, 5.1. Durham, 5.9. Essex, 5.0. Gloucester, 5.3. Hereford, 4.8. Hartford, 5.1.
Hunts, 4.8. Kent, 5.7. Lancaster, 5.8. Leicester, 4.7. Lincoln, 5.0. Middlesex, 7.9. Monmouth, 5.4. Norfolk, 4.8. Northampton, 4.9. Northumberland, 6.3. Nottingham, 5.0. Oxford, 4.9. Rutland, 4.9. Salop, 5.0. Somerset, 5.2. Southampton, 5.3. Stafford, 5.2. Suffolk, 4.8. Surrey, 6.3. Sussex, 5.7. Warwick, 4.9. Westmoreland, 5.2. Wilts, 4.9. Worcester, 5.0. York, 4.9. North Wales, 4.9. South Wales, 5.1. Total for England and Wales, 5.5. List of counties in the order of the density of their population, as shown by the number of persons to every 100 acres. Counties above the average. Middlesex, 1,059.0. Lancaster, 200.0. Surrey, 144.0. Stafford, 83.3. York, West Riding. 83.3, Chester 65.2, Kent 63.6, Durham 62.5, Worcester 55.5, Warwick 83.3, Nottingham 55.5, Monmouth 55.5, Gloucester 53.0. Average for England and Wales 49.7. Counties below the average, Leicester 45.4, Bedford 43.5, Hartford 43.5, Somerset 43.5, Barks 41.7, Cornwall 41.7, Derby 40.0, Southampton 38.4, Oxford 37.0, Suffolk 37.0, Sussex 37.0, Cambridge 35.8, Devon 34.5, Essex 34.5, Norfolk 33.3, Northampton 33.3, York East Riding, 33.3, Bucks, 31.3, Dorset, 28.6, Shropshire, 28.6, Wilts, 27.7, Northumberland, 25.6, Huntingdon, 25.0, Rutland, 25.0, Lincoln, 23.8, South Wales, 22.2, Cumberland, 20.0, North Wales, 19.6, Hereford, 18.2, York North Riding, 15.2. Westmoreland, 12.0. Comparison of the density of the population in 1841 and 1851. Agricultural counties. Lincoln, 1841, 21.7. 1851, 23.8. Rutland, 1841, 22.7. 1851, 25.0. Huntingdon, 1841 25.0, 1851 25.0, Cambridge 1841 30.3, 1851 35.8, Essex 1841 35.7, 1851 34.5, Sussex 1841 32.2, 1851 37.0, Hereford 1841 20.8, 1851 18.2. Agricultural and sub-manufacturing counties. Westmoreland, 1841, 11.6, 1851, 12.0. Norfolk, 1841, 32.2, 1851, 33.3. Suffolk, 1841, 33.3, 1851, 37.0. Hartford, 1841, 40.0, 1851, 43.5. Bedford, 1841, 37.0, 1851, 43.5. Buckingham, 1841, 33.3, 1851, 31.3. Northampton, 1841, 31.2, 1851, 33.3. Oxford, 1841, 34.4, 1851, 37.0. Barks, 1841, 34.4, 1851, 41.7. Hants, 1841, 47.6, 1851, 38.4. Wilts, 1841, 30.3, 1851, 27.7. Dorset, 1841, 27.7, 1851, 28.6. Somerset, 
1841, 41.6, 1851, 43.5. Devon, 1841, 32.2, 1851, 34.5. Sub agricultural and sub manufacturing county Gloucester 1841 55 point five eighteen fifty one twenty six point one manufacturing counties Lancaster eighteen forty one one hundred and sixty six point six eighteen fifty one two hundred point zero Yorkshire eighteen forty one forty two point six eighteen fifty one forty eight point seven Chester eighteen forty one fifty eight point eight eighteen fifty one sixty five point two Nottingham eighteen forty one forty seven point six eighteen fifty one fifty five point five Leicester eighteen forty one forty three point zero eighteen fifty one forty five point four Warwick eighteen forty one seventy one point four eighteen fifty one eighty three point three Worcester eighteen forty one fifty two point six eighteen fifty one fifty five point five Mining counties Durham, 1841, 47.6, 1851, 62.5. Cornwall, 1841, 41.6, 1851, 41.7. Manufacturing and sub-mining counties. Derby, 1841, 41.6, 1851, 40.0. Stafford, 1841, 71.4, 1851, 83.3. Agricultural and sub mining counties Shropshire eighteen forty one twenty eight point five eighteen fifty one twenty eight point six North Wales eighteen forty one nineteen point three eighteen fifty one nineteen point six South Wales eighteen forty one nineteen point zero eighteen fifty one twenty two point two Sub agricultural and sub mining counties Northumberland eighteen forty one twenty one point two eighteen fifty one twenty five point six Cumberland eighteen forty one eighteen point five eighteen fifty one twenty point zero Monmouth eighteen forty one forty three point zero eighteen fifty one fifty five point five Metropolitan County Middlesex eighteen forty one one thousand point zero eighteen fifty one one thousand and fifty nine point zero Sub Metropolitan Counties Surrey eighteen forty one one hundred and twenty five point zero eighteen fifty one one hundred and forty four point zero Kent eighteen forty one fifty five point five eighteen fifty one sixty three point six Note an agricultural county has more than ten per cent and a sub agricultural county less than ten per cent of its population employed in agriculture. A manufacturing county as more than 15% and a sub-manufacturing county less than 15% of its population employed in manufacture. A mining county as more than 5% and a sub-mining county less than 5% of its population employed in mining. End of section 114《Of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 4, by Henry Mayhew, 1812-1887. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Appendix, Part 3. Map showing the number of the criminal offenders to every 10,000 of the population, or the intensity of the criminality in each county of England and Wales. Note, the counties printed black are those in which the number of criminals is above the average. The counties left white are those in which the number of criminals is below the average. The average has been calculated from the returns for the last 10 years. Reader's note. The information given in the map is also included in the following table. End reader's note. Table showing the criminality of the different counties in England and Wales in the undermentioned years. Average population from 1841 to 50. Bedford, 121,083. Barks, 194,763. Bucks, 140,959. Cambridge, 180,747. Chester, 395,919. Cornwall, 349,991. Cumberland, 186,762. 
Derby, 250,249. Devon, 554,738. Dorset, 172,736. Durham, 368,787. Essex, 332,363. Gloucester, 407,504. Hereford, 97,813. Hartford, 168,178. Hunts, 57,942. Kent, 585,249. Lancaster, 1,881,261. Leicester, 227,621 Lincoln 378,246 Middlesex 1,740,814 Monmouth 164,093 Norfolk 419,463 Northampton 206,496 Northumberland 284,777 Nottingham 282,584 Oxford 166,751 Rutland 23,711 Salop 243,352 Somerset 452,515 Southampton 377,040 Stafford 579,686 Suffolk 325,336 Surrey 635,917 Sussex 320,944 Warwick 444,558 Westmoreland 57,494 Wilts 241,887 Worcester 244,574 York 1,686,461 North Wales 396,161 South Wales 568,430 Total for England and Wales 16,918,458 Total number of persons committed for trial or bailed Bedford 1841 191 1842 229 1843, 202, 1844, 188, 1845, 155, 1846, 185, 1847, 178, 1848, 204, 1849, 162, 1850, 161. Barks, 1841, 306, 1842, 333, 1843, 328, 1844, 287, 1845, 260, 1846, 250, 1847, 335, 1848, 360, 1849, 358, 1850, 318, Bucks, 1841, 287, 1842, 277, 1843, 313, 1844, 280, 1845, 286, 1846, 283, 1847, 315, 1848, 310, 1849, 287, 1850, 242, Cambridge, 1841, 240, 1842, 241, 1843, 257, 1844, 297, 1845, 239, 1846, 276, 1847, 255, 1848, 244, 1849, 309, 1850, 302, Chester, 1841, 943, 1842, 1086, 1843, 1018, 1844, 777, 1845, 688, 1846, 767, 1847, 871, 1848, 1070, 1849, 861, 
1850, 900. Cornwall, 1841, 295. 1842, 282. 1843, 301. 1844, 269. 1845, 272. 1846, 280. 1847, 341. 1848, 272. 1849, 277. 1850, 226. Cumberland, 1841, 151. 1842, 115. 1843, 109. 1844, 138. 1845, 118. 1846, 147. 1847, 120. 1848, 130. 1849, 159. 1850, 146. Derby, 1841, 277, 1842, 322, 1843, 322, 1844, 279, 1845, 186, 1846, 277, 1847, 214, 1848, 264, 1849, 245, 1850, 255. Devon, 1841, 687, 1842, 716, 1843, 740, 1844, 715, 1845, 720, 1846, 721, 1847, 949, 1848, 924, 1849, 893, 1850, 807. Dorset, 1841, 284, 1842, 241, 1843, 252, 1844, 203, 1845, 218, 1846, 225, 1847, 307, 1848, 287, 1849, 326, 1850, 190. Durham, 1841, 215, 1842, 266, 1843, 300, 1844, 376, 1845, 203, 1846, 249, 1847, 279, 1848, 334, 1849, 321, 1850, 358. Essex, 1841, 647, 1842, 758, 1843, 710, 1844, 596, 1845, 554, 1846, 602, 1847, 603, 1848, 689, 1849, 587, 1850, 631. Gloucester, 1841, 1236, 1842, 1252, 1843, 1186, 1844, 1071, 1845, 929, 1846, 884, 1847, 1092, 1848, 1042, 1849, 1063, 1850, 920. Hereford, 1841, 245, 1842, 259, 1843, 238, 1844, 230, 1845, 226, 1846, 158, 1847, 212, 1848, 270, 1849, 242, 1850, 252. Hartford, 1841, 319, 1842, 338, 1843, 265, 1844, 271, 1845, 244, 1846, 243, 1847, 291, 1848, 348, 1849, 318, 1850, 315. Hunts, 1841, 62, 1842, 68, 1843, 68, 1844, 79, 1845, 88, 
1846, 81, 1847, 89, 1848, 104, 1849, 93, 1850, 90. Kent, 1841, 962, 1842, 1,155, 1843, 977, 1844, 911, 1845, 831, 1846, 815, 1847, 889, 1848, 1020, 1849, 980, 1850, 958. Lancaster, 1841, 3,987, 1842, 4,497, 1843, 3,677, 1844, 2,893, 1845, 2,852, 1846, 3,072, 1847, 3,456, 1848, 3,778, 1849, 3,290, 1850, 3,340. Leicester, 1841, 466, 1842, 492, 1843, 509, 1844, 481, 1845, 328, 1846, 358, 1847, 335, 1848, 346, 1849, 299, 1850, 300. Lincoln, 1841, 349, 1842, 507, 1843, 563, 1844, 542, 1845, 389, 1846, 419, 1847, 506, 1848, 504, 1849, 529, 1850, 528. Middlesex, 1841, 3586, 1842, 4094, 1843, 4260, 1844, 4027, 1845, 4440, 1846, 4641, 1847, 5175, 1848, 4856, 1849, 3861, 1850, 3732. Monmouth, 1841, 364, 1842, 264, 1843, 261, 1844, 278, 1845, 196, 1846, 217, 1847, 282, 1848, 298, 1849, 370, 1850, 433. Norfolk, 1841, 666, 1842, 808, 1843, 782, 1844, 788, 1845, 642, 1846, 720, 1847, 751, 1848, 689, 1849, 633, 1850, 705. Northampton, 1841, 342, 1842, 346, 1843, 270, 1844, 294, 1845, 302, 1846, 270, 1847, 243, 1848, 307, 1849, 327, 1850, 248. Northumberland, 1841, 226, 1842, 245, 1843, 290, 1844, 294, 1845, 189, 1846, 169, 1847, 189, 1848, 201, 1849, 261, 1850, 283. Nottingham, 1841, 329, 1842, 374, 1843, 353, 1844, 348, 1845, 267, 1846, 286, 1847, 343, 
364, 1849, 341, 1850, 325. Oxford, 1841, 323, 1842, 334, 1843, 328, 1844, 296, 1845, 309, 1846, 228, 1847, 299, 1848, 296, 1849, 303, 1850, 252. Rutland, 1841, 14, 1842, 48, 1843, 39, 1844, 23, 1845, 28, 1846, 26, 1847, 41, 1848, 52, 1849, 35, 1850, 27. Salop, 1841, 416, 1842, 470, 1843, 534, 1844, 449, 1845, 308, 1846, 227, 1847, 267, 1848, 305, 1849, 347, 1850, 307. Somerset, 1841, 991, 1842, 1148, 1843, 967, 1844, 1039, 1845, 873, 1846, 701, 1847, 774, 1848, 888, 1849, 885, 1850, 754. Southampton, 1841, 677, 1842, 702, 1843, 676, 1844, 517, 1845, 619, 1846, 608, 1847, 737, 1848, 728, 1849, 751, 1850, 686. Stafford, 1841, 1059, 1842, 1485, 1843, 1175, 1844, 885, 1845, 717, 1846, 851, 1847, 1028, 1848, 1120, 1849, 1009, 1850, 1053. Suffolk, 1841, 482, 1842, 527, 1843, 585, 1844, 630, 1845, 407, 1846, 471, 1847, 505, 1848, 495, 1849, 537, 1850, 472. Surrey, 1841, 923, 1842, 1017, 1843, 867, 1844, 941, 1845, 942, 1846, 958, 1847, 1315, 1848, 1296, 1849, 1109, 1850, 1030. Sussex, 1841, 539, 1842, 550, 1843, 493, 1844, 409, 1845, 409, 1846, 468, 1847, 522, 1848, 546, 1849, 502, 1850, 480. Warwick, 1841, 1046, 1842, 1003, 1843, 1045, 1844, 894, 1845, 769, 1846, 799, 1847, 998, 1848, 1257, 1849, 910, 1850, 880. Westmoreland, 1841, 33, 1842, 39, 1843, 44, 
1844, 24, 1845, 46, 1846, 74, 1847, 33, 1848, 47, 1849, 57, 1850, 70. Wilts, 1841, 506, 1842, 548, 1843, 464, 1844, 432, 1845, 379, 1846, 436, 1847, 502, 1848, 465, 1849, 452, 1850, 386. Worcester, 1841, 566, 1842, 609, 1843, 679, 1844, 603, 1845, 563, 1846, 535, 1847, 620, 1848, 681, 1849, 653, 1850, 607. York, 1841, 1895, 1842, 2598, 1843, 2304, 1844, 1691, 1845, 1417, 1846, 1560, 1847, 1794, 1848, 2036, 1849, 2022, 1850, 1915. North Wales, 1841, 251, 1842, 279, 1843, 294, 1844, 283, 1845, 269, 1846, 220, 1847, 307, 1848, 332, 1849, 338, 1850, 316. South Wales, 1841, 377, 1842, 387, 1843, 546, 1844, 514, 1845, 426, 1846, 350, 1847, 471, 1848, 590, 1849, 514, 1850, 613. Total for England and Wales. 1841, 27,760. 1842, 31,309. 1843, 29,591. 1844, 26,542. 1845, 24,303. 1846, 25,107. 1847, 28,833. 1848, 30,349. 1849, 27,816. 1850, 26,813. Total for 10 years. Bedford, 1,855. Barks, 3,135. Lux, 2,880. Cambridge, 2,660. Chester, 8,981. Cornwall, 2,815. Cumberland, 1,333. Derby, 2,641. Devon, 7,872. Dorset, 2,533. Durham, 2,901. Essex, 6,377. Gloucester, 10,675. Hereford, 2,332. Hartford, 2,952. Hunts, 822. Kent, 9,598. Lancaster, 34,842. Leicester, 3,914. Lincoln, 4,836. Middlesex, 42,672. Monmouth, 2,963. Norfolk, 7,184. Northampton, 2,949. Northumberland, 2,347. Nottingham, 3,330. Oxford, 2,968. Rutland, 333. Salop, 3,630. Somerset, 9,020. Southampton, 6,701.
Stafford, 10,382. Suffolk, 5,111. Surrey, 10,398. Sussex, 4,918. Warwick, 9,601. Westmoreland, 467. Wilts, 4,570. Worcester, 6,116. York, 19,232. North Wales, 2,889. South Wales, 4,788. Total for England and Wales, 278,423. Average per year, Bedford, 185. Barks, 313. Lux, 288. Cambridge, 266. Chester, 898. Cornwall, 281. Cumberland, 133. Derby, 264. Devon, 787. Dorset, 253. Durham, 290. Essex, 638. Gloucester, 1067. Hereford, 233. Hartford, 295. Hunts, 82. Kent, 960. Lancaster, 3,484. Leicester, 391. Lincoln, 484. Middlesex, 4,267. Monmouth, 296. Norfolk, 718. Northampton, 295. Northumberland, 235. Nottingham, 333. Oxford, 297. Rutland, 33. Salop, 363. Somerset, 902. Southampton, 670. Stafford, 1,038. Suffolk, 511. Surrey, 1,040. Sussex, 492. Warwick, 960. Westmoreland, 47. Wilts, 457. Worcester, 612. York, 1,923. North Wales, 289. South Wales, 479. Total for England and Wales, 27,842. Proportion to the population. Bedford, 1 in 654. Barks, 1 in 622. Lux, 1 in 489. Cambridge, 1 in 679. Chester, 1 in 440. Cornwall, 1 in 1,245. Cumberland, 1 in 1,404. Derby, 1 in 947. Devon, 1 in 704. Dorset, 1 in 682. Durham, 1 in 1,271. Essex, 1 in 520. Gloucester, 1 in 381. Hereford, 1 in 419. Hartford, 1 in 570. Hunts, 1 in 706. Kent, 1 in 609. Lancaster, 1 in 539. Leicester, 1 in 582. Lincoln, 1 in 781. Middlesex, 1 in 407. Monmouth, 1 in 554. Norfolk, 1 in 584. Northampton, 1 in 699. Northumberland, 1 in 1211. Nottingham, 1 in 848. Oxford, 1 in 591. Rutland, 1 in 718. Salop, 1 in 670. Somerset, 1 in 501. Southampton, 1 in 562. Stafford, 1 in 558. Suffolk, 1 in 636. Surrey, 1 in 611. Sussex, 1 in 652. Warwick, 1 in 463. Westmoreland, 1 in 1,223. Wilts, 1 in 529. Worcester, 1 in 399. York, 1 in 876. North Wales, 1 in 1,370. South Wales, 1 in 1,186. Total for England and Wales, 1 in 607. Number of criminals to every 10,000 of population. Bedford, 15.2. Barks, 16.0. Lux, 20.4. Cambridge, 14.7. Chester, 22.6. Cornwall, 8.0. Cumberland, 7.1. Derby, 10.5. Devon, 14.1. Dorset, 
14.6 Durham 7.8 Essex 19.1 Gloucester 26.1 Hereford 23.8 Hartford 17.5 Hunts 14.1 Kent 16.4 Lancaster 18.5 Leicester 17.1 Lincoln 12.8 Middlesex 24.5 Monmouth 18.0 Norfolk 17.1 Northampton 14.2 Northumberland 8.2 Nottingham 11.8 Oxford 17.8 Rutland 13.9 Salop 14.9 Somerset 19.9 Southampton 17.7 Stafford 17.9 Suffolk 15.7 Surrey 16.3 Sussex 15.3 Warwick 21.6 Westmoreland 8.1, Wilts 18.9, Worcester 25.0, York 11.4, North Wales 7.2, South Wales 8.4, total for England and Wales 16.4. End of section 115. Section 116 of London Labour and the London Poor. Volume 4 by Henry Mayhew, 1812 to 1887. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Appendix, Part 4. List of counties in the order of their criminality, as shown by the number of criminals to every 10,000 of the population. Counties above the average in crime. Gloucester, 26.1. Worcester, 25.0. Middlesex, 24.5. Hereford, 23.8, Chester, 22.6, Warwick, 21.6, Bucks, 20.4, Somerset, 19.9, Essex, 19.1, Wilts, 18.9, Lancaster, 18.5, Monmouth, 18.0, Stafford, 17.9, Oxford, 17.8, Southampton, 17.7, Hartford, 17.5, Leicester, 17.1. Norfolk, 17.1. Average for all England and Wales, 16.4. Counties below the average in crime. Kent, 16.4. Surrey, 16.3. Barks, 16.0. Suffolk, 15.7. Sussex, 15.3. Bedford, 15.2. Salop, 14.9. Cambridge, 14.7. Dorset, 14.6. Northampton, 14.2. Devon 14.1, Rutland 13.9, Lincoln 12.8, Nottingham 11.8, York 11.4, Derby 10.5, South Wales 8.4, Northumberland 8.2, Westmoreland 8.1, Cornwall 8.0, Durham 7.8, North Wales 7.2, Cumberland 7.1. The Years of Crime 1811 Number of Criminal Offenders 5,337. Population, 10,150,615. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 5.2. 1812. Number of criminal offenders, 6,576. Population, 10,332,441. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 6.3. 1813. Number of criminal offenders, 7,164. Population, 10,515,267. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 6.8. 1814. Number of criminal offenders, 6,390. Population, 10,689,093. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 5.9. 1815. Number of criminal offenders, 7,818. Population, 10,881,919. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 7.3. 1816. Number of criminal offenders, 9,091. Population, 11,064,745. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 8.2. 1817. Number of criminal offenders, 13,932. Population, 11,247,571. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 11.5. 1818. 
1818. Number of criminal offenders, 13,567. Population, 11,430,397. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 11.8. 1819. Number of criminal offenders, 14,254. Population, 11,613,223. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 12.2. 1820. Number of criminal offenders, 13,710. Population, 11,796,049. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 11.6. Total number of criminal offenders for 10 years, 97,839. Total population for 10 years, 109,630,320. Average number of criminal offenders for 10 years, 9,783. Average population for 10 years, 10,963,032. Average number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 8.9. 1821. Number of criminal offenders, 13,115. Population, 11,978,875. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 10.9. 1822. Number of criminal offenders, 12,241. Population, 12,170,706. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 10.0. Number of criminal offenders, 1823, 12,263. Population, 12,362,537. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 9.9. 1824. Number of criminal offenders, 13,698. Population, 12,554,368. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 10.9. 1825. Number of criminal offenders, 14,437. Population, 12,746,199. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 11.3. 1826. Number of criminal offenders, 16,164. Population, 12,938,030. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 12.5. 1827. Number of criminal offenders, 17,924. Population, 13,129,861. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 13.6. 1828. Number of criminal offenders, 16,564. Population, 13,321,692. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 12.4. 1829. Number of criminal offenders, 18,675. Population, 13,531,523. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 13.8. 1830. Number of criminal offenders, 18,107. Population, 13,705,354. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 13.2. Total number of criminal offenders for 10 years, 153,188. Total population for 10 years, 128,421,145. Average number of criminal offenders for 10 years, 15,318. Average population for 10 years, 12,842,114. Average number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 11.9. 1831. Number of criminal offenders, 19,647. Population, 13,897,187. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 14.1. 1832. Number of criminal offenders, 20,829. Population, 14,098,142. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 14.7. 1833. Number of criminal offenders, 20,072. Population, 14,299,097. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 14.7.
1834. Number of criminal offenders, 22,451. Population, 14,500,052. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 15.4. 1835. Number of criminal offenders, 20,731. Population, 14,701,007. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 14.1. 1836. Number of criminal offenders, 20,984. Population, 14,901,962. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 14.1. 1837. Number of criminal offenders, 23,612. Population, 15,102,917. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 15.6. 1838. Number of criminal offenders, 23,094. Population, 15,303,872. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 15.1. 1839. Number of criminal offenders, 24,443. Population, 15,504,827. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 15.7. 1840. Number of criminal offenders, 27,187. Population, 15,705,782. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 17.3. Total number of criminal offenders for 10 years, 223,050. Total population for 10 years, 148,114,825. Average number of criminal offenders for 10 years, 22,305. Average population for 10 years, 14,811,482. Average number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 15.0. 1841. Number of criminal offenders, 27,750. Population, 15,914,148. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 17.4. 1842. Number of criminal offenders, 31,309. Population, 16,115,010. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 19.4. 1843. Number of criminal offenders, 29,591. Population, 16,315,872. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 18.1. 1844. Number of criminal offenders, 26,542. Population, 16,516,734. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 16.0. 1845. Number of criminal offenders, 24,303. Population, 16,717,596. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 14.5. 1846. Number of criminal offenders, 25,107. Population, 16,918,458. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 14.9. 1847. Number of criminal offenders, 28,833. Population, 17,119,320. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 16.8. 1848. Number of criminal offenders, 30,349. Population, 17,320,182. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 17.5. 1849. Number of criminal offenders, 27,816. Population, 17,521,044. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 15.9. 1850. Number of criminal offenders, 26,813. Population, 17,721,906. Number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 15.1. Total number of criminal offenders for 10 years, 
278,413. Total population for 10 years, 168,180,270. Average number of criminal offenders for 10 years, 27,841. Average population for 10 years, 16,818,027. Average number of criminals to every 10,000 people, 16.5. End of section 116. Section 117 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 4, by Henry Mayhew, 1812 to 1887. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Appendix, Part 5. Map showing the number who signed the marriage register with marks in every 100 persons married, or the intensity of ignorance in each county of England and Wales. Note the counties printed black are those in which the number who signed the marriage register with marks is above the average. The counties left white are those in which the number who signed the marriage register with marks is below the average. The average has been calculated for the 10 years from 1839 to 1848. Reader's note. The information given in the map is also given in the following table. End reader's note. Table showing the ignorance of the different counties in England and Wales, deduced from the number who signed the marriage register with marks in the undermentioned years. Average annual number of persons married, 1839 to 48. Bedford, 1,850. Barks, 2,588. Bucks, 1,920. Cambridge, 2,784. Chester, 5,160. Cornwall, 4,894. Cumberland, 2,072. Derby, 3,652. Devon, 8,678. Dorset, 2,358. Durham, 5,770. Essex, 4,228. Gloucester, 6,918. Hereford, 1,268. Hartford, 1,976. Hunts, 904. Kent, 8,094. Lancaster, 34,068. Leicester, 3,460. Lincoln, 5,530. Middlesex, 31,590. Monmouth, 2,562. Norfolk, 6,042. Northampton, 3,194. Northumberland, 4,094. Nottingham, 4,168. Oxford, 2,316. Rutland, 216. Salop, 3,180. Somerset, 6,226. Southampton, 5,768. Stafford, 8,292. Suffolk, 4,738. Surrey, 10,374. Sussex, 4,268. Warwick, 6,494. Westmoreland, 780. Wilts, 3,236. Worcester, 5,536. York, 26,664. North Wales, 5,164. South Wales, 8,152. Total for England and Wales, 261,340. Number of males and females who signed the marriage register with marks. Bedford, 1839, 1,112, 1840, 1,148, 1841, 956, 1842, 921, 1843, 1,028, 1844, 1,110, 1845, 1,095, 1846, 1,124, 1847, 957, 1848, 1003. Total for 10 years, 10,454. Annual average, 1,045. Parks, 1839, 1,036. 1840, 1,131. 1841, 1,061. 1842, 1,063. 1843, 1,111. 1844, 1,079. 1845, 1,070. 1846, 1,137. 1847, 1,118. 1848, 1,164. 
total for 10 years, 10,970. Annual average, 1,097. Bucks. 1839, 979. 1840, 1008. 1841, 820. 1842, 918. 1843, 882. 1844, 918. 1845, 975. 1846, 1074. 1847, 906. 1848, 999. Total for 10 years, 9,479. Annual average, 948. Cambridge, 1839, 1,269. 1840, 1,372. 1841, 1,495. 1842, 1,389. 1843, 1,281. 1844, 1,330. 1845, 1,471. 1846, 1,398. 1847, 1,213. 1848, 1,328. Total for 10 years, 13,546. Annual average, 1,355. Chester, 1839, 2,343. 1840, 2,510. 1841, 2,350. 1842, 2,096. 1843, 2,366. 1844, 2,403. 1845, 2,777. 1846, 2,608. 1847, 2,121. 1848, 2,503. Total for 10 years, 24,017. Annual average, 2,408. Cornwall. 1839, 2,150. 1840, 2,148. 1841, 2,128. 1842, 2,312. 1843, 2,284. 1844, 2,141. 1845, 2,338. 1846, 2,407. 1847, 2,102. 1848, 2,146. Total for 10 years, 22,156. Annual average, 2,216. Cumberland, 1839, 470. 1840, 563. 1841, 527. 1842, 539. 1843, 506. 1844, 500. 1845, 581. 1846, 647. 1847, 520. 1848, 350. Total for 10 years, 5,203. Annual average, 520. Derby. 1839, 1,521. 1840, 1,490. 1841, 1,321. 1842, 1,061. 1843, 1,351. 1844, 1,455. 1845, 1,642. 1846, 1,544. 1847, 1,382. 1848, 1,377. Total for 10 years, 14,144. Annual average, 1,414. Devon, 1839, 2,603. 1840, 1,817. 1841, 2,744. 1842, 2,971. 1843, 2,995. 1844, 3,055. 1845, 3,312. 1846, 3,224. 1847, 2,782. 1848, 1,981. Total for 10 years, 27,484. Annual average, 2,748. Dorset. 1839, 725. 1840, 930. 1841, 785. 1842, 852. 1843, 449. 1844, 945. 1845, 1033. 1846, 905. 1847, 941. 1848, 923. Total for 10 years, 8,488. Annual average, 849. Durham, 1839, 1900. 1840, 2083. 1841, 2001. 1842, 1830. 
1843, 1771, 1844, 1825, 1845, 2375, 1846, 2378, 1847, 2376, 1848, 2327. Total for 10 years, 20,866. Annual average, 2,087. Essex, 1839, 1,964. 1840, 2,215. 1841, 2,103. 1842, 2,062. 1843, 2,110. 1844, 2,157. 1845, 2,246. 1846, 2,163. 1847, 1,977. 1848, 1,963. Total for 10 years, 20,960. Annual average, 2,096. Gloucester, 1839, 2,329. 1840, 2,541. 1841, 2,347. 1842, 2,197. 1843, 2,393. 1844, 2,277. 1845, 2,578. 1846, 2,698. 1847, 2,215. 1848, 2,304. Total for 10 years, 23,879. Annual average, 2,388. Hereford, 1839, 462, 1840, 463, 1841, 522, 1842, 548, 1843, 609, 1844, 516, 1845, 598, 1846, 576, 1847, 424, 1848, 488. Total for 10 years, 5,206. Annual average, 521. Hartford, 1839, 1189, 1840, 1045, 1841, 1057, 1842, 954, 1843, 1083, 1844, 1038, 1845, 1153, 1846, 1102, 1847, 947, 1848, 1013. Total for 10 years, 10,581. Annual average, 1,058. Hunts, 1839, 391. 1840, 465. 1841, 453. 1842, 446. 1843, 439. 1844, 413. 1845, 434. 1846, 466, 1847, 438, 1848, 440. Total for 10 years, 4,385. Annual average, 439. Kent, 1839, 2,431. 1840, 2,382. 1841, 2,476. 1842, 2,488. 1843, 2,556, 1844, 2,502, 1845, 2,944, 1846, 2,855, 1847, 2,569, 1848, 2,481, total for 10 years, 25,684, annual average, 2,568. Lancaster, 1839, 16,411. 1840, 15,793. 1841, 16,096. 1842, 14,626. 1843, 17,820. 1844, 19,850. 1845, 22,177. 1846, 20,709. 1847, 16,588. 1848, 18,161. Total for 10 years, 178,231. Annual average, 17,823. Leicester, 1839, 1,494. 1840, 1,504. 1841, 1,281. 1842, 1,189. 1843, 1,416. 1844, 1,505. 1845, 1518, 1846, 1579, 
1847, 1329, 1848, 1441, total for 10 years, 14,256, annual average, 1,426. Lincoln, 1839, 1,944, 1840, 2,209, 1841, 2,174, 1842, 2,082, 1843, 1,959, 1844, 1,998, 1845, 2,232, 1846, 2,166, 1847, 2,159, 1848, 2,436, total for 10 years, 21,359, annual average, 2,136. Middlesex, 1839, 5,134, 1840, 5,569, 1841, 5,242, 1842, 5,045, 1843, 5,416, 1844, 6,141, 1845, 6,456, 1846, 6,163, 1847, 5,666, 1848, 5,433, total for 10 years, 56,265, annual average, 5,627. Monmouth, 1839, 1,646, 1840, 1,697, 1841, 1,283, 1842, 1,091, 1843, 1,110, 1844, 1,228, 1845, 1,722, 1846, 1,982, 1847, 1,720, 1848, 1,574, total for 10 years, 15,053, annual average, 1,505. Norfolk, 1839, 2,485, 1840, 2,772, 1841, 2,514, 1842, 2,832, 1843, 2,816, 1844, 2,901, 1845, 3,120, 1846, 2,964, 1847, 2,783, 1848, 2,855, total for 10 years, 28,042, annual average, 2,804. Northampton, 1839, 1,338, 1840, 1,489, 1841, 1,377, 1842, 1,220, 1843, 1,404, 1844, 1,441, 1845, 1,504, 1846, 1,467, 1847, 1,253, 1848, 1,332, Total for 10 years, 13,825. Annual average, 1,383. Northumberland, 1839, 1,149. 1840, 1,264. 1841, 1,108. 1842, 965. 1843, 1,013. 1844, 811. 1845, 1,214. 1846, 1,244. 1847, 1,190, 1848, 1,328, total for 10 years, 11,286, annual average, 1,129. Nottingham, 1839, 1,715, 1840, 1,724, 1841, 1,645, 1842, 1,642, 1843, 1,742, 1844, 1,953, 1845, 2,000, 1846, 1,834, 1847, 1,635, 1848, 1,760, total for 10 years, 17,650. Annual average, 1,765. Oxford, 1839, 826, 1840, 961, 1841, 951, 1842, 957, 1843, 929, 1844, 889, 1845, 831, 1846, 880, 1847, 869, 1848, 843, total for 10 years, 8,936, annual average, 894. Rutland, 1839, 115, 
1840, 92, 1841, 125, 1842, 99, 1843, 97, 1844, 69, 1845, 73, 1846, 99, 1847, 152, 1848, 118, total for 10 years, 1039, annual average, 104. Salop, 1839, 1647, 1840, 1568, 1841, 1497, 1842, 1533, 1843, 1392, 1844, 1496, 1845, 1428, 1846, 1544, 1847, 1532, 1848, 1661, total for 10 years, 15,298, annual average, 1,530. Somerset, 1839, 2,300, 1840, 2,608, 1841, 2,705, 1842, 2,643, 1843, 2,654, 1844, 2,643, 1845, 2,598, 1846, 2,632, 1847, 2,183, 1848, 2,360, total for 10 years, 25,326, annual average, 2,533. Southampton, 1839, 1,614, 1840, 1,801, 1841, 2,049, 1842, 1,959, 1843, 1910, 1844, 1977, 1845, 2,181, 1846, 2,185, 1847, 2019, 1848, 1,875, total for 10 years, 19,570, annual average, 1,957. Stafford, 1839, 3,886, 1840, 4,045, 1841, 3,552, 1842, 3,065, 1843, 3,335, 1844, 3,937, 1845, 5,091, 1846, 4,920, 1847, 6,423, 1848, 5,263. Total for 10 years, 43,517. Annual average, 4,352. Suffolk, 1839, 2,173. 1840, 2,353. 1841, 2,342. 1842, 2,057. 1843, 2,124. 1844, 2,304. 1845, 2,436. 1846, 2,389. 1847, 2,325. 1848, 2,354. Total for 10 years, 22,857. Annual average, 2,286. Surrey, 1839, 2,128. 1840, 2,260. 1841, 2,180. 1842, 2,129, 1843, 2,205, 1844, 2,185, 1845, 2,473, 1846, 2,451, 1847, 2,134, 1848, 2,039, total for 10 years, 22,184, annual average, 2,218. Sussex. 1839, 1,452, 1840, 1,480, 1841, 1,400, 1842, 1,364, 1843, 1,443, 1844, 1,427, 1845, 1,594, 1846, 1,534, 1847, 1,512, 1848, 1,371. Total for 10 years, 14,577. Annual average, 1,458. Warwick, 1839, 1,512. 1840, 2,470. 1841, 2,294. 1842, 2,052. 1843, 2,415. 
1844, 2,516, 1845, 2,670, 1846, 2,958, 1847, 2,870, 1848, 2,855. Total for 10 years, 24,612. Annual average, 2,461. Westmoreland, 1839, 195, 1840, 191, 1841, 177, 1842, 185, 1843, 193, 1844, 225, 1845, 237, 1846, 321, 1847, 220, 1848, 135. Total for 10 years, 2,079. Annual average, 208. Wilts, 1839, 1,495, 1840, 1,603, 1841, 1,550, 1842, 1,487, 1843, 1,522, 1844, 1,527, 1845, 1,685, 1846, 1,642, 1847, 1,481, 1848, 1,528. Total for 10 years, 15,520. Annual average, 1,552. Worcester, 1839, 3,201. 1840, 3,098. 1841, 2,934. 1842, 2,588. 1843, 2,528. 1844, 2,974, 1845, 3,744, 1846, 4,192, 1847, 1,871, 1848, 1,643, total for 10 years, 28,773, annual average, 2,877. York, 1839, 11,439, 1840, 11,899, 1841, 10,726, 1842, 10,503, 1843, 11,099, 1844, 12,970, 1845, 13,395, 1846, 12,688, 1847, 11,797, 1848, 11,930. Total for 10 years. 118,446. Annual average, 11,845. North Wales, 1839, 3,028. 1840, 3,022. 1841, 2,999. 1842, 2,925. 1843, 2,694. 1844, 2,737. 1845, 2,916. 1846, 3,219. 1847, 2,904. 1848, 1,951. Total for 10 years, 28,395. Annual average, 2,840. South Wales, 1839, 4,382. 1840, 4,532. 1841, 4,378. 1842, 4,093. 1843, 4,190. 1844, 4,617. 1845, 4,978. 1846, 5,565. 1847, 4,703. 1848, 4,811. Total for 10 years, 46,249. Annual average, 4,625. Total for England and Wales. 1839, 100,616. 1840, 104,335. 1841, 99,634. 1842, 94,996. 1843, 101,235. 1844, 107,985. 1845, 118,894. 1846, 117,633. 1847, 104,306. 1848, 105,937. Total for 10 years, 1,050,907. Annual average, 105,091. 
number of persons who signed with marks in every 100 married. Bedford, 56, Barks, 42, Bucks, 49, Cambridge, 45, Chester, 46, Cornwall, 45, Cumberland, 25, Derby, 39, Devon, 32, Dorset, 36, Durham, 36, Essex, 50, Gloucester, 35, Hereford, 41, Hartford, 54, Hunts, 49, Kent, 32, Lancaster, 52, Leicester, 41, Lincoln, 39, Middlesex, 18, Monmouth, 59, Norfolk, 46, Northampton, 43, Northumberland, 28, Nottingham, 42, Oxford, 39, Rutland, 49, Salop, 48, Somerset, 41, Southampton, 34, Stafford, 52, Suffolk, 48, Surrey, 21, Sussex, 34, Warwick, 38, Westmoreland, 27, Wilts, 48, Worcester, 52, York, 44, North Wales, 55, South Wales, 57. Total for England and Wales, 40. Percent above and below the average. Bedford, 40.0% above. Barks, 5.0% above. Bucks, 22.5% above. Cambridge, 12.5% above. Chester, 15.0% above. Cornwall, 12.5% above. Cumberland, 37.5% below. Derby, 2.5% below. Devon, 20.0% below. Dorset, 10.0% below. Durham, 10.0% below. Essex, 25.0% above. Gloucester, 12.5% below. Hereford, 2.5% above. Hartford, 35.0% above. Hunts, 22.5% above. Kent, 20.0% below. Lancaster, 30.0% above. Leicester, 2.5% above. Lincoln, 2.5% below. Middlesex, 55.0% below. Monmouth, 47.5% above. Norfolk, 15.0% above. Northampton, 7.5% above. Northumberland, 30.0% below. Nottingham, 5.0% above. Oxford, 2.5% below. Rutland, 22.5% above. Salop, 20.0% above. Somerset, 2.5% above. Southampton, 15.0% below. Stafford, 30.0% above. Suffolk, 20.0% above. Surrey, 47.5% below. Sussex, 15.0% below. Warwick, 5.0% below. Westmoreland, 32.5% below. Wilts, 20.0% above. Worcester, 30.0% above. York, 10.0% above. North Wales, 37.5% above. South Wales, 42.5% above. List of counties in the order of their ignorance, as shown by the number who signed the marriage register with marks in every 100 persons married. Counties above the average, or most ignorant. Monmouth, 59. South Wales, 57. Bedford, 56. North Wales, 55. Hartford, 54. Lancaster, 52. Stafford, 52. Worcester, 52. Essex, 50. Bucks, 49. Hunts, 49. Rutland, 49. Salop, 48. Suffolk, 48. Wilts, 48. Chester, 46. Norfolk, 46. Cambridge, 45. Cornwall, 45. York, 44. Northampton, 43. Barks, 42. Nottingham, 42. Hereford, 41. Leicester, 41. Somerset, 41. Counties below the average or least ignorant. Derby, 39. Lincoln, 39. Oxford, 39. Warwick, 38, Dorset, 36, Durham, 36, Gloucester, 35, Southampton, 34, Sussex, 34, Devon, 32, Kent, 32, Northumberland, 28, Westmoreland, 27, Cumberland, 25, Surrey, 21, Middlesex, 18. Average for England and Wales, 40. The crime and ignorance of the several counties compared. Counties having great crime and great ignorance. In number of criminals, Worcester 52.4% above, Chester 37.8% above, Hereford 45.1% above, Bucks 24.4% above, Somerset 21.3% above, Essex 16.4% above, Lancaster 12.8% above, Hartford 6.7% above, Norfolk 4.2% above. 
in number signing register with marks, Worcester 36.0% above, Chester 15.0% above, Hereford 2.5% above, Bucks 22.5% above, Somerset 2.5% above, Essex 25.0% above, Lancaster 30.0% above, Hartford 35.0% above, Norfolk 15.0% above. In number of criminals unable to read and write, Worcester 8.5% above, Chester 9.4% above, Hereford 41.5% above, Bucks 6.9% above, Somerset 7.2% above, Essex 24.2% above, Lancaster 22.0% above, Hartford 29.8% above, Norfolk 19.1% above. Counties having little crime and little ignorance. Cumberland 56.7% below, Westmoreland 50.6% below, Northumberland 50.0% below, Derby 36.0% below, Lincoln 22.0% below, Devon 14.0% below, Sussex 6.7% below, Surrey 0.6% below. In number signing register with marks, Cumberland 37.5% below, Westmoreland 32.5% below, Northumberland 30.0% below, Derby 2.5% below, Lincoln 2.5% below, Devon 20.0% below, Sussex 15.0% below, Surrey 47.5% below. In number of criminals unable to read and write, Cumberland 15.4% below, Westmoreland 38.6% below, Northumberland 19.1% below, Derby 23.5% below, Lincoln 14.8% below, Devon 12.9% below, Sussex 4.0% below, Surrey 13.8% below. Counties having great crime and in which the ignorance tests are contradictory. In number of criminals, Warwick 31.7% above, Wilts 15.2% above, Monmouth 9.7% above, Stafford 9.1% above, Leicester 4.2% above. In number signing register with marks, Warwick 5.0% below, Wilts 20.0% above, Monmouth 47.0% above, Stafford 30.0% above, Leicester 2.5% above. In number of criminals unable to read and write, Warwick 9.7% above, Wilts 20.4% below, Monmouth 12.2% below, Stafford 3.4% below, Leicester 11.6% below. Counties having great crime and little ignorance. In number of criminals, Gloucester 59.1% above, Middlesex 49.4% above, Oxford 8.5% above, Southampton 7.9% above. In number signing register with marks, Gloucester 12.5% below, Middlesex 55.0% below, Oxford 2.5% below, Southampton 15.0% below. In number of criminals unable to read and write, Gloucester 11.9% below, Middlesex 21.7% below, Oxford 0.9% below, Southampton 13.5% below. Counties having little crime and great ignorance. In number of criminals, North Wales 56.1% below, South Wales 48.7% below, Ants 14.0% below, Northampton 13.4% below, Salop 9.1% below, Bedford 7.3% below, Suffolk 4.2% below. In number signing register with marks, North Wales 37.5% above, South Wales 42.5% above, Hants 22.5% above, Northampton 7.5% above, Salop 20.0% above, Bedford 40.0% above, Suffolk 20.0% above. In number of criminals unable to read and write, North Wales 20.4% above, South Wales 14.7% above, Hants 1.9% above, Northampton 1.5% above, Salop 25.8% above, Bedford 28.3% above, Suffolk 8.1% above. Counties having little crime and in which the ignorance tests are contradictory. In number of criminals, Durham 51.8% below, Cornwall 51.2% below, York 30.5% below, Nottingham 28.0% below, Barks 21.4% below, Rutland 15.2% below,
Cambridge, 10.3% below. Dorset, 10.0% below. Kent, no entry. In number signing register with marks. Durham, 10.0% below. Cornwall, 12.5% above. York, 10.0% above. Nottingham, 5.0% above. Berks, 5.0% above. Rutland, 22.5% above. Cambridge, 12.5% above. Dorset, 10.0% below. Kent, 20.0% below. In number of criminals unable to read and write. Durham, 1.5% above. Cornwall, 6.9% below. York, 8.5% below. Nottingham, 5.6% below. Berks, 4.7% below. Rutland, 2.5% below. Cambridge, 2.5% below. Dorset, 4.7% above. Kent, 6.3% above. End of section 117. Section 118 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 4, by Henry Mayhew, 1812 to 1887. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Appendix, Part 6. Table showing the amount of ignorance amongst the criminals in the different counties of England and Wales in the undermentioned years. Average annual number of criminals from 1839 to 1848. Bedford, 181. Barks, 313. Bucks, 285. Cambridge, 249. Chester, 904. Cornwall, 294. Cumberland, 130. Derby, 263. Devon, 755. Dorset, 258. Durham, 260. Essex, 638. Gloucester, 1067. Hereford, 229. Hartford, 288. Hunts, 77. Kent, 942. Lancaster, 3,462. Leicester, 419. Lincoln, 458. Middlesex, 4,230. Monmouth, 272. Norfolk, 727. Northampton, 291. Northumberland, 214. Nottingham, 333. Oxford, 308. Rutland, 29. Salop, 367. Somerset, 935. Southampton, 664. Stafford, 1017. Suffolk, 511. Surrey, 1026. Sussex, 498. Warwick, 959. Westmoreland, 41. Wilts, 462. Worcester, 594. York, 1,878. North Wales, 274. South Wales, 435. Total for England and Wales, 27,542. Number of criminals who could neither read nor write. Bedford, 1839, 39. 1840, 72. 1841, 90. 1842, 110. 1843, 80. 1844, 81. 1845, 64, 1846, 66, 1847, 64, 1848, 79. Total for 10 years, 745. Average number per year, 74. Barks, 1839, 103, 1840, 121, 1841, 97, 1842, 113, 1843, 48, 1844, 75, 1845, 79, 1846, 88, 1847, 100, 1848, 127. Total for 10 years, 951. Average number per year, 95. Bucks, 1839, 89, 1840, 107, 1841, 87, 1842, 112, 1843, 113, 1844, 91. 1845, 95, 1846, 89, 1847, 105, 1848, 82. Total for 10 years, 970. Average number per year, 97. Cambridge, 1839, 79, 1840, 65, 1841, 90, 1842, 78, 1843, 80, 1844, 77, 1845, 69. 1846, 78, 
1847, 75, 1848, 81. Total for 10 years, 772. Average number per year, 77. Chester, 1839, 285, 1840, 370, 1841, 334, 1842, 333, 1843, 336, 1844, 259, 1845, 230, 1846, 296, 1847, 336, 1848, 371. Total for 10 years, 3,150. Average number per year, 315. Cornwall, 1839, 81, 1840, 95, 1841, 82, 1842, 80, 1843, 82, 1844, 65, 1845, 90, 1846, 89, 1847, 125, 1848, 86. Total for 10 years, 875. Average number per year, 87. Cumberland, 1839, 39, 1840, 30, 1841, 26, 1842, 45, 1843, 37, 1844, 41, 1845, 21. 1846, 46, 1847, 32, 1848, 37. Total for 10 years, 354. Average number per year, 35. Derby, 1839, 74, 1840, 48, 1841, 66, 1842, 92, 1843, 77, 1844, 61, 1845, 53, 1846, 63. 1847, 41, 1848, 64. Total for 10 years, 642. Average number per year, 64. Devon, 1839, 143, 1840, 154, 1841, 146, 1842, 144, 1843, 204, 1844, 235, 1845, 211, 1846, 248, 1847, 307, 1848, 295. Total for 10 years, 2087. Average number per year, 209. Dorset, 1839, 84, 1840, 107, 1841, 96, 1842, 75, 1843, 95, 1844, 73. 1845, 83, 1846, 64, 1847, 93, 1848, 84. Total for 10 years, 864. Average number per year, 86. Durham, 1839, 70, 1840, 33, 1841, 56, 1842, 88, 1843, 96, 1844, 138, 1845, 66, 1846, 78, 1847, 97, 1848, 120. Total for 10 years, 842. Average number per year, 84. Essex, 1839, 213, 1840, 297, 1841, 302, 1842, 295, 1843, 290, 1844, 219. 1845, 188, 1846, 242, 1847, 254, 1848, 224. Total for 10 years, 2,524. Average number per year, 252. Gloucester, 1839, 326, 1840, 322, 1841, 370, 1842, 414. 1843, 330, 1844, 211, 1845, 210, 1846, 235, 1847, 293, 1848, 276. Total for 10 years, 2,987. Average number per year, 299. Hereford, 1839, 102, 1840, 120. 1841, 121, 1842, 107, 1843, 107, 1844, 83, 1845, 96, 1846, 64, 
1847, 112, 1848, 115. Total for 10 years, 1,027. Average number per year, 103. Hartford, 1839, 147, 1840, 133, 1841, 146, 1842, 119, 1843, 98, 1844, 111, 1845, 90, 1846, 82, 1847, 121, 1848, 148. Total for 10 years, 1,195. Average number per year, 119. Hunts, 1839, 20, 1840, 33, 1841, 21, Total for 10 years, 252. Average number per year, 25. Kent, 1839, 348, 1840, 251, 1841, 353, 1842, 371, 1843, 330, 1844, 301, 1845, 301, 1846, 267, 1847, 305, 1848, 368. Total for 10 years, 3,195. Average number per year, 319. Lancaster, 1839, 1,143, 1840, 1,391, 1841, 1,556, 1842, 1,947, 1843, 1,423, 1844, 992, 1845, 1,023, 1846, 1,097, 1847, 1,283, 1848, 1,389. Total for 10 years, 13,444. Average number per year, 1,344. Leicester, 1839, 141, 1840, 159, 1841, 135, 1842, 141. 1843, 137, 1844, 135, 1845, 87, 1846, 96, 1847, 66, 1848, 82. Total for 10 years, 1,179. Average number per year, 118. Lincoln, 1839, 117, 1840, 119, 1841, 99. 1842, 133, 1843, 131, 1844, 134, 1845, 112, 1846, 125, 1847, 136, 1848, 137. Total for 10 years, 1,243. Average number per year, 124. Middlesex, 1839, 927. 1840, 882, 1841, 980, 1842, 800, 1843, 1033, 1844, 933, 1845, 1230, 1846, 1177, 1847, 1280, 1848, 1322. Total for 10 years, 10,564. Average number per year, 1,056. Monmouth, 1839, 83, 1840, 94, 1841, 112, 1842, 73, 1843, 79, 1844, 67, 1845, 34, 1846, 45, 1847, 81, 1848, 95. Total for 10 years, 763. Average number per year, 76. Norfolk, 1839, 285, 1840, 266, 1841, 258, 1842, 308, 1843, 284, 1844, 290, 1845, 254, 1846, 271, 1847, 293, 1848, 247. Total for 10 years, 2,756. 
average number per year, 276. Northampton, 1839, 96, 1840, 92, 1841, 118, 1842, 111, 1843, 92, 1844, 90, 1845, 107, 1846, 86, 1847, 56, 1848, 93, total for 10 years, 941, average number per year, 94. Northumberland, 1839, 24, 1840, 57, 1841, 45, 1842, 58, 1843, 75, 1844, 96, 1845, 44, 1846, 45, 1847, 49, 1848, 57. Total for 10 years, 550. Average number per year, 55. Nottingham, 1839, 104, 1840, 108, 1841, 91, 1842, 102, 1843, 112, 1844, 115, 1845, 79, 1846, 88, 1847, 95, 1848, 106. Total for 10 years, 1,000. Average number per year, 100. Oxford, 1839, 113. 1840, 134, 1841, 106, 1842, 99, 1843, 117, 1844, 84, 1845, 93, 1846, 64, 1847, 90, 1848, 73. Total for 10 years, 973. Average number per year, 97. Rutland, 1839, 4, 1840, no entry. 1841, 1, 1842, 11, 1843, 13, 1844, 8, 1845, 12, 1846, 8, 1847, 15, 1848, 17. Total for 10 years, 89. Average number per year, 9. Salop, 1839, 136, 1840, 176, 1841, 182. 1842, 173, 1843, 215, 1844, 164, 1845, 104, 1846, 89, 1847, 112, 1848, 119. Total for 10 years, 1,470. Average number per year, 147. Somerset, 1839, 281. 1840, 410, 1841, 352, 1842, 363, 1843, 333, 1844, 360, 1845, 298, 1846, 224, 1847, 266, 1848, 313. Total for 10 years, 3,200. Average number per year, 320. Southampton. 1839, 215, 1840, 207, 1841, 188, 1842, 186, 1843, 159, 1844, 126, 1845, 153, 1846, 193, 1847, 213, 1848, 194. Total for 10 years, 1,834. Average number per year, 183. Stafford, 1839, 233, 1840, 271, 1841, 324, 1842, 465, 1843, 313, 1844, 304, 1845, 212, 1846, 263, 1847, 354, 1848, 387. Total for 10 years, 3,126. Average number per year, 313. Suffolk, 1839, 187, 1840, 201, 1841, 184, 1842, 188, 1843, 195, 1844, 198, 1845, 113, 1846, 159. 1847, 159, 1848, 179, 
total for 10 years, 1,763, average number per year, 176. Sorry, 1839, 315, 1840, 320, 1841, 274, 1842, 300, 1843, 223, 1844, 233, 1845, 223, 1846, 218, 1847, 348, 1848, 340, total for 10 years, 2,824, average number per year, 282. Sussex, 1839, 173, 1840, 173, 1841, 176, 1842, 191, 1843, 143, 1844, 111, 1845, 97, 1846, 151, 1847, 136, 1848, 168. Total for 10 years, 1,519. Average number per year, 152. Warwick, 1839, 293, 1840, 396, 1841, 403, 1842, 363, 1843, 392, 1844, 267, 1845, 237, 1846, 234, 1847, 324, 1848, 440. Total for 10 years, 3,349. Average number per year, 335. Westmoreland, 1839, 8, 1840, 6, 1841, 5, 1842, 5, 1843, 6, 1844, 3, 1845, 11, 1846, 20, 1847, 5, 1848, 9. Total for 10 years, 78. Average number per year, 8. Wilts, 1839, 132, 1840, 145, 1841, 146, 1842, 127, 1843, 116, 1844, 100, 1845, 85, 1846, 101, 1847, 118, 1848, 104. Total for 10 years, 1,174. Average number per year, 117. Worcester, 1839, 169, 1840, 275, 1841, 244, 1842, 250, 1843, 242, 1844, 204, 1845, 210, 1846, 195, 1847, 229, 1848, 232, total for 10 years, 2,250, average number per year, 225. York, 1839, 553, 1840, 572, 1841, 531, 1842, 776, 1843, 621, 1844, 444, 1845, 378, 1846, 453, 1847, 528, 1848, 619, total for 10 years, 5,475, average number per year, 547. North Wales, 1839, 84, 1840, 110, 1841, 92, 1842, 122, 1843, 116, 1844, 107, 1845, 81, 1846, 79, 1847, 126, 1848, 136. Total for 10 years, 1053. Average number per year, 105. South Wales, 1839, 108, 1840, 136, 1841, 135, 1842, 138, 1843, 174, 1844, 188, 1845, 183, 1846, 108, 1847, 187, 1848, 240. Total for 10 years, 1,593. Average number per year, 159. 
total for England and Wales. 1839, 8196. 1840, 9058. 1841, 9220. 1842, 10,128. 1843, 9,173. 1844, 7,901. 1845, 7,438. 1846, 7,698. 1847, 9,050. 1848, 9,691. Total for 10 years, 87,553. Average number per year, 8,755. Number of criminals who can neither read nor write in every 100. Bedford, 40.8. Barks, 30.3. Bucks, 34.0. Cambridge, 30.9. Chester, 34.8. Cornwall, 29.6. Cumberland, 26.9. Derby, 24.3. Devon, 27.7. Dorset, 33.3. Durham, 32.3. Essex, 39.5. Gloucester, 28.0. Hereford, 45.0. Hartford, 41.3. Hunts, 32.4. Kent, 33.8. Lancaster, 38.8. Leicester, 28.1. Lincoln, 27.1. Middlesex, 24.9. Monmouth, 27.9. Norfolk, 37.9. Northampton, 32.3. Northumberland, 25.7. Nottingham, 30.0. Oxford, 31.5. Rutland, 31.0. Salop, 40.0. Somerset, 34.1. Southampton, 27.5. Stafford, 30.7. Suffolk, 34.4. Surrey, 27.4. Sussex, 30.5. Warwick, 34.9. Westmoreland, 19.5. Wilts, 25.3. Worcester, 34.5. York, 29.1. North Wales, 38.3. South Wales, 36.5. Total for England and Wales, 31.8. Percent above and below the average. Bedford, 28.3% above. Barks, 4.7% below. Bucks, 6.9% above. Cambridge, 2.5% below. Chester, 9.4% above. Cornwall, 6.9% below. Cumberland, 15.4% below. Derby, 23.5% below. Devon, 12.9% below. Dorset, 4.7% above. Durham, 1.5% above. Essex, 24.2% above. Gloucester, 11.9% below. Hereford, 41.5% above. Hartford, 29.8% above. Hunts, 1.9% above. Kent, 6.3% above. Lancaster, 22.0% above. Leicester, 11.6% below. Lincoln, 14.8% below. Middlesex, 21.7% below. Monmouth, 12.2% below. Norfolk, 19.1% above. Northampton, 1.5% above. Northumberland, 19.1% below. Nottingham, 5.6% below. Oxford, 0.9% below. Rutland, 2.5% below. Salop, 25.8% above. Somerset, 7.2% above. Southampton, 13.5% below. Stafford, 3.4% below. Suffolk, 8.1% above. Surrey, 13.8% below. Sussex, 4.0% below. Warwick, 9.7% above. Westmoreland, 38.6% below. Wilts, 20.4% below. Worcester, 8.5% above. York, 8.5% below. North Wales, 20.4% above. South Wales, 14.7% above. List of counties in the order of the ignorance amongst their criminals, as shown by the number of persons who could neither read nor write in every 100 criminals. Counties above the average. Hereford, 45.0. Hartford, 41.3. Bedford, 40.8. Salop, 40.0. Essex, 39.5. Lancaster, 38.8. North Wales, 38.3. Norfolk, 37.9. South Wales, 36.5. Warwick, 34.9. Chester, 34.8. Worcester, 34.5. Suffolk, 34.4. Somerset, 34.1. 
Bucks 34.0, Kent 33.8, Dorset 33.3, Hunt 32.4, Durham 32.3, Northampton 32.3. Average for England and Wales 31.8. Counties below the average. Oxford 31.5, Rutland 31.0, Cambridge 30.9, Stafford 30.7, Sussex 30.5, Barks 30.3, Nottingham 30.0. Cornwall 29.6, York 29.1, Leicester 28.1, Gloucester 28.0, Monmouth 27.9, Devon 27.7, Southampton 27.5, Surrey 27.4, Lincoln 27.1, Cumberland 26.9, Northumberland 25.7, Wilts 25.3, Middlesex 24.9, Derby 24.3, Westmoreland 19.5. The counties arranged criminally and topographically to show the local association of crime. Number of criminals in 10,000. Division 1, Northern, Welsh and Cornish counties. Cumberland, 7.1. Durham, 7.8. Westmoreland, 8.1. Northumberland, 8.2. North Wales, 7.2. South Wales, 8.4. Cornwall, 8.0. Division 2, York and North Midland counties. York, 11.4. Derby, 10.5. Nottingham, 11.8. Lincoln, 12.8. Rutland, 13.9. Division 3, South Midland and Eastern counties. Hunt, 14.1. Northampton, 14.2. Cambridge, 14.7. Bedford, 15.2. Suffolk, 15.7. Norfolk, 17.1. Essex, 19.1. Oxford 17.8, Arts 17.5, Bucks 20.4. Division 4, South Eastern and South Western. Barks 12.9, Devon 14.1, Dorset 14.8, Sussex 15.3, Surrey 16.3, Kent 16.4, Hants 17.7, Wilts 18.9, Somerset 19.9, Monmouth 18.0. Division 5, Western and Northwestern. Shropshire, 14.9. Leicestershire, 17.1. Stafford, 17.9. Lancaster, 18.5. Chester, 22.6. Warwick, 21.6. Hereford, 23.8. Worcester, 25.0. Gloucester, 26.1. Division 6, Metropolitan. Middlesex, 24.5. The Northern, Welsh and Cornish counties range in criminality from 7.1 to 8.4 in 10,000. York and the North Midland counties from 11.4 to 13.9. The South Midland and Eastern counties from 14.1 to 20.4. The South Eastern and South Western from 12.9 to 19.9. The Western and North Western from 14.9 to 26.1. The Metropolitan, 24.5. Table showing the relative criminality and ignorance of the several counties arranged according to the occupation of their inhabitants. Agricultural counties. Number of criminals in every 10,000 of population. Lincoln, 12. Rutland, 13. Huntingdon, 14. Cambridge, 14. Essex, 19. Sussex, 15. Hereford, 23. Number of persons who signed with marks in every 100 married. Lincoln, 39. Rutland, 49. Huntingdon, 49. Cambridge, 45. Essex, 50. Sussex, 34. Hereford, 41. Agricultural and sub-manufacturing counties. Number of criminals in every 10,000 of population. Westmoreland, 8. Norfolk, 17. Suffolk, 15. Hartford, 17. Bedford, 15. Buckingham, 20. Northampton, 14. Oxford, 17. Barks, 12. Hants, 17. Wilts, 18. Dorset, 14. Somerset, 19. Number of persons who signed with marks in every 100 married. Westmoreland, 27. Norfolk, 46. Suffolk, 48. Hartford, 54. Bedford, 56. Buckingham, 49. Northampton, 43. Oxford, 39. Barks, 42. Hants, 34. Wilts, 48. Dorset, 
36, Somerset, 41. Sub-agricultural and sub-manufacturing counties. Gloucester, number of criminals in every 10,000 of population, 26. Number of persons who signed with marks in every 100 married, 35. Manufacturing counties. Number of criminals in every 10,000 of population. Lancaster, 18. Yorkshire, 11. Chester, 22. Nottingham, 11. Leicester, 17. Warwick, 21. Worcester, 25. Number of persons who signed with marks in every 100 married. Lancaster, 52. Yorkshire, 44. Chester, 46. Nottingham, 42. Leicester, 41. Warwick, 38. Worcester, 52. Mining counties. Number of criminals in every 10,000 of population. Durham, 7. Cornwall, 8. Number of persons who signed with marks in every 100 married. Durham, 36. Cornwall, 45. Manufacturing and sub-mining counties. Number of criminals in every 10,000 of population. Derby, 10. Stafford, 17. Number of persons who signed with marks in every 100 married. Derby, 39. Stafford, 52. Agricultural and sub-mining counties. Number of criminals in every 10,000 of population. Salop, 14. North Wales, 7. South Wales, 8. Number of persons who signed with marks in every 100 married. Salop, 48. North Wales, 55. South Wales, 57. Sub-agricultural and sub-mining counties. Number of criminals in every 10,000 of population. Northumberland, 8. Cumberland, 7. Monmouth, 18. Number of persons who signed with marks in every 100 married. Northumberland, 28. Cumberland, 25. Monmouth, 59. Metropolitan County, Middlesex. Number of criminals in every 10,000 of population. 24. Number of persons who signed with marks in every 100 married. 18. Sub-metropolitan counties. Number of criminals in every 10,000 of population. Surrey, 16. Kent, 16. Number of persons who signed with marks in every 100 married. Surrey, 21. Kent, 32. For a definition of agricultural, manufacturing and mining counties, see Table of Density of Population, number 37. Table showing the relative degrees of criminality and ignorance in the different counties in England and Wales. The average taken for 10 years. Reader's note, there follows a graph showing percentage above the average and percentage below the average for the different counties. End of reader's note. The thin line represents ignorance. The thick line represents crime. End of section 118. Section 119 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 4, by Henry Mayhew, 1812 to 1887. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Appendix, Part 7. Education of Criminals, England and Wales. Table showing the degrees of instruction of persons of all ages committed to prison from 1839 to 1848. Unable to read or write. 1839, 8,196. 1840, 9,058. 1841, 9,220. 1842, 10,128. 1843, 9,173. 1844, 7,901. 1845, 7,438. 1846, 7,698. 1847, 9050, 1848, 9691. Able to read and write imperfectly. 1839, 13,071. 1840, 15,109. 1841, 15,732. 1842, 18,260. 1843, 17,045. 1844, 15,735. 1845, 14,179. 1846, 14,942. 1847, 16,980. 
1848, 17,111. Able to read and write well. 1839, 2,462, 1840, 2,253, 1841, 2,053, 1842, 2,121, 1843, 2,371, 1844, 2,165, 1845, 2,037, 1846, 1,936, 1847, 2,245, 1848, 2,984. Superior Instruction 1839, 78, 1840, 101, 1841, 26, 1842, 69, 1843, 140, 1844, 111, 1845, 89, 1846, 85, 1847, 82, 1848, 81. Instruction could not be ascertained. 1839, 636, 1840, 666, 1841, 629, 1842, 731, 1843, 862, 1844, 639, 1845, 560, 1846, 446, 1847, 476, 1848, 482. Total, 1839, 24,443, 1840, 27,187, 1841, 27,760, 1842, 31,309, 1843, 29,591, 1844, 26,542, 1845, 24,303, 1846, 25,107, 1847, 28,833, 1848, 30,349. Table showing the centesimal degrees of instruction of persons of all ages committed to prison from 1839 to 1848. Unable to read or write. 1839, 33.53. 1840, 33.32. 1841, 33.21. 1842, 32.35, 1843, 31.00, 1844, 29.77, 1845, 30.61, 1846, 30.66, 1847, 31.39, 1848, 31.93. Able to read and write imperfectly, 1839, 53.48, 1840, 55.57, 1841, 56.67, 1842, 58.32, 1843, 57.60, 1844, 59.28, 1845, 58.39, 1846, 59.51, 1847, 58.89, 1846, 58.38. Able to read and 10.07, 1840, 8.29, 1841, 7.40, 1842, 6.77, 1843, 8.02, 1844, 8.42, 1845, 8.38, 1846, 7.71, 1847, 7.79, 1848, 9.83. Superior Instruction 1839, 0 0.32, 1840, 0 0.37, 1841, 0 0.45. 1842, 0 0.42, 1843, 0 0.47, 1844, 0 0.42, 1845, 0 0.37, 1846, 0 0.34, 1847, 0 0.28, 1848, 0 0.27. Instruction could not be ascertained. 1839, 2.60, 1840, 2.45, 1841, 2.27, 1842, 2.31, 1843, 2.91, 1844, 2.41, 1845, 2.30, 1846, 1.78, 1847, 1.65, 1848,1.59. The instruction of the offenders, says the criminal returns of 1848, has been without much variation, exhibiting, on a comparison of the last ten years, a decreased proportion of those entirely uninstructed.
end quote. And it may be added a corresponding increase of those who are able to read and write imperfectly. The state of education and density of the population in the several counties compared. Counties having great ignorance and great density of population. In number signing register with marks. Monmouth, 47% above. Lancaster, 30% above. Stafford, 30% above. Worcester, 30% above. Chester, 15% above. Nottingham, 5% above. In number of persons to 100 acres. Monmouth, 9% above. Lancaster, 270% above. Stafford, 72% above. Worcester, 13% above. Chester, 31% above. Nottingham, 12% above. Counties having little ignorance and little density of population. In number signing register with marks. Cumberland, 37% below. Westmoreland, 32% below. Northumberland, 30% below. Devon, 20% below. Sussex, 15% below. Southampton, 15% below. Dorset, 10% below. Oxford, 2% below. Lincoln, 2% below. Derby, 2% below. In number of persons to 100 acres. Cumberland, 59% below. Westmoreland, 75% below. Northumberland, 48% below. Devon, 30% below. Sussex, 25% below. Southampton, 20% below. Dorset, 43% below. Oxford, 26% below. Lincoln, 51% below. Derby, 20% below. Counties having little ignorance and great density of population. In number signing register with marks. Middlesex, 55% below. Surrey, 47% below. Kent, 20% below. Gloucester, 12% below. Durham, 10% below. Warwick, 5% below. In number of persons to 100 acres. Middlesex, 2,030% above. Surrey, 189% above. Kent, 28% above. Gloucester, 6% above. Durham, 21% above. Warwick, 70% above. Counties having great ignorance and little density of population. In number signing register with marks. South Wales, 42% above. Bedford, 40% above. North Wales, 37% above. Hartford, 35% above. Essex, 25% above. Bucks, 22% above. Hunts, 22% above. Rutland, 22% above. Salop, 20% above. Suffolk, 20% above. Wilts, 20% above. Norfolk, 15% above. Cambridge, 12% above. Cornwall, 12% above. York, 10% above. Northampton, 7% above. Berks, 5% above. Hereford, 2% above. Leicester, 2% above. Somerset, 2% above. In number of persons to 100 acres. South Wales, 55% below. Bedford, 12% below. North Wales, 60% below. Hartford, 12% below. Essex, 29% below. Bucks, 37% below. Hunts, 49% below. Rutland, 49% below. Salop, 42% below. Suffolk, 26% below. Wilts, 44% below. Norfolk, 32% below. Cambridge, 28% below. Cornwall, 16% below. York, 2% below. Northampton, 33% below. Barks, 15% below. Hereford, 63% below. Leicester, 7% below. Somerset, 10% below. The rule appears to be that those counties are the most ignorant in which the population is the least dense. The crime and density of the population of the several counties compared. Counties having great crime and great density of population. In number of criminals, Gloucester 59.1% above, Worcester 52.4% above, Middlesex 49.4% above, Chester 37.8% above, Warwick 31.7% above, Lancaster 12.8% above, Monmouth 9.7% above, Stafford 9.1% above. In number of persons to 100 acres, Gloucester 6.4% above, Worcester 13.3% above, Middlesex 2030.8% above, Chester 31.2% above, Warwick 70.0% above, Lancaster 270.6% above, 
Monmouth 9.9% above, Stafford 72.2% above. Counties having little crime and little density of population. In number of criminals, Cumberland 56.7% below, North Wales 56.1% below, Cornwall 51.2% below, Westmoreland 50.6% below, Northumberland 50.0% below, South Wales 48.7% below, Derby 36.0% below, York 30.5% below, Lincoln 22.0% below, Berks 21.4% below, Hunts 14.0% below, Devon 14.0% below, Rutland 15.2% below, Northampton 13.4% below, Cambridge 10.3% below, Dorset 10.0% below, Salop 9.1% below, Bedford 7.3% below, Sussex 6.7% below, Suffolk 4.2% below. In number of persons to 100 acres, Cumberland 59.6% below, North Wales 60.4% below, Cornwall 16.3% below, Westmoreland 75.9% below, Northumberland 48.1% below, South Wales 55.1% below, Derby 20.9% below, York 2.0% below, Lincoln 51.7% below, Barks 15.5% below, Hunts 49.9% below, Devon 30.0% below, Rutland 49.9% below, Northampton 33.4% below, Cambridge 28.2% below, Dorset 43.1% below, Salop 42.9% below, Bedford 12.3% below, Sussex 25.0% below, Suffolk 26.6% below. Counties having great crime and little density of population. In number of criminals, Hereford 45.1% above, Bucks 24.4% above, Somerset 21.3% above, Essex 16.4% above, Wilts 15.2% above, Oxford 8.5% above, Southampton 7.9% above, Hartford 6.7% above, Leicester 4.2% above, Norfolk 4.2% above. In number of persons to 100 acres, Hereford 63.4% below, Bucks 37.0% below, Somerset 10.9% below, Essex 29.6% below, Wilts 44.1% below, Oxford 26.8% below, Southampton 20.7% below, Hartford 12.5% below, Leicester 7.4% below, Norfolk 32.6% below. Counties having little crime and great density of population. In number of criminals, Durham 51.8% below, Nottingham 28.0% below, Surrey 0.6% below, Kent no entry. In number of persons to 100 acres, Durham 21.9% above, Nottingham 12.7% above, Surrey 189.7% above, Kent 28.0% above. The rule appears to be that those counties are the least criminal in which the population is the least dense. End of section 119。section 120 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 4 by Henry Mayhew, 1812 to 1887. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Appendix Part 8 Map showing the number of illegitimate children in every 1,000 births in each county of England and Wales. Counties printed black are those in which the number of illegitimate births is above the average. The counties left white are those in which the number of illegitimate births is below the average. The average is taken for four years, note, as long as the returns will allow, end note. The average for all England and Wales is 67 in every 1,000. Reader's note. The information shown in the map is included in the following table. End reader's note. A table showing the number of illegitimate births in England and Wales in the undermentioned years. The average is calculated for as long a series of years as the returns of the Registrar General will permit. Total number of births for 1845-48 to 48. Bedford, 17,384 Average per year, 4,346 Barks, 23,195 
Average per year, 5,799. Bucks, 17,984. Average per year, 4,496. Cambridge, 25,546. Average per year, 6,386. Chester, 51,396. Average per year, 12,599. Cornwall, 45,017. Average per year, 11,254. Cumberland, 23,541. Average per year, 5,885. Derby, 32,295. Average per year, 8,074. Devon, 64,802. Average per year, 16,200. Dorset, 20,529. Average per year, 5,132. Durham, 54,916. Average per year, 13,729. Essex, 41,356. Average per year, 10,339. Gloucester, 49,444. Average per year, 12,361. Hereford, 10,984. Average per year, 2,746. Hartford, 21,590. Average per year, 5,397. Hunts, 8,179. Average per year, 2,045. Kent, 73,836. Average per year, 18,459. Lancaster, 293,023. Average per year, 73,256. Leicester, 29,512. Average per year, 7,378. Lincoln, 49,546. Average per year, 12,386. Middlesex, 217,523. Average per year, 54,381. Monmouth, 21,995. Average per year, 5,499. Norfolk, 52,387. Average per year, 13,097. Northampton, 27,674. Average per year, 6,918. Northumberland, 37,523. Average per year, 9,381. Nottingham, 35,244. Average per year, 8,811. Oxford, 20,886. Average per year, 5,221. Rutland, 2,825. Average per year, 706. Salop, 25,899. Average per year, 6,475. Somerset, 53,509. Average per year, 13,377. Southampton, 46,726. Average per year, 11,681. Stafford, 77,972. Average per year, 19,493. Suffolk, 42,055. Average per year, 10,514. Surrey, 81,968. Average per year, 20,492. Sussex, 38,454. Average per year, 9,613. Warwick, 58,938. Average per year, 14,734. Westmoreland, 7,073. Average per year, 1,793. Wilts, 29,008. Average per year, 7,252. Worcester, 40,561. Average per year, 10,140. York, 231,444. Average per year, 57,861. North Wales, 43,268. Average per year, 10,817. South Wales, 72,188. Average per year, 18,047. Total for England and Wales, 2,219,170. Average per year, 554,792. Number of illegitimate births. 
Bedford, 1845, 355, 1846, 349, 1847, 302, 1848, 338. Total for four years, 1,344. Average per year, 336. Barks, 1845, 463, 1846, 472, 1847, 438, 1848, 470. Total for four years, 1,843. Average per year, 461. Bucks, 1845, 328, 1846, 329, 1847, 296, 1848, 306. Total for four years, 1,259. Average per year, 315. Cambridge, 1845, 441, 1846, 407, 1847, 442, 1848, 404. Total for four years, 1,694. Average per year, 423. Chester, 1845, 1,188, 1846, 1,190, 1847, 1,064, 1848, 1,072. Total for four years, 4,514. Average per year, 1,128. Cornwall, 1845, 576, 1846, 537, 1847, 515, 1848, 508. Total for four years, 2,136. Average per year, 534. Cumberland, 1845, 647, 1846, 641, 1847, 629, 1848, 638. Total for four years, 2,555. Average per year, 639. Derby, 1845, 672, 1846, 670, 1847, 674, 1848, 610. Total for four years, 2,626. Average per year, 656. Devon, 1845, 789, 1846, 889, 1847, 758, 1848, 837. Total for four years, 3,273. Average per year, 818. Dorset, 1845, 364, 1846, 331, 1847, 309, 1848, 366. Total for four years, 1,370. Average per year, 342. Durham, 1845, 804, 1846, 821, 1847, 812, 1848, 859. Total for four years, 3,296. Average per year, 824. Essex, 1845, 588, 1846, 673, 1847, 590, 1848, 634. Total for four years, 2,485. Average per year, 621. Gloucester, 1845, 811. 1846, 855, 1847, 720, 1848, 767. Total for four years, 3,153. Average per year, 788. Hereford, 1845, 273, 1846, 305, 1847, 254, 1848, 263. Total for four years, 1,095. Average per year, 274. Hartford, 1845, 402, 1846, 414, 1847, 368, 1848, 367. Total for four years, 1,551. Average per year, 388. Hunts, 1845, 116, 1846, 100, 1847, 80, 1848, 98. Total for four years, 394. Average per year, 98. Kent, 1845, 1015, 1846, 1008, 1847, 976, 1848, 995. 
total for four years three thousand nine hundred and ninety four average per year nine hundred and ninety eight lancaster eighteen forty five five thousand nine hundred and twenty nine eighteen forty six five thousand eight hundred and ninety seven eighteen forty seven five thousand four hundred and seventy seven eighteen forty eight five thousand three hundred and eighty four total for four years twenty two thousand six hundred and eighty seven average per year five thousand six hundred and seventy two leicester eighteen forty five six hundred and forty eighteen forty six six hundred and twenty four eighteen forty seven five hundred and thirty one eighteen forty eight five hundred and thirty six total for four years two thousand three hundred and thirty one average per year five hundred and eighty three lincoln eighteen forty five eight hundred and forty three eighteen forty six eight hundred and forty five eighteen forty seven seven hundred and seventy three eighteen forty eight eight hundred and twenty one total for four years three thousand two hundred and eighty two average per year eight hundred and twenty middlesex eighteen forty five two thousand and forty eight eighteen forty six two thousand two hundred and fifty four eighteen forty seven two thousand two hundred and one eighteen forty eight two thousand two hundred and ninety eight total for four years eight thousand eight hundred and one average per year two thousand two hundred monmouth eighteen forty five two hundred and forty seven eighteen forty six two hundred and sixty six eighteen forty seven two hundred and fifty three eighteen forty eight three hundred and nine total for four years one thousand and seventy five average per year two hundred and sixty nine norfolk eighteen forty five one thousand four hundred and twenty four eighteen forty six one thousand four hundred and forty eighteen forty seven one thousand two hundred and ninety five eighteen forty eight one thousand three hundred and thirty six total for four years five thousand four hundred and ninety five average per year one thousand three hundred and seventy four northampton eighteen forty five four hundred and forty eighteen forty six four hundred and twenty eighteen forty seven three hundred and ninety five eighteen forty eight four hundred and eleven total for four years one thousand six hundred and sixty six average per year four hundred and sixteen northumberland eighteen forty five six hundred and sixty eight eighteen forty six six hundred and seventy eight eighteen forty seven seven hundred and fifteen eighteen forty eight six hundred and seventy nine total for four years two thousand seven hundred and forty average per year six hundred and eighty five nottingham eighteen forty five eight hundred and ninety five eighteen forty six eight hundred and twenty seven eighteen forty seven seven hundred and seventy five eighteen forty eight seven hundred and thirty six total for four years three thousand two hundred and thirty three average per year eight hundred and eight oxford eighteen forty five three hundred and sixty eight eighteen forty six four hundred and sixty eight eighteen forty seven three hundred and eighty six eighteen forty eight three hundred and sixty one total for four years one thousand five hundred and eighty three average per year three hundred and ninety six rutland eighteen forty five fifty two eighteen forty six thirty four eighteen forty seven thirty eighteen forty eight forty five total for four years one hundred and sixty one average per year forty salop eighteen forty five six hundred and seventy six eighteen forty six six hundred and fifty eight eighteen forty seven five hundred and ninety three eighteen forty eight six hundred and thirty two total for four years two thousand five hundred and fifty nine average per year six hundred and forty somerset eighteen forty five nine hundred and three eighteen forty six eight hundred and sixty eighteen forty seven seven hundred and ninety six eighteen forty eight eight hundred and thirty total for four years three thousand three hundred and eighty nine average per year eight hundred and forty seven southampton eighteen forty five seven hundred and four eighteen forty six seven hundred and eleven eighteen forty seven six hundred and eighty eight eighteen forty eight seven hundred and nine total for four years two thousand eight hundred and twelve average per year seven hundred and three stafford eighteen forty five one thousand two hundred and forty eighteen forty six one thousand two hundred and eighty three eighteen forty seven one thousand four hundred and nine eighteen forty eight one thousand four hundred and thirty three total for four years five thousand three hundred and sixty five average per year one thousand three hundred and forty one suffolk eighteen forty five nine hundred and thirty seven eighteen forty six nine hundred and fifty eighteen forty seven eight hundred and forty nine eighteen forty eight eight hundred and forty six total for four years three thousand five hundred and eighty two average per year eight hundred and ninety five surrey 
1845, 855, 1846, 911, 1847, 930, 1848, 915. Total for four years, 3,611. Average per year, 903. Sussex, 1845, 657, 1846, 669, 1847, 695, 1848, 626. Total for four years, 2,647. Average per year, 662. Warwick, 1845, 779, 1846, 835, 1847, 830, 1848, 879. Total for four years, 3,323. Average per year, 831. Westmoreland, 1845, 179. 1846, 147, 1847, 149, 1848, 149. Total for four years, 624. Average per year, 156. Wilts, 1845, 521, 1846, 549, 1847, 485, 1848, 469. Total for four years, 2024. Average per year, 506. Worcester, 1845, 768, 1846, 885, 1847, 512, 1848, 553. Total for four years, 2,718. Average per year, 679. York, 1845, 4,266, 1846, 4,317, 1847, 4,030, 1848, 4,106. Total for four years, 16,619. Average per year, 4,155. North Wales, 1845, 872, 1846, 854, 1847, 830, 1848, 832. Total for four years, 3,388. Average per year, 847. South Wales, 1845, 1407, 1846, 1256, 1847, 1271, 1848, 1300. Total for four years, 5,234. Average per year, 1,308. Total for England and Wales, 1845, 38,241. 1846, 38,259. 1847, 36,125. 1848, 36,747. Total for four years, 149,642. Average per year, 37,410. Proportion to all births. One in every, Bedford, 12.9. Barks, 12.5. Bucks, 14.2. Cambridge 15.0, Chester 11.3, Cornwall 21.0, Cumberland 9.2, Derby 12.2, Devon 19.7, Dorset 14.9, Durham 16.3, Essex 16.6, Gloucester 15.6, Hereford 10.0, Hartford 13.9, Hunts 20.7, Kent 14.8, Lancaster 12.9, Leicester, 12.6. Lincoln, 15.0. Middlesex, 24.7. Monmouth, 20.4. Norfolk, 9.5. Northampton, 16.6. Northumberland, 13.6. Nottingham, 10.9. Oxford, 13.1. Rutland, 17.5. Salop, 10.1. Somerset, 15.7. Southampton, 16.6. Stafford, 14.5. Suffolk, 11.7. Surrey, 22.6. Sussex, 14.5. Warwick, 17.7. Westmoreland, 11.3. Wilts, 14.3. Worcester, 14.9. York, 13.9. North Wales, 12.7. South Wales, 13.7. Total for England and Wales, 14.8. Number of illegitimate in every 1,000 births. Bedford, 77, Barks, 79, Bucks, 70, Cambridge, 66, Chester, 89,
Cornwall, 47. Cumberland, 108. Derby, 81. Devon, 50. Dorset, 66. Durham, 60. Essex, 60. Gloucester, 64. Hereford, 100. Hartford, 72. Hunts, 48. Kent, 54. Lancaster, 77. Leicester, 79. Lincoln, 66. Middlesex, 40. Monmouth, 49. Norfolk, 105. Northampton, 60. Northumberland, 73. Nottingham, 91. Oxford, 76. Rutland, 56. Salop, 99. Somerset, 63. Southampton, 60. Stafford, 69. Suffolk, 85. Surrey, 44. Sussex, 68. Warwick, 56. Westmoreland, 87. Wilts, 69. Worcester, 66. York, 71. North Wales, 78. South Wales, 72. Total for England and Wales, 67. Percentage above and below the average. Bedford, 14.9% above. Barks, 17.9% above. Bucks, 4.4% above. Cambridge, 1.5% below. Chester, 32.8% above. Cornwall, 29.8% below. Cumberland, 61.2% above. Derby, 20.9% above. Devon, 25.3% below. Dorset, 1.5% below. Durham, 10.4% below. Essex, 10.4% below. Gloucester, 4.5% below. Hereford, 49.2% above. Hartford, 7.4% above. Hunts, 28.3% below. Kent, 19.4% below. Lancaster, 14.9% above. Leicester, 17.9% above. Lincoln, 1.5% below. Middlesex, 40.3% below. Monmouth, 26.8% below. Norfolk, 56.7% above. Northampton, 10.4% below. Northumberland, 8.9% above. Nottingham, 35.8% above. Oxford, 13.4% above. Rutland, 16.4% below. Salop, 47.7% above. Somerset, 6.0% below. Southampton, 10.4% below. Stafford, 3.0% above. Suffolk, 26.8% above. Surrey, 34.3% below. Sussex, 1.5% above. Warwick, 16.4% below. Westmoreland, 29.8% above. Wilts, 3.0% above. Worcester, 1.5% below. York, 6.0% above. North Wales, 16.4% above. South Wales, 7.4% above. List of counties in the order of their illegitimate births, as shown by the number of illegitimates in every 1,000 children born. Counties above the average. Cumberland, 108. Norfolk, 105. Hereford, 100. Salop, 99. Nottingham, 91. Chester, 89. Westmoreland, 87. Suffolk, 85. Derby, 81. Barks, 79. Leicester, 79. North Wales, 78. Lancaster, 77. Bedford, 77. Oxford, 76. Northumberland, 73. Hartford, 72. South Wales, 72. York, 71. Bucks, 70. Wilts, 69. Stafford, 69. Sussex, 68. Counties below the average. Cambridge, 66. Dorset, 66. Lincoln, 66. Worcester, 66. Gloucester, 64. Somerset, 63. Southampton, 60. Northampton, 60. Essex, 60. Durham, 60. Warwick, 56. Rutland, 56. Kent, 54. Devon, 50. Monmouth, 49. Hunts, 48. Cornwall, 47. Surrey, 44. Middlesex, 40. Average for England and Wales, 67. The early marriages and the increase of the population in each county compared. Counties in which the increase of the population and the number of early marriages are both above the average. Rate of increase of the population from 1841 to 1851. Lancaster, 22%. Stafford, 20%. Bedford, 16%. Chester, 15%. Annual number of early marriages in every 1,000 marriages from 1844 to 48. Lancaster, 
among males 50, among females 139, Stafford among males 62, among females 176, Bedford among males 109, among females 235, Chester among males 54, among females 151. Counties in which the increase of the population and the number of early marriages are both below the average. Rate of increase of the population from 1841 to 1851, Northumberland 13%, Southampton 13%, Cumberland 10%, Gloucester 6%, Devon 6%, Rutland 5%, Cornwall 4%, North Wales 4%, Hereford 3%, Westmoreland 3%, Salop 1%. Annual number of early marriages in every 1,000 marriages from 1844 to 48. Northumberland among males 39, among females 124. Southampton among males 25, among females 118. Cumberland among males 33, among females 105. Gloucester among males 42, among females 104. Devon, among males, 22, among females, 82. Rutland, among males, 36, among females, 128. Cornwall, among males, 32, among females, 131. North Wales, among males, 27, among females, 77. Hereford, among males, 17, among females, 79. Westmoreland, among males, 32, among females, 128. Salop, among males, 29, among females, 95. Counties in which the increase of the population and the early marriages among females are above the average, and those among males below it. Rate of increase of the population from 1841 to 1851. Durham, 26%. Kent, 14%. Annual number of early marriages in every 1,000 marriages from 1844 to 48. Durham, among males, 35, among females, 142. Kent, among males, 46, among females, 140. County, in which the increase of the population and early marriages among females are below the average, and those among males above it. Warwick. Rate of increase of the population, 18%. Annual number of early marriages in every 1,000 marriages, among males, 46. Among females, 131. Counties in which the increase of the population is below the average and the number of early marriages is above it. Rate of increase of the population from 1841 to 1851, Cambridge, 13%. Worcester, 13%. York, 13%. Hunts, 9%. Nottingham, 9%. Derby, 9%. Essex, 7%. Hartford, 7%. Norfolk, 7%. Suffolk, 7%. Northampton, 7%. Leicester, 7%. Barks, 5%. Bucks, 4%. Oxford, 4%. Wilts, 0.7%. Annual number of early marriages in every 1,000 marriages, Cambridge, among males, 73. Among females, 227. Worcester, among males, 56. Among females, 151. York, among males, 57. Among females, 187. Hunts, among males, 99. Among females, 336. Nottingham, among males, 60. Among females, 158. Derby, among males, 46. Among females, 138. Essex, among males, 57. Among females, 204. Hartford, among males, 75. Among females, 210. Norfolk, among males, 50. Among females, 148. Suffolk, among males, 52. Among females, 1,623. Northampton, among males, 71. Among females, 190. Leicester, among males, 79. Among females, 179. Barks, among males, 148. Among females, 143. 
bucks among males ninety four among females seven hundred and forty three oxford among males forty six among females one hundred and fifty one wilts among males sixty eight among females one hundred and sixty four counties in which the increase of population is above the average and the number of early marriages is below it rate of increase of the population middlesex twenty per cent surrey seventeen per cent monmouth seventeen per cent south wales fourteen per cent annual number of early marriages in every one thousand marriages middlesex among males eighteen among females eighty five surrey among males sixteen among females ninety one monmouth among males twenty eight among females one hundred and five south wales among males thirty among females eighty two counties in which the increase of the population and the early marriages among males are below the average and those among females above it rate of increase of the population lincoln twelve per cent sussex twelve per cent annual number of early marriages in every one thousand marriages lincoln among males thirty nine among females one hundred and fifty three sussex among males thirty eight among females one hundred and sixty counties in which the increase of the population and early marriages among females is below the average and those among males above it rate of increase of the population somerset two per cent dorset six per cent annual number of early marriages in every one thousand marriages somerset among males forty seven among females one hundred and twelve dorset among males forty seven among females one hundred and twenty five end of section one hundred and twenty